welcome to season three of the AWC. My name is Aya. I'm here with Zico, Ven, and Subatiz. And I know that all of us here with the AWC family are so excited to get into another season, Ven, of Cups. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're just coming back. Um, I myself, I was telling you all right before, you know, we went live, I was really, really excited watching all the open bracket games. Just got me reminded as to why I love WoW Esports. We've got a lot of amazing teams this year in both regions, and I'm hoping we shake things up and see some uh, new talented faces. Yeah, we certainly are going to shake things up. We've got slightly different format as well, Super Tease, if we kind of want to get into that just a little bit. You know, as always, it is best of five. Finals will be the best of seven. It's 3v3, of course. Four players to a team. So nothing really has changed there, but it's the actual cups uh, frequency, Super Tease, that has changed. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be two cups for this first portion leading into the finals, which means that the competition is really cutthroat and you need good performances like right away. Like you want a top four, I would say at least. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be going into the gauntlet and that could be really stressful. Uh, you do not want to be in that tournament. Although as a spectator, it's probably one of the best events uh, is to see the teams in their last leg try and get into that uh, grand finals position. Our match format's going to be the same as previous years with a blind composition pick on the grand arena the loser is then going to pick the next map the winner will then pick their composition and then the loser gets an opportunity to counter that composition with their own yep absolutely so gonna see a lot of familiar um formats as well as familiar some familiar faces and some new teams we can talk about those just a little bit later here's a look at the schedule something that super tease was going off briefly so we've got those two cups zico then into the mid-season clash then into the gauntlet so pressure is like really on these teams to perform early on yeah absolutely i mean this is a kind of a new take on uh, the same uh, format that we've had you know year in and year out uh, if you compare it to the last year. Uh, and as you said, this is AWC Cup 1. Ne uh, and then we're going to have Cup number 2. And that's it. After that, mid-season clash and gauntlet. Uh, and then we're going to you know, dial in for Season 4. So um, it, it's really up to each and every single one of these teams to try to get as many points as possible because you're not going to have a, a great shot at uh, you know, uh, kind of coming back later. Uh, so you got to have everything figured out. You got to be good to go. Uh, it's match day uh, and uh, it's time to show what you got. Oh, certainly is. There's a, you know some opportunities for tiebreakers as well. We can get a little bit into that as they come along. But let's take a look here at the European team. Zigo, I'm going to throw it back to you because you're the most familiar with these guys. You know, we were talking a little bit before that there are some AWC players that we're used to kind of seeing their faces and some new players that you may not recognize unless you're playing on the European ladder. Oh, I, I feel like we could we could have a two hour segment here just about like all of these players. <laughs> Uh, it's like you mentioned, you know, there's been a lot of changes uh, here in Europe. Uh, now you're going to see some names here that you recognize, you know, like Waz and Chanimal and Raikou. But for example, uh, they don't have Meh. They have Lontar now uh, healing them. Um, so that's going to be a, a big change uh, in Echo, which has been our most dominant team uh, for uh, I don't even know how long. Um, and then, you know, you got Mercy. He's got, he's got himself a new team as well. Um, Zpi, I don't see where Zpi is on this list, uh, and also Swapsy here uh, with a new team here in the wa Wandering Water Furbogs. Uh, they were Admiral Esports last year, but they have picked up uh, some new members as well. They picked up Tessia, Amazing Mage, and uh, just in general, a lot of uh, familiar faces, but also some new faces like Halton, JT, and Eradas. Um, uh, that's a that's a team that's essentially. Uh, some of the highest rated ladder players. We have seen some of them here and there on a cup, but uh, these guys, uh, if you're playing on high rated in Europe, then you know all of these guys. You face them multiple times. They are super, super good team. So I'm excited to see what they can do as well with that uh, sub Windwalker comp. Yeah, excited to see what they've got in store for us for these upcoming cups. They did play earlier this week. We are uh, we've sorted the bracket right now, so we've got Echo here in up against Ultima in round one. You know, <laughs> just kind of some smashing games earlier on this week. But of course, we can't talk about the schedule first up for the European region: Black versus Hulabang. Then, but any other matches in particular you are looking forward now that we have to, uh, kind of an overview of these EU players. I, I feel like a big story in Europe is the same story we've had 
year after year, season after season. It's what team is going to beat Echo. And I do think there are some teams that can actually do it. I think Echo's first match in the upper bracket against Wandering Water Furbogs is going to set a tone, I think, for cup number one and cup number two, because I think that is one of the rosters that has the players uh, as well as the compositions to go head to head with Echo. So I'm really curious to see how that matchup does play out. Um, but yeah, just in general, we got some fantastic games here. Uh, like Zico mentioned, a lot of these rosters are new coming together, but very powerful, lots of flexibility, lots of different compositions. And I think it's just gonna be up to which teams can actually put it all together and uh, perform best here today. Yeah, and we've had we've gone through a lot of game changes as well, Super D, since we last saw any AWC action. Do you think there's gonna be anything that's most prevalent that we'll be seeing in today's games? Uh, I mean, Outlaw Rogue right now is likely going to be a very strong pick, but there was some changes to Shaman in particular just before this tournament, the Poison Cleansing Totem, um, where now it's going to be able to dispel poisons through line of sight, which is why I think we're increasingly seeing more Shamans, especially in NA, but I do know that Lontar used a Shaman, and I think it was in his final game to qualify in the top side, so Shaman could be a really key factor in potentially mixing up that meta. There's a lot of variety in EU. Normally, EU are kind of like just only sticking to the meta and it's just eight teams of a very similar setup but we have quite a variety i mean we got like a windwalker rogue team i think there's a, a jungle cleave as well in this lower bracket side so there's some options here that could definitely mix things up from the expected meta yeah and we've got you know black versus hula bang up for game number one zico anything that we should be expecting from either of these teams uh, yes, I've had the opportunity to uh, actually talk to some of the members uh, from Black uh, P-Make, which is their Arcane Mage. Uh, he was uh, in my stream, so I had a chance to, you know, quiz him and grill him a little bit. Uh, he's playing that Arcane it's Mage. He's seen him um, last uh, year. He had a, a, a nice uh, Rogue Mage Druid, and that's what they're playing here as well, mainly. Uh, that Arcane Outlaw RMD, Outlaw Rogues that Super Tease was talking about. And uh, we're going to have Shoxy on that Rogue, Burly on the Healer and also Adam Rex uh, in that roster. So a pretty strong roster. You know, uh, some of these players, they've been around uh, in, in the European scene uh, for, for quite some time, but I wouldn't say that these guys have had like a super great tournament success. Um, so it's kind of like, uh, you know, they've played in some cups and, you know, done well on the ladder. And then on the other side, we have Hoolibang, uh, which is Houghton. He is a sub rogue, uh, usually number one in the shuffle ladder, usually very high rated. Uh, you know, in general online, JT uh, on the Priest and Aradas on the Windwalker Monk. All of these guys, uh, from uh, what I know of these guys, is that, you know, they're multi rank one players, of course, uh, but I mainly know them from Solo Shuffle. All of these guys, I've seen them all, like, at the top of the ladder uh, in Solo Shuffle, uh, especially Hawton. I had no idea who Hawton was before Solo Shuffle came out, and then I started seeing, okay, this guy has, like, three rogues in the top five. He, he, this guy is uh, he's doing things. Uh, but JT and Aradas has, has been, uh, uh, at least since Shadowlands, high rated as well. So uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, ladder and online experience, but we'll see how, how they do here uh, in a tournament. Yeah. How do you, how difficult would you say then it is to translate that sort of success into tournament success? The solo shuffle success? It's a, it's a little bit of a different shuffle, game. Solo shuffle, but... ladder, either one. It's a, it's a little bit different, but... I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I feel like if you're someone who is really successful in Soul Shuffle, like you probably have a pretty good idea of how to win an arena, right? Like you're going to be one of those players that's really good at managing your defensive cooldowns. One of those players who recognizes win conditions. That's really how you get to the top of the ladder. So, um, yeah, I feel like these players that they're going to be able to put it together. I had a chance during the open bracket to watch some of their games, and this is a very explosive team. Like Subtlety Rogues, they're a little bit less popular now. They received some nerfs. Uh, a lot of the rogue mains are going over to Outlaw due to its durability, but Subtlety still packs quite a punch. It has a lot of control. And I think when you pair it with that Windwalker Monk, who's kind of really excels at bouncing around and hitting targets that are stunned, um, it makes for a really explosive matchup. Now, kind of remains to be seen how they're going to do against an Arcane Mage. If they can stay on them, they can take them down really, really quickly. But Arcane typically is a really, really slippery spec. So I expect them to be going after the Druid, going after the Rogue, and just trying to lock down a target and take them down. But you definitely cannot count this team out because the amount of damage they can do is absurd. Yeah, 
Uh, we're, and we're going to be getting this game also started, so hopefully we can see some of that damage in just a moment. The players are going to be getting ready, but just as a reminder, we are here in the lower bracket. They already did lose a game, both of these teams, earlier on in the week, so they're facing elimination on both sides here. We're going to get game number one started, and look at the juxtaposition also of these two logos. We've got like this, this edgy black logo on the left side with the little rainbow pixels on the right, so two very different teams here heading off in game number one, the Grand Arena Black versus Hulabang. I'm really excited to see what composition Black... I'm really excited to see what composition Black leads with. Is it going to be the Arcane Mage? Is it going to be the Destro Lock? I'm imagining they don't want to put a Destro Lock in against a Windwalker and a Sub Rogue. I feel like that is typically really difficult, but they could actually bring the Mage and Lock together for a double caster, which might be a really decent pick. Insane transition here. They're actually going to be bringing in a Paladin, not bringing in a Druid at all here. And it looks like they will be running an Outlaw Rogue. However, Houghton will be running a Subtlety Rogue, Subtlety Rogue Windwalker into a Holy Paladin team. Here's to see how they play this one out. It's going to be really difficult to get through all the defensive cooldowns of a Paladin. Typically, you're going to be running at the Paladin uh, and trying to train them in a matchup like this, but they're starting on the Mage, it looks like, for now. Ooh, big Arcane Surge coming out here already. Nice Dragon's Breath there just to secure uh, being able to get that buff, but not too much damage coming out. Here we go. Shoxy could be in trouble. Small Farm does get dropped. Cheap Shot's coming out here. Shoxy dropping quite low already. Saved by the Light. Uh, proffing there for him. Trades out the Cloak of Shadows as well. And now Counter Setup coming out here onto Halton, but... No crowd control there onto Burley. They're swapping over onto Aradas now on the Windwalker. Uh, but he's not taking too much damage either. Burley completely out of crowd control with the wings active. Easily out healing this uh, start. Houghton at half health at the moment. JT into the blind. Into a full polymorph. Pre-Karma from Eridus, just anticipating damage. Searing Glare from Burley, gonna hit Houghton. He's low health, he cloaks it off. Goes for the Kidney Shot, sets up with an in-cap into a cheap shot. Nice setup here, but Houghton has to solo him with those polys peeling the Windwalker. Shoxy is low, he's trying to escape. Typically, we don't see this much pressure put onto an Outlaw Rogue, but Subtlety Windwalker is a lot of burst, a really unexpected composition to bring into the tournament at the moment. P-Mix trying to retreat, he gets caught in a cheap shot, he's getting blasted down. It could potentially be his first block. He's gonna use Blessing of Protection, line of sight the Purges, and get into a good position. Now trying to turn the tide of battle around into his favor. Blasting out those arcane blasts, but Shoxy's now into a kidney shot. Houghton sets up crowd control. Chastise onto P-Mick, into in-cap on the Paladin. Shoxy is still alone. He's greedily holding on to his evasion here at about 40% health. Full blind now onto Burly. Houghton, he's going for the kill. Shoxy just avoiding the fight. I cannot believe he didn't trade evasion throughout that entire attack. It looks like it was Void Shift from JT, and his team is starting to fall behind at this point. Yeah, Burley trading out his Trinket there, and JT trading out his Trinket Void Shift right there. So, pretty big uh, win there for the Rogue Mage Paladin team. There's a Kidney Shot now onto JT. Do they find any crowd control? They have a Blinding Light. p going for the Arcane Surge. Not able to find any Polymorph here, though. Uh, JT had no Trinket, but... Uh, um, p is playing regular blink, so he doesn't have that shimmer. Uh, so he's gonna need his teammates to always set up for him because he can't really uh, blink while casting. He's gonna have to just blink out of the stuns and then uh, use um, some cast while running. Like you can see right there, he's trying to cast the poly there while running uh, and try to uh, get the uh, better end of that exchange with JT. But right now, p could be in a little bit of trouble. We got Zwen the Tiger uh, onto p -Make right now. There's the double leg sweep. They're actually gonna swap to Shoxi knowing that p is just gonna be able to blink out of that. Big damage coming out there, but Burley he does manage to make it back into the smoke bomb. They swap to Burley. This could be big trouble here for Burley. He does have the Divine Shield, but he is going to just uh, trade out the Divine Protection. And now Shoxi in massive trouble here, Sid. Oh, it looks like he's turning it around. Cheap shot into Polymorph onto the Monk. Now looking to retreat. Actually, maybe get aggressive here. Shadow or Death from JT. Trying to Shadow or Death the Blind. He actually almost got it, but Shoxi was patient. Now a Blind into a full Ring of Frost. Kidney shot on Shoxi. No crowd control into Burley, though. He's going to easily heal through this if they can't find anything. P-Mage just getting shut down with Cheap Shot after Cheap Shot. Looks like he got Cheap Shot again on his Blink. He's going to use Temporal. He's going to pop the Mirror Images. This is going to be enough. We see a Grappling Hook and the Kidney Shot. Onto the Priest. The Monk's in trouble. He ports back behind the Pillar. He manages to get a big heal there in time, but now they're swapping to Houghton. They are just all over the place. Cloak of Shadow is going to be forced out of Houghton. As JT repositions, paralyzing the Paladin. They're trying to set up damage, but they're falling behind. Defensive double Dragon's Breath from P-Make. Every time that Kidney Shot comes through, he's always getting a double Dragon's Dragon's Breath is just slowing down the pressure. They're looking for another swap onto Burly, and I do think the Paladin is likely going to be a really good target between the Paladin and the Rogue in this type of matchup, uh, but they're just not getting the right cooldowns here. They are leading on mana at least if they can keep up their damage and stay on target. But here comes another cheap shot! Massive damage incoming, and Eridus is going to go down, and Black out of nowhere just take him out. It was very unexpected right there. He had Diffuse, he had Trinket, but wanted to hold it, it seemed like. And
ended up going down at the end of his portal. Yeah, that was that was really uh, nice kind of trading there back and forth. I really like that Black brought in uh, Burley on his Paladin because it just gives them that answer against Windwalker Rogue where you have so much durability. You know, if you have like a Priest or uh, maybe even a Resto Druid, uh, a lot of the time you can isolate that Rogue and take him down, but there's just so many things that can t remove stuns and that can save you um, while you're being stunned. So I, I really like the Paladin pick, but here uh, Burley in an in-cap, double Dragon's Breath coming out, p gets gouged, and what happens to JT here? Does he get counterspelled? So uh, the damage is coming in here and uh, they're landing quite a bit of pressure there. The Guardian does fade. And then they get the uh, cheap shot down to Burly. And Burly manages to get, escape out of that one. And then what happens here with Eradas? And where's JT? Okay, so JT is sitting through a Hammer of Justice. And then they get the big... Oh, he gets blinded on his trinket. That was really clean by Burly. Uh, and then P-Make uh, just has that um, arcane um, barrage, which... Uh, if you are on low health, it does 100% increased damage. So uh, Arcane has that execute and uh, managed to execute Eridos there. Really nice play from Burley though to, to get the Hodge and then instantly stun the Trinket there, not allowing uh, any gaps there uh, in the uh, crowd control. Really nice setups here from Black, and it's it's nice to say that they have some comp flexibility as well. I was wondering, you know, is it is it just going to be only Resto Druid team? What's what's their healer setup going to be? And obviously, you can flex to different healers for a better advantage. Paladins are typically really good into rogues, um, especially you know in the shuffle ladder. I've I've seen it rogue ladder or rogue lobbies and hunter lobbies. Paladins actually tend on getting a bit of an edge. So being able to pick that up in this situation, it was critical here for for a first game victory. Uh, but now they know what's coming their way. They can likely go to a very small map set up the swaps that they're looking for uh, we've got some nice new details here coming in from warcraft logs nice. some new detailed informations tracking the game throughout that health over time of eridos as you can see it quickly plummeting down to zero uh, right at the end of it and you can see what took him out was that arcane barrage that zico was talking about for about 120 thousand damage uh, and a couple of missiles just poking him around the corner um, to be able to finish him off towards the opposite end or wait maybe we just change that it was 160k arcane Barrage that ended up coming in and finishing him off right at the final second, even despite JT actually getting a powered life just about what like a quarter of a second before that for 200,000. He actually died through that, so very unexpected for him in that position. But yes, they're going to be going to hook point, really small map. This is going to be really good for them for stacking up their enemies. Um, I, I just I, I feel like they need to be focusing the paladin a little bit more. I feel like JT can likely focus his crowd control on the mage, like chastise fear the mage, and then send to go on um, the paladin with some sort of stun uh, onto the rogue and get that triple go on the paladin a few times. I, I think I would prefer that at least um, than playing kind of this. They're playing a very safe game where it's like, we're just attacking the mage. If he gets away, attack the rogue, trying to play safe. I think they can be a bit more risky. Yeah, I, I, I think you have a point there, but I think they're putting a lot of eggs kind of in the small map basket here. They're really relying on the map to do a lot of, uh, you know, their work for them. And it, the nice thing is that they are going to be able to connect a lot more onto Burly. Uh, so maybe that is the plan, you know, connect onto Burly, try to get double fear, you know, at least hit Shoxy so he doesn't peel too much. Uh, and then try to maybe master spell the bubble and try to take him down. Uh, but just in general, it's harder for the mage, you know, to uh, kite around. It's harder um, for, uh, uh, you know, the rogues to kind of kite and, and, and stay alive as well. So if you are the melee cleave, uh, especially with the sub rogue, it's nice to be able to kind of duck around and swap targets uh, as you see fit. Um, but the, the, the sketchy thing here is that you lose your best map. And if you lose this, you're down 0-2 already in the series. Uh, and I feel like there was still a lot of um, options here for black... Uh, in that game number one, but we'll see here uh, if Hoolibang can battle it out here and tie up the series. Game number two between Black and Hoolibang is live. There's immediately grabbing combat there. P-Make not wanting to enable any sort of sap from either Rogue. Both Rogues waiting to open. Shoxy gets the first cheap, but that means that Houghton is going to be able to counter engage. Where is he going to target down? He gets Dragon's Breath, man. These Dragon's Breath from P-Make just totally denying all the damage. They go for a Paralyze. They got P-Make's Trinket. They Chastise the Paladin, but they blind the Chastise. So JT can't get there. He's trying to sit through it. He manages to sit through that first crowd control chain. He's going to jump into his Angel form to immune any further crowd control. Get his team topped here. Uh, and he should be able to 
to keep them offensive. Shoxy knows that, so he's pulling out a line of sight of the priest to try and pull them out of his line of sight of his angel. JT's going to cancel that. He gets Frost Nova. He's moving in. I think they want to go for a fear, and they are going to Paladin here and swap into the Rogue at the same time. I like the two target cleave. Shoxy really low, almost dying through Cloak of Shadows. They proc his touch of death and his evasion. That was an insane setup. Now they're swapping damage on P Mate, getting him kind of low. Burly struggling to recover. That's the type of play that I'd like to see. Now they're swapping over, dropping a smoke bomb, and it looks like P Mate's actually going to have to block. This is a way better game for Hula Bay. They get the master spell. They go for the kill. Burly has to bubble. Is he going to die through it? Busting protection. Can they purge it off in time? JT is trying to keep his team top while purging. Polymorphs are incoming. They're going to land on a Houghton. Looks like P Mate's trying to swap that Polymorph here in the near future to JT. So he's trying to line the pillar. They get a cheap shot, but P Mate can't get there. He's gouged. He's trying to get there on the cheap shot. He knocks them away, but he's too snared. JT's going to be able to line a sight. Now they are just getting ready to pounce. And if you're Burly, it's like anybody on your team can die right now. This is such a difficult decision for him to predict who's going to be the next target. Yeah, he's going to have to drop a preemptive sacrifice right now on the right target. Uh, and uh, Halton actually almost took down Shoxi there in that shadowy duel. That's what kind of set up all that pressure. But here comes the Paralyzed. Are they going to go after Burly, actually, maybe? Burly Double. dropping the sacrifice right there early. Good read there onto the mage. Burly sitting through a full fear into a full kidney. They got more crowd control here. Shoxi coming in for the restuff, trying to peel here for his mage. P make with the Ring of Frost and the Blast Wave to kind of knock them back into it. He fake cast Shadow Death. And here comes the counter setup onto Eridas. Eridas, though, still looking healthy. He has Trinket. He has port, he has everything. Just teleports behind the pillar. Full blind coming out here onto JT. And uh, if you are on the side of black, or if you're cheering for the side of black, well, you just want them to stay alive right now. They just need to survive this next go, and potentially the one after that to kind of rotate back up their trinkets. Shoxy right now with no trinket, no sheet dev, P make as well with no ice block. So they need to have good offense on the side of black right now, because that's the only thing that's going to actually save Burley. them. And that's exactly what they're doing. But Burnley getting swapped to and getting dropped. Oh man, that's just Serenity, Shadowy Duel. Like, Windwalker and Subrogue, out of like almost all the classes in the game, like when it comes to their one-shot, if they're not controlled or stopped, you just get erased, <laughs> evaporated out of the arena very quickly. So this map worked wonders for Hula Bang. They were able to get on anybody that they wanted. They played way more offensive, which I think is the strength of their composition. Uh, they are able to pull off a win. Now the real question is whether or not they can repeat this on a large map like Tolveron or a large map like Ashamanes, because almost certainly Black is going to to take this contest to the next round on that and this is the setup they get a stun on the paladin and a stun on the rogue they can cleave both of them with fists of fury and blade flurry so that makes it really difficult especially as a paladin because if you use sacrifice you're redirecting damage and taking double damage when you're stacked on the person with it then they shadowy duel them at like one percent and howton almost solos him through that uh he gets his cheat death even through cloak and through evasion with a couple of sneaky shadow steps and melee range to get behind him for a couple of hits the game is almost over there then they swap to the mage and pretty much end the game right there <laughs> Uh, and they get an ice block, which gets Master Spell with a cheap shot, and I can't believe he didn't die after that with Paralyze. Burly has to bubble a Paralyze, bops him at 1%, and I think Touch of Death must have been used on the Rogue there. Maybe that's what proc the cheat death. Otherwise, maybe the Mage would have died even right there at the at the end of that, and it was really just the Hula Bang show. They had, they had all the momentum, constantly getting setups. JT was able to avoid Polymorph really easily in this round. He was like hardly ever crowd controlled, so it worked out nicely for them. Yeah, and I mean, this really was the play there at the start that we, uh, the, the one we just saw with the smoke bomb and the shadowy duel. That is what set up the entire game because this is what gives them that opportunity to go after Burley now here with that second serenity. And they get the cheap shot onto Burley. They got the serenity. They get the offensive touch of karma. And uh, they just send every single thing here uh, offensively. So they can't be peeled. Uh, and they can be counter pressured and uh, they have that short window but that, that's the thing right that what we were talking about it's a small map it's a lot easier to get into this position uh, on a smaller map and also um, this was kind of everything going uh, Huli Bang's way uh, because they had that big pressure but that's the strength of their comp they're going to need to make sure uh, that they're finding these opportunities they're swapping around and, and forcing more than just one cooldown from one person and then of course here we can see the death log Pretty, Four second kill. We're gonna. We should make like a screenshot and see like who gets the fastest kill of the day or something. This was a four point one five second kill from ninety two percent. So I already forgot what the other one was percent wise, but it'd be cool maybe to take a stat of like, who got the fastest kill uh, of the day. I'm thinking Windwalker Rogue is probably gonna come close to getting the fastest kill <laughs> uh, of all yeah. the comps. And but they're fighting for their tournament lives. Like if they lose this, you're out. And this is Cup One of only two here for the first portion of the Dragonflight Season Three. So a lot of stress right now. Black cannot afford 
afford to lose these swing matches. They need the big maps. They need a lot of space to pull the melee attackers into bad positions uh, and have more time to react. I think that's the big problem with hook point is that if you're spread out, you can see the rogue like always oh, running at me. He's going to step kidney. I know when this when they're going to start their crowd control um, on a large map, but on a small map, he's already in range for shadow step without moving. So it's way harder to track when they're about to send and who they're going to send it on. So this map, they, they need to play really well and abuse that and have max distance. Yeah, they need to get good distance between each other. And the best way to kind of tell that a, a setup is happening is to just make sure that you're always keeping your eyes on the rogue. As soon as the rogue stuns a target, that's when you all scatter. That's when you all just spread out, try to outrange uh, each other, uh, so the rogue can't stun multiple people at the same time. And, uh, because that's uh, once the rogue stuns one target, most likely uh, the sub rogue is going to stun all of the targets, and, and they're going to set up, uh, try to set up for a kill. So we'll see uh, if Black can play this distance that they have to work with, uh, or if Huli Bank kind of run away with this one. I feel like uh, aside from the opener, if Black can kind of survive the opener without having to use too much and just kind of trade efficiently in a longer match i feel like they do have the advantage here they're gonna have more overall damage uh since they're playing against the sub rogue and in general just more control um so it really is Ooh. up to Huli back here to make something happen they're gonna go ahead and open up on to halt on minor pillar but he's just gonna go for a restart can they get the ring of frost gets shadow step kick big pressure onto eradas but uh they don't panic too much they trade out the guardian still have every trinket available here on Huli bank so Burley used both his freedoms in the opener to try and avoid getting crowd controlled. So I'm wondering if that's going to be a problem for the mage or the rogue, if they're not going to be able to kite um, with freedom being on a cooldown after that. They get a double fear. Nice setup from JT. Flexing between, you know, really oh. defensive in that last game to full out offense. They're setting up on Burley once again. A massive blast of damage. Is he going to survive the stun lock? He's critically low. Has to divine shield. Where's the massive spell? He's in angel form. He It looks like he was able to get it as Burley is now finally out of line of sight, but already being down your divine shield. And now your rogue is in trouble in the smoke bomb. He's trying to get in there. So much work for Burley to try and deal with this damage that's coming up from Hula Bang. They just flipped a switch. They went full offense, got right on top of them, and I really like this confidence. This is what they're going to need if they're going to pull a swing match in their favor. Yeah, that was crazy pressure there from Hula Bang, but uh, Burley didn't overreact. He still has Blessing of Protection. He still has his Trinket, so he bubbles one stun, he can Trinket the next one, then he can bop the next one, then he can, uh, you know, rotate uh, through his own uh, breakers like that, so they're going to try to actually go after oh. Shoxie here. Fly not to Burley. Do they have anything else to go here? Big damage coming in. Hawthorn does have the Shadowy Duel, and Shoxie just trinketed. So Hawthorn, we saw what he was able to do uh, with that Shadowy Duel in that last match, but right now Hawthorn is in trouble. JT is going to trade out the Guardian and keep him alive. And I really think that Shoxie uh, could, to, could potentially be the target here uh, in the next Shadowy Duel, because Burley has a lot of um, responses right now onto himself, but he can't really do anything if uh, his teammate is in a Shadowy Duel. So I'm really uh, hoping that Hooliban decides to try to go after Shoxi and 100 oh him and there it is full mm, there is. there's a cheap shot Shoxi he actually gets it. shrink bot there by Burley on the shadowy duel excellent read from Burley there and the only reason why they're still in the game all right, they're switching to P make trying to connect, but pretty tough to stay on that arcane mage is this type of melee cleave, I would imagine. Burley's moving in. They get a sap on JT, but Burley's in a kidney. He's not going to get any CC out of that. Eridas ports away. Now we can see Houghton in midfield at half. He gouges Shoxy, but he's still in a bit of trouble. He's going to vanish, and now Shoxy cannot open on him. He's going to rearrange his positioning here. Maybe open with crowd control from stealth onto the paladin. Curious to see where he leads the charge. He gets a step kick from stealth, but gets intercepted with a dismantle. He's going to pull back away, just generating combo points to the Shuriken Storm. Gets put into a kidney shot behind the pillar. And now P-Make is free casting. They're going to swap to the Windwalker Monk. Massive damage incoming from P-Make. JT grips Eridas out of there. Jumps into Angel Form. And now he's going to be able to free heal. Here comes Serenity. Smoke Bomb. Big combo onto Shoxy. Is he going to drop? They swap to Burly. Double Dragon's Breath gets dispelled off. Fist of Fury gets Polymorph. Beautiful Polymorph, but it might not even matter. Burly's saved by the lights. Going to proc. Avenging Rass is up. And he manages to stay alive. Oh, that Chastise on his Tears Deliverance. If they can stop that Tears Deliverance, they get a full fear. Tears Deliverance is such an important spell for the Paladins healing output if they can keep denying his cast of it here he's going for it once again he does manage to finish the cast but he's still low is Houghton going to be able to open here he's staying next to the paladin getting ready for a stun we see JT trying to pre-death the blinding light but he fakes it nice read from Burley to anticipate that shadow of death so blind into stun and now into a polymorph 
and Eridus is immediately out of there. Houghton's going to pre-cloak the assault on himself, so nice plays right now, responding and trading before the damage hits you, because otherwise you're probably just going to be erased, but now the Kidding Shot connects, Eridus ports in, trying to counter pressure them with Fist of Fury, trying to keep the mage in the move so he can't just free cast Arcane Blast, but he's managed to get some distance. Kidding Shot on Shoxy, trying to keep their pressure. I think a swap to Burly is their only option right now. Houghton gets blinded, he trinkets the blind and goes for evasion, gets cheap shot on his evasion, Eridus is trying to carry by himself, but now he's peeled away in Polymorphs, Burly gets a big heal, freedom and he manages to steed away. Houghton's still going after him, but I don't think they're going to be able to finish him. I think it's mostly just pressure to perhaps run him out of mana, which is pretty close at the moment between both teams. Yeah, mana definitely tied up here. Eridas actually uh, trading a lot of cooldowns here. He could be in big trouble. Full blind onto Burley. What a nice disarm there onto Halton by Shoxi into a full kidney shot. They're going to go after Halton here a little bit and try to force him back there. He's trying to uh, set up the next offense here onto Burley. Potentially kidney shot connects. Eridas connects as well. Sheep there onto Halton. But Burley has the Divine Shield. He's trying to not be too greedy. He's actually going to trade out the Blessing of Protection. Nice Dragon's Breath there onto JT. He cannot dispel the Blessing of Protection uh, because uh, P make there is making sure to crowd control the priest. Uh, during that time, so really, really nicely done there. And now they're looking to set up the pressure here onto Halton. Full polymorph connects onto JT. Burley is there with the Hammer of Justice. Executes coming in. And uh, Shadowy duel defensively here from Halton. Is that going to be enough, though, is the question? Oh. Oh, yeah, I think it procced right there, or he just got a big heal right as it was about to proc. But Halton uh, still uh, not out of the woods completely. They're actually trying to turn the pressure onto P Make here. But uh, I think that Halton wants to go after Burley, and Aradas wants to go after P Make. They're looking a little bit disorganized right now. On the side of Hootie Bang, another kidney shot coming in here onto Halton. Shoxy getting disarmed there by Eridas. Full paralyzed onto Burley. Who are they going to go after? They're going to set up here potentially. They're going after Shoxy. He's going to trinket, vanish out of that smoke bomb. And now, once again, the pressure is on onto Burley. He does have the divine protection, does have the blessing of protection. Is it going to be enough here? He has no mana whatsoever. They need to end this game right now, Super Tease. Otherwise, Black might just be running away with this one. No, Houghton into a kidney shot. JT's got life swap. Is he ready to hit the trigger here? Because he's getting dangerously low. He's going to pop off the evasion, dodge some attacks. Eridas needs to play really uh, like preemptive right now with no trink. He's got a pre-karma or pre-defuse. They manage to get a kidney shot. They paralyze the mage. They isolate the rogue. This is a beautiful setup, and Burley recognizes it. He's going to immediately divine shield and sacrifice, redirect some damage to himself, which is going to immune in the divine shield. It's really efficient for how low his mana is right now. Basically, his last maneuver. He's got one more blessing and protection left. Pressure on Eridas is what I mean. He's got a karma preemptively. If he gets stunned, he's not going to be able to access it later. They get knocked away into a nice Nova. Nice combo, but P-Make is getting connected too. Burly gets Ring of Peace, but he got a little bit of mana. So they trade a tiny bit of mana for a block. JT is getting in aggressive. Manages to get the full fear. This could force the Trinket. Where are they going to go? They're swapping. They're swapping, I think, to Burly. Are they ready to peel? Shoxy gets cheap shot. Burly gets cheaped on his Trinket. They swap back to Shoxy. Massive pressure. He's almost in touch of death range. Are they ready for it here? They bust here protection at 20% health, and JT doesn't really have the mana right now to go for the purges. He's just keeping his team top, trying to keep them aggressive as they look like they're pressuring P-Make here. Burley is just working wonders right now with zero mana at the moment. Flash of Light and Flash of Light, but Dampening is also getting high. 34% healing reduction at this point. They swap onto Shoxy once again in a kidney shot. P makes his peeling with the Polymorphs. Trying to stall, but it might not be enough. They proc the death. They cut him through it. And Hula Bank steal the swing match. And now the pressure is on to Black. Wow, that is so surprising because... I would assume that the sub rogue is not gonna be like. I mean, look at the damage right now. Look at Arthur. He did 9 mil damage, whereas Shoxi did 15 mil damage. Obviously, because he's outlaw versus sub rogue. Uh, and then P Make and Herodas did about the same damage. So I really thought that uh, because JT is gonna have to heal a lot more uh, playing with that sub rogue, that he is gonna be the one who ooms first. But uh, it is Burly that runs out of resources, and I feel like it's because P JT was able to drink just a little bit earlier uh, prior to this, but they get the, this is a big setup here, they get Burly's Trinket with that stun, then they swap over to Shoxi, uh, and then Burly has to bop Shoxi there as well, so uh, they get two essentially stun breaks, Shoxi right now has the evasion, but he has no Trinket, he does have Sheet Dev as well, but Burly's mana, look at it, it's completely tapped, he's got nothing to work with, JT still has a little bit to work with, and the most important thing, he still has damage which is very cheap and also a trinket life swap uh, if he wants to uh, you know uh, go for a rescue play later but they get the paralyze and then they manage to uh, actually take Shoxy down in that paralyze there's no bubble there's no mana uh, there's really not much Burly can do uh, at that situation there 
Uh, maybe you could have preemptively uh, dropped the sacrifice there, but um, I'm, I'm very uh, surprised uh, at the fact that the priest, look at the priest healing, 30 mil, look at Burley, 23 mil, yet Burley oomed before the priest. Is that just holy priest versus um, holy pala, like efficiency right now, or uh, is it just because he was able to get that drink? I would say Holy Priest mana is probably like the least efficient of any healer. So if he's if he's out manaing anybody else um, on Holy Priest, I, he had to have gotten a drink at some point. So maybe it's black. They need to just play safer at the mid game and just set up a drink, spam a polymorph, slow the game, stop all damage, and just make sure that they're safe for the late game. I think they just kind of continued to play more of a neutral round, getting ready to deny their setups, and they didn't really play around setting up a drink at all. Um, and and that other than that one moment where he got Ring of Peace, and at that point it was like really stressful to be able to trade it. And the fact that they blocked when he was drinking and he didn't really get a lot of mana was also a bit of a pain point. So I think Black just need to slow the game down at a certain point, realize, okay, Hula Bang, like we got to respect them. We got to be ready for a longer game. Um, and if they do that, then I think they're going to be able to pull off a win. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, I, I gotta say, I'm very impressed so far with Hoolibang because we don't really see uh, sub Windwalker uh, being played that often, especially also with Holy Priest. So uh, I think it's really cool to see um, these guys kind of bring out their mains and, and actually make it work. Um, they kind of remind me a little bit of uh, F tier in the US, <laughs> you know? Playing like a one shotty cleave and uh, they're just sticking with the same thing, even if it's Tolvir, even no matter what they're playing against. And they're actually beating some 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 solid teams here. So uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what Huli Bang can actually do. Um, they already, you know, on the way to the qualifications, uh, beat some really solid uh, opponents as well. They did beat um, the Fiends, uh, which uh, actually they beat them very consistently. They didn't even beat them. Like they destroyed them. They 3 0 them. Uh, very fast games like Hunter uh, Outlaw versus uh, Sub Windwalker. So it is interesting to see uh, Hootie Bang kind of bringing in this new comp uh, and uh, so far making it look good. They need to try to win this uh, game here to stay alive uh, in this lower bracket. Whoever loses this series will be eliminated from the tournament uh, in eighth place. Whoever wins will be able to continue to earn those points. There's only two cups uh, before that top three has been decided. So I uh, really need to try to bring it back now if you are black. Yeah, black is facing elimination. And there was a lot of big name teams that didn't even make it to the top eight that are going to come in next week. So you want a deep run here. Houghton's going all in immediately with a shadowy duel and offensive cloak of shadows uh, and doesn't really get a lot of cooldowns. I, I guess Shoxy's trinket is better than nothing. They're trying to set up with smoke bomb fear from JT. It's match point. Are they going to trade efficiently here or panic? Shoxy gets cloak of shadows off. He's looking stable. They swapped to Burly. Big pressure on him as well. This Windwalker with Serenity, when he get when he can actually hit two targets of Fist of Fury, he just starts melting them at the moment. We can see Angel form from JT. He's freely healing and avoiding crowd control. That's going to end. Houghton's on top of Burly, getting ready to set up a stun. Is Burly ready for it? Searing Glare. He's trying to pre-Searing Glare the go, but he has to fake an interrupt. And Houghton is just staying right on his back, getting ready for that fake. They actually blind the rope, but it breaks! Oh no, they were trying to maybe bait his trinket and then swap to him, but with that blind breaking, it now means JT doesn't need to deal with it, and he's like going to play a lot more offensive yeah and we're going to see p make now uh trinketing actually out of that cheap shot he gets re cheap shot so not able to get any real value there on the trinket erida sitting through a stun lock but he is going to be able to completely find in the situation defensively huli bang has everything and offensively uh they have managed to kind of get some of the mages cooldowns and also uh, some of those rogue cooldowns but shocks is still holding on to his trinket and they still have those bops and everything on burly burly sitting through a sap actually right now uh, but Burly is going to be completely fine. Mana right now, even he between made. the healers, oh. takes a huge chunk of damage. And just like that, that's his ice block. That was a whirling dragon punch there, I believe. Uh, landing and a rising sun kick. Shoxi now in trouble here as well, trying to kite a little bit while Burly is sitting through that blind. The Shadow we do the actually. We do the Paladin. <laughs> And Hawthorn could kidney shot Burly here while uh, Eridas tries to solo Shoxi. Can they get the kidney shot here onto Burly? That would be huge. Uh, doesn't look like it. There, finally, Cheap Shot connect, uh, connects there onto Burly. Kidney shot onto Shoxi, but no follow up. Burly was able to pick him back up. Nice attempt there from Hoolibang, but also good defense there coming out from Black. I would have much rather seen them do that, by the way, onto the Mage, who doesn't have an Ice Block right now. Uh, he's playing Blink Stun, so just don't stun him. Try to land kicks on him and just try to take him down maybe with cooldowns while he's kicked. It's very annoying to deal with that um, when you are an arcane mage uh, but so far it looks like he may to stay alive potentially uh, sacrifice comes out from uh, burly and that will block it 
Oh, they drop a smoke bomb. They're swapping. Shoxie in a cheap shot. It's match point. Is it going to go down through Cloak of Shadows? Burley ducks into the smoke bomb, but Shoxie is still low health. Gouge on Eridus. Houghton is still all over them. He gets a kick on Burley. And this is high pressure situation. You're facing elimination. Any slip up at this point is going to be immediately punished. Hulabang are ready to just chomp down and finish this in advance in the lower bracket. P make is playing close to JT as if he wants to go for crowd control. He gets step kicked on his arcane surge, but he gets the dragon's breath. He's trying to get the poly. He gets ring of peace into a cheap shot. He blinks through the ring of peace. He manages to displace back. They blind Houghton defensively, but P-Make is still in trouble. He's dying through Temporal. Burley had to Divine Shield throughout that chain, and P-Make is still just dying. So much damage coming up from Hulabang right now. They're trying to line aside JT in that Angel form. Another interrupt onto Burley. They're just harassing him constantly, going back onto the Paladin, making sure that he's included in the fight. His mana is down below half at this point. Houghton is riding on top of him, getting ready to set up the next crowd control chain, and Burley's like, he's got to make a tough decision. Who are they going to go? He's going to pre-bop his own stun. He might get feared here. JT is coming in for the full fear. Shoxie has to vanish. Now they swap back to P-Make. He's trying to get Frost Novas and trying to kite away at the moment, but they're still right on top of him. They dodge the Dragon's Breath. P-Make's in trouble. Burley has Sacrifice, but he's being greedy with it here at the moment. How is he being so greedy with it? P-Make's gonna go down and Hulabang do it. Three to one with the Holy Priest. This was completely unexpected. Holy bang, I'm telling you, these guys, they've been around for a long time here uh, on the European ladder. These guys, uh, you know, if you're high rated in the scene, you have definitely seen these guys. And uh, it's really nice to see them just all come on, on, on their mains. And, uh, you know, I would say a little bit against the odds here, especially on Tolvir, um, taking down Black here. Three to one, they're going to stay alive in the tournament. And we're going to see exactly how they did it. Um, so they get a nice stun, chastise, fear combo there onto Burley. And they're going after Shoxi here. There's a disarm. Um, onto Shoxy, but now they're swapping over to P-Make, and then Tears Deliverance being cast there by Burley. He has to uh, kind of cancel it. P-Make getting stunned there right after he blinks. He trinkets out, uh, and then they manage to just kind of have enough pressure there to try to take him down. Uh, and uh, like you highlighted, I feel like Burley uh, had some cool ones to trade there. Uh, it was an easy sack right there. Um, and they could have stayed alive, but even then, like, it wasn't looking too good for them. Um, I would say Huli Bang were in the driver's seat uh, the entire match, you know. Uh, JT had his drink at the whole time. He had the void shift. What? Always had, you know, defensive answers. Um, and it was really, it really felt like a matter of time before Huli Bang can kind of swap their way to victory. Oh. And that shadowy duel there at the end uh, to uh, seal the deal is actually the reason why he didn't sack. So, really nice shadowy duel. Why is he torn? Burley's playing Torn Paladin. That's you were grumbling that whole time. Yeah, I was, I was trying to figure out why. Like, why is he <laughs> Torn? Well, I'm wondering. Yourself. I'm wondering the. I'm trying to. I, I mean, I like to know why because they made a change. Um, you know, halfway through Dragonfly, maybe it was the beginning of Dragon. It might, might have been the beginning of Dragonfly. I can't remember where you can play cross faction. So I'm wondering, like, when was the last time Burley was competing? Maybe he thinks he has to be Torn because his teammates are Horde or something. Um, I, I don't know. I would. I would think uh, that there's. Is there I something better than Torin? You got a rogue on your team. <laughs> It's I'm just be something. dying of the fact that like I could hear you grumbling for like a t solid five minutes, and the question was why is he torn? I mean, it, it is torn? valid. I'm curious as well. Well, someone's gonna ask him. Uh, Ven is chiming in here, saying it's for stamina. He thinks not to die in stuns. Okay, I mean it's it's a little bit, I guess. It's it's five percent, right? It's, it's extra uh, that's I think that's I think it's a base amount now. It's not. I don't okay. think it's that much. I don't think it's five percent. Yeah. Uh, that would 5%. be crazy. I would I would agree with it being the better right pick if it was five percent, but I think it got changed to a base amount at a certain point. Mm -hmm. Is this our slowest kill of the day, Sid? Seven point seven nine seconds. <laughs> Seven slowest watts, kill of the day. I mean, probably. <laughs> they can definitely do faster. Okay, they're gonna do better. They're gonna hit their PR next game. Okay. No, no. <laughs> there's a comp that's gonna one shot something like have the fastest one shot i feel like windwalker sub rogue is definitely up there if you're not paying attention to these classes like the reason why these games are also going on for a little bit longer is because these players are so good you know they got their weak auras they got everything set up they can they know exactly if this cooldown gets popped we need to use something you're gonna use something next i'm gonna use something next you know they have good defensive rotation and that's why they're staying alive because I mean, look at the damage that these guys are doing. 100k Abysses, uh, 150k Rising Sun Kicks. Like, th this comp can erase you 100-0 if you blink for a second at the wrong time. 
Oh, well, we're going to find out what Hula Bang can do with the comp. Uh, they will be moving forward here into the lower bracket. We've got another lower bracket round coming up next. It is just for fun versus Ultima, and Hula Bang will go on to play the winner of that one. So they're still facing elimination, but, I mean, that's got to give them quite a bit of confidence moving moving forward, Zico, to have that kind of a turnaround mid-game to play that well. You know, you're a, sort of a new team on the AWC teams so seen so that is going to be great for them moving forward let's take a look at the bracket as i mentioned we've got up next just for fun and ultima it was actually wandering water fur bulgs say that three times fast that sent them down there sid yeah um just for fun th this is a really stacked roster they, they can run a lot of powerful compositions they got kind of infernion on the warlock they can run that destro warlock um, it, it's going to be, you know, they're kind of like the meta team, whereas Ultima they're running in here with a jungle cleave and I think they can flex in possibly a fist weaver, I think that I saw in the open bracket, if somebody can correct me on that I, I could have sworn that I saw them play a fist weaver, or maybe it was a different uh, team that was playing a fist weaver um, like kind of de a healer with an evoker and a feral, I think it was a, possibly a different team, but it was very mirrored in, in what compositions they had, so I, I'm excited to see what they do here, this team was actually pretty threatening to echo uh, I think that they did actually take a game off them, which is which is pretty rare uh, for any team really to do in EU. And they were doing it with the the Prez jungle, so Preservation Evoker, Feral Druid, and BM Hunter. Interesting. Yeah, uh, we'll have to see. You know, Echo obviously been dominating for so so long. We've actually heard it's getting a little boring uh, just to be up top that that long. But we'll see uh, if they do fall a little bit here. Wandering Water Fur Blogs, Fur Bulgs, if they are up for the challenge. But we're gonna get through this lower bracket round in just a moment after we head back from this break. It's just for fun versus Ultima up next.
Welcome back, everyone. We are heading straight into game number two. It's another elimination round. It's just for fun versus Ultima. Ooh, this is very interesting. So just for fun, they're going to be locking in the Outlaw, um, Arcane Mage, as well as the Restoration Druid. I think you might actually... No, it is an Outlaw Rogue. And then uh, Ultima playing a little bit of a different composition here. And this, we were talking about this right before we went live. This is the composition that actually beat Echo one round. So they, they beat this exact composition, playing this Devastation Evoker with Nethi, Samurai's on the Resto Druid, and Cassidy on the Feral Druid. So I think this is the blind pick that Ultima wanted here in game number one. Yeah, uh, definitely looks like it. Uh, it's kind of cool because Nethi is actually the healer on this roster, but Samers also plays, uh, I think he plays Druid and Disc Priest, and then he also plays uh, like Windwalker and some DPS. Uh, and then you got Nethi who plays all Evoker specs, but is primarily a uh, Prez Evoker uh, main. And this is actually his first AWC appearance, so it's going to be really cool to see uh, what kind of damage they can do here this weekend, but they're going to need to win this first game right now. Cassidy in big trouble. Ring of Frost does connect into a cheap shot here. Do they have any more follow-ups there onto the healer? Doesn't look like it. DR Gouge comes through, but Nethi uh, is going to be able to start counter-pressuring here a little bit. They do get a Cyclone there low on Cassidy. Uh, Trima is now could be in trouble. Deep Breath connects there into the Disintegrates, and uh, Nethi is uh, doing quite a lot of damage here so far. 150,000 DPS there on that um, Evoker, and uh, we'll see if he can keep that up throughout the game. Uh, because I have a feeling it's going to be a little bit of a longer one. Definitely could be, although Cassidy's taking quite a bit of damage here. Forced into bear form right now, as well as trading out that bark skin. So using quite a bit of defensive cooldowns, but still just he's going to be the main target in this match. It's going to be up to Nethi to get a lot of damage on that Devastation Evoker. Try to really pressure the mana bar of Zank, or potentially just one-shot somebody with that Dragon Rage if they can. The problem is... Zank, Trimaz, and uh, Sokuin are all very durable with these specializations. So I do think that I agree with you. This is likely, outside of like a one-shot, this is going to be one of those games that probably takes a little while to conclude. Maybe. I mean, they do far set the bark skin there from Zank. Uh, it looks like he is going to be able to recover behind the pillar. And once again, just for fun, playing very passively here at this point of the game. Yeah, and uh, we're going to see uh, Trimaz here setting up for another CC chain. They do get a full sheep here, actually, uh, onto Samurs. So a little bit of damage coming out here. Uh, but Cassidy is going to respond with Heart of the Wild, and he's going to respond with his Bark Skin. And Cassidy is going to be completely fine now looking for the offense. He fake has to kick, gets a Cyclone here potentially, but no. Uh, looks like it's going to be avoided. No, it does connect onto So Queen, but that was a triple DR Cyclone. Doesn't really do anything full kit here onto Cassidy. They don't have any crowd control there onto Samers though, so it looks like Cassidy is going to be uh, completely fine in that situation. Trimmer's now getting stunned behind the pillar, and uh, Samers actually sitting up for a drink while Cassidy is getting blasted here. Huge damage coming out here from Nethi. Can they find some CC here onto Samers? Doesn't look like it. Cassidy's sitting through that counter spell. Full kidney connects. There's the full ring of frost into a reshape there onto Nethi. Three versus one. Will be the trinket there from Samers. Does pre bark right before he gets the blind. And big damage coming in here. Almost in execute range there, Cassidy. But he does manage to stay alive there with the shield from that rescue me um, from Nethi. Yeah, that rescue doing a great job there. Nethi able to back him up and. It's very important ability in a matchup like this where someone gets stunlocked, able to just grab them, bring them out of line of sight, and give them a little bit of an extra shield is big. But Soqueen right now taking a huge amount of damage, and you cannot be in the open that long. If you get caught in a stun by Cassidy on the Feral Druid, and Nethi just channeling out those Disintegrates, it is an absolute nightmare on that mage. So they get that big ice block out of the way, which is a huge victory for Ultima. Yeah, really, really nice there, forcing out the ice block. And uh, so Queen, he is most likely not going to have another ice block this game. Uh, unless we go really, really late into this game. So I think Soquin is going to be a great target here for Cassidy and Nethi. They just need to try to keep up the bleeds here on Soquin as well as Trimaz and just kind of switch around. And that's really one thing that I have noticed a lot, especially when I'm playing, is that when you're going up against the Rusted Druid, it is extremely difficult to take anything down before dampening unless you're actually going after that Rusted Druid. So if they can try to get some pressure here on the Rusted Druids. Uh, that could be, uh, you know, a way to kind of accelerate the pace of the match a little bit. But for now, they're going to be happy with that ice block they got from So Queen, and uh, just to try to look to find that pressure. As he once again in the kidney, once again gets rescued. Samers sitting down for a drink. How much mana did he get, though? Is the question. Not a lot. He's down to half still. Zank still with the lead uh, in the mana department. Zank actually sitting Big down for a drink. Well, but they are connecting here onto So Queen once again. 
Yeah, and So Queen is just forced in this position where he has to play very safe at the pillar. If he stays in the open for too long, uh, it's going to be an absolute nightmare. But this is the situation you want. Polymorph into Cyclone on Nethi. Big kidney shot here on the Cassidy, but Zank in the, or sorry, with Samus in the back line should be able to easily keep him alive. And this could just be one of those matchups that does come down to mana. Which one of these druids is going to find opportunities to sit down for a drink? You can see right now, Samus is very far behind. So. As we get deeper into dampening and as this game goes on, Samra's going to have to try to find that drink and it's going to be up to Nethi and Cassidy to set that up for him. You can see him out of line of sight right now going for it. Might be able to get it. Trimaz moving in. They want to shut this down. It's such an important part of the kind of metagame right now. It's just deny drinks at all costs. It's a huge win condition for these teams. Cassidy under a lot of pressure though. Nethi trying to heal him up a little bit with a Vernon embrace. Big deep breath, but not really landing or creating any kind of pressure. Nethi though with the Dragon Rage. This is the scariest moment in the game. But can he connect the damage? That's a question. He's in a cheap shot. Big fire breath into Eternity Surge. Just trying to get some pressure here on the Trimaz if he can. But with Focus Shadows and Cheap Death, I do not see Trimaz going down right now. Yeah, really nice setup there once again, forcing out the trinket there from Samers. And it all started with them landing a counter spell on a Cyclone and then following it up with crowd control chain. And uh, those are the kind of small things that can really decide the game. Uh, the deeper we get into dampening, you know, Arcane Mage loves spamming spell steals here uh, into these druids. And you can see Nethi here getting dispelled uh, constantly. And they're just keeping up pressure onto Nethi as well as Cassidy. They got the Bark skin, they got Cassidy's trinket. Samers has no trinket as well. He has Iron Bark. So if he can pre-Iron Bark the next setup, uh, that could be a way for him to potentially win the game. Um, and uh, we'll see if he can actually uh, keep Cassidy alive right now. He does actually use the Iron Bark before the stun comes out. And now the stun comes out into the Iron Bark as Cassidy is overextended. Nethi trying to get some pressure onto Trimaz. Cassidy getting Cyclone there and Ring of Fire is slowly burning him down as well. 30% dampening now for both of these healers. And uh, you can see here Zank uh, still definitely ahead when it comes to the mana, but uh, still no ice block here for 30 more seconds for Soquin. Maybe they can push the pace and, and make something happen there. Yeah, that Fire Breath is so nasty from Nethi as well. If he can get a fully channeled Fire Breath or the Tip the Scales Fire Breath, that's when he can, he's going to be able to remove all those heal over time effects, and it's going to be a, a moment for them to actually find lethal damage in the match. But 33% dampening. Things are getting spicier between these two teams. Cassidy under fire is going to have to try to get in the line of sight, but he gets caught in the clothesline. Big cheap shot. Gets rescued away by Nethi. Big kitty shot here on Nethi as well to deny any of those off heals. Prime is just all over Cassidy. And this could be one of the problems with the Feral Druid in the late game when those hots are not as effective. You are just forced to play so defensive in a matchup like this. You really have to balance defense and offense with Cyclones and Bear Form and uh, pick those moments to get aggressive. And Cassidy, I think, so far has done an excellent job of that. Gets denied here on the Cyclone into a full kidney shot. But Nethi, at the same time, getting a ton of pressure on Trimez, who forced to use the blind defensive. Nethi's just going to trink it out of that immediately. Cyclone here on Trimez as well. So you can feel the pain coming in here for just for fun. They're under a lot of pressure at this point in the game. Dampening is stacking up. Zank is having a difficult time healing through this devastation of Ochre damage. And... We're going to have to see Just For Fun get some control here in this game. Yeah, as long as they can stay ahead of the pressure and get their own pressure out on the side of Just For Fun, I don't think this is a too bad of a situation. The biggest question mark for me is Nethi. If Nethi can get a big 1D combo, uh, that's when things can really spiral out of control here. And Dampening is only getting higher and higher. Like, if they stack up like this and they get triple breath, it could just be lights out, but double cheap shot coming out. Can they find a Polymorph? They find it onto Samurai. It is on DR, though, from that gouge, but they land the kick onto Cassidy. Good pressure here. 41% Dampening Cassidy, trading out the Bark Skin here and things are really leveling up. Sokin does have his ice block back of cooldown, tries to drop the temporal shield here uh, for that damage, but with that dampening, that temporal shield's healing is effective, uh, is uh, not as effective, and uh, Nethi just going to be switching to the rest of Druid as well, and I really like that uh, when you are playing against the rest of Druid, just target everyone, just hit everything you can, uh, especially the targets that don't have the life bloom, and that is going to tax the Druid's mana a lot more and make it uh, much harder for him to keep up. Um, Trimaz right now looking for his target here, most likely going to be Cassidy once again, Cyclone coming out for Cassidy, Fake has Trimaz, Trimaz forced to go behind a corner uh, to duck uh, for cover, but Zank in the meantime, once again sitting down for a drink, and uh, Zank so far, I, I gotta say he's been playing a really clean defensive game here, um, just uh, keeping up the heals, keeping up the cooldowns, and, and making sure that he has good mana here, uh, you know, the deeper and deeper we get into dampening, so... Uh, Zank having 50% mana right now, and also 
uh, having that tree of life coming up in 30 seconds is going to be huge for him. If they can stay alive for another 30 seconds, he's going to have that tree of life, and that's going to summon those like little uh, tree ants that just spam regrowth and basically make it impossible to take anything down. So um, if Just for Fun can hold on, this is their game to lose. Ooh. Ah, here it is, the Dragon Rage. This could be the end of the game. Nathy going on a solo mission, trying to kill Zanked. And he could absolutely do a big disintegrate here on Trimaz. And we have maybe hit the Enrage timer for this Dragon. 50% dampening, disintegrate after disintegrate. Nothing causing a lot of chaos, but getting controlled up here quite nicely. A bash on Nethi into a full Cyclone. That will deny. And now it's up to just for fun to try to find some pressure here on the Cassidy. Can they do it? Trimaz moving over, looking to find a stun and some burst damage. Nethi in the back line still just rooted up, unfortunately getting completely controlled there on that Dragon Rage. Cassidy forced to trade out his trinket, trying to make a final push here, looking for a Cyclone, but dampening is so high. Samber's completely out of mana. Zank still has a little bit of gas left in the tank. And they hold on. Cassie's just so incredibly low. He's got the Renewal Survival Instinct. Farskin's going to have to make a trade. He's getting so low on health, playing a little bit greedy at this point and dampening, not trying to just avoid that damage. And it might be too little too late. Survival Instincts does come in, and it looks like he will be able to stabilize. Even at 55% dampening, he gets topped off here. But that is all of Sammer's mana after this Innervate, Zico. I think this game is over. Yep, the innovation is about to run out, and uh, that Tree of Life as well is about to expire here for Samers. Still has those uh, little pets out there. You can see them uh, next to Samers, spamming out some regrowth, but those are going to despawn. Cassidy in a lot of trouble right now. Cheap shot. Can they connect with the Ring of Frost? It doesn't look like it. It looks like he missed. No, Samers walks into it there. I'm not sure exactly what happened there. Maybe he got blast waved into it, but Cassidy is in execute range. Big damage coming in. There's a full kidney shot onto Samers. Huge damage. Nathy trying to go with the off heels, trying to get the counter pressure going here. He needs to find a triple breath. He needs to find something here. Dang. Otherwise, Cassidy is going to go down, but at the same time, Zank taking a lot of damage and Nathy trying to carry the team on his back, forcing out the Ice Block by himself, and he's chasing down Zank here, trying to make something happen onto Zank, but Zank finding the full Cyclone onto Nathy, and I think that is going to be it. Full Kidney Shot here onto Samers. Can they connect with any more crowd control? Can they find a Cyclone onto Samers? They really need to pushing in. He's looking for it, but it's not going to be enough here, and there's the Deep Breath coming out now. Here comes Nathy. So might just go down here, man. Yeah, definitely. Nethi going for a push. Double Dragon's Breath comes in. Nethi gets an offensive rescue on Cassidy. It's do or die. Can they take him down? And Nethi's just going for a one-shot here on Zach. At the same time, Cassidy goes down. They just needed to connect on the same target. That was such a close call. Nethi got excited with that uh, Dragon Race. He might get a cross kill. Are you kidding me? Zank is almost dead. Great control. That gouge, super important there by Trimaz. Nethi's still just going for it, but dampening so high. I don't think he's going to be able to recover, but you can tell just how... Close. That game really was going all the way to 65% dampening, but ultimately it's going to be just for fun. They're able to deny the kill and uh, walk away with a win. Yeah, that was, that was, I mean, you, you said it yourself there at the end. If it wasn't for that one gouge there, uh, this would have been a 2v2 game. So uh, the game really doesn't get much closer than that. And I got to say, this game for me, it's another Zanked game here, dude. It's a healer diff lobby. Uh, I feel like Zanked, finding these drinks time and time again is just so key. So this was uh, way earlier in the game. You can see 11% dampening, three minutes in. So this was the very first ice block. But uh, you can see here, uh, this is uh, towards the end. So Zanked already has gotten multiple drinks. And that is why he is, um, uh, you know, out manning uh, Samers here. Uh, and then they find that one Cyclone there onto Nethi. And it's such a crucial moment, right? Because it's 60% dampening. Nethi is the free target. He's the one trying to counter pressure and you know uh, turn this game back into your favor nice counter spell there onto Nethi Dragon's Breath coming out Nethi with the Dragon Rage active right now as well uh, and just trying to get that counter pressure going uh, going after Zank here trying to solo him down but at the same time Cassidy gets caught up in that stun lock and it makes you wonder if he didn't go for that offensive rescue if he had it there in the end maybe he could have keep, uh, kept Cassidy alive but at the same time I feel like uh, if you're Nethi your job there is just to try to close it out try to find a target and just take it down. Um, unfortunately for him, he doesn't have a rogue on his team who can kind of keep everybody locked down the same way. So uh, it is going to be Cassidy instead, who is actually the only Feral in top eight, EU and NA. Cassidy. Very the last stuff. cat. The last cat. See if he can do it. I mean, that was a really close game. Definitely could have gone either way. We can see here the final few moments for Cassidy. 
doing the best he can. Honestly, I mean, I, I feel like he did a great job in this game. Like I said, it's not easy on that Feral Druid to balance defense and offense. When do you go in bear form? When do you go in cat form? When do you try to find the Cyclones? You're getting constantly interrupted and kidneyed and you can get punished if you make the wrong decision. So uh, uh, my hat's off to him. I think he did a great job that game. It's about as close as it can get. And going to hook point, a much smaller map, is definitely going to be beneficial for that Devastation Evoker, uh, I would say. Um, that's one of the problems <laughs> with the Devastation Evoker is your limited range. And I think that So Queen did a really good job playing the range game. Um, anytime he was trying to get aggressive, um, Nethi would just get blast waved away, for example, and just getting knocked out of range. So uh, definitely a tough spot to be in. But uh, I think on hook point, it's going to be a lot easier for them to actually um, get the job done. Yeah, absolutely. And here we have our WoW companion awc.gsd.tv if you guys want to see what gear um these players are wearing what talents they're going and i mean this looks like a pretty standard arcane build so all, uh, all of the mages nowadays uh, are opting for the mass prismatic barrier uh, which you can see next to that bloodlust icon at the very uh, the top row to the right um it's uh, essentially instead of mass invis you get mass barrier and the cool thing about arcane mage is that your barrier um, reduces the time you get crowd controlled. So it's like, kind of like a mix between Ice Barrier and Mage Armor in like Wrath of the Lich King, where it reduces, you know, like if you get dotted and you have uh, Mage Armor, um, the dots have a shorter duration. Same thing for Polymorph and, and you know, like Fears and crowd controls. So you can use this as a mage, for example. If your healer is about to get trapped, your healer is about to get polyed or something, uh, you can Mass Barrier and actually reduce uh, the, the crowd control with that. And you can use it to stay alive as well. It's nice also because you can use it while you're kicked. So. Uh, Mass Barrier, uh, one of the newer talents that most mages are opting for. Uh, of course, uh, also the Master Shepherd, which is the Polymorph talent. You sheep somebody, you get movement speed, you get Versa, and uh, the sheep doesn't uh, heal him back up. And in terms of gear, every mage is rocking the Force set um, as an Arcane Mage. The Force set is super, super good. Um, so, so Queen rocking that Force set uh, for those massive uh, Arcane Missiles. Uh, you get th uh, three clear castings that you consume. Then your fourth arcane missile cast uh, will cleave and do 150% extra damage on the main target. So uh, really uh, nice stuff here for arcane mage. And I think it's a big reason why we've seen kind of arcane mages, uh, especially like online, uh, do so well is uh, because of that four set. Uh, I noticed a huge difference when I got mine. Like it's uh, night and day <laughs> uh, playing with that and playing without it. Yeah, the tier set bonus is nice. It's going to be sad as an arcane mage to lose that one. If we do lose it, you know, it's uh, it's quite nice. I think it is going to be locked in for season four. I think it was the one that was voted on. But yeah, definitely very visually appealing when your arcane missiles are just cleaving the whole team and just kind of mowing them down. Um, it's definitely a lot of fun. And he is actually playing the improved prismatic barrier, which I think is good. So it's a talent you can pick to kind of beef up the effect of his prismatic barrier, make it so you take less magic damage, which I think is very effective against the devastation evoker. You can pop that prismatic barrier right as like an eternity surge is going to hit. Um, it's a big one. But we have a comp swap here for Ultima. They're going to be locking in the preservation evoker jungle. And I think on the small map, it makes a lot of sense to me. This is going to be a lot more of aggressive composition we see here from Ultima. Yeah, and uh, we'll see here if Ultima can uh, do it here. Um, and uh, this is uh, kind of what, what I expected when I saw this team on paper. Uh, usually, Nethi is that preservation evoker, so he's going to be back on it. And uh, Cassidy, of course, loves that jungle. So let's see what they can get going here. They need to pressure. They need to find the traps. They need to find the crowd control. But again, it is so hard. Uh, comps like this that are kind of built to try to isolate a target and take it down, like CC a healer and then try to burst somebody down, like jungle. Um, it, they just play it very differently nowadays because uh, it's so hard against a druid to actually take a target down. Even if you CC the druid, like his little uh, tree minions are just going to keep uh, the target alive anyway. Um, so it just makes it really difficult to go for that strategy. And uh, I assume we're going to see some swaps here. Uh, maybe onto Zankt uh, coming out from Ultima and just try, try to swap around. And uh, whatever target doesn't have life blooms, try to take that one down. So Queen getting interrupted there on that shifting power. It's going to deny a lot of that cooldown reset. It looks like he is going to be the primary target in this match. This could be another one of those games that's come down to mana. And we'll see if Zank can actually sit down and recover. I, I do expect Ultima to have a mana lead if nobody drinks. So if they can keep up the pressure, they can stay alive. That's going to put them in a prime position. But Cassidy's taking quite a bit of damage. Beautiful rescue there coming in from Nethi to try to keep him alive. He's got the heal over time effects up. And I think Cassidy should survive 
enough damage right now here on a so queen to keep him a little bit defensive could have to channel out the greater invisibility but no gets a full polymorph beautifully done there by so queen and they get the emerald communion a massive defensive cooldown from nethi and they're really pushing the pace if they get the trinket as well it's gonna be massive cassidy is so incredibly low nethi playing it incredibly greedy going for the rewind to keep cassidy alive but that was a really really close call beautiful set there for just for fun but nethi doesn't overreact he holds onto his trinket and his team uh, lives to fight another day Yep, really, really good decision making there by Nethi. And uh, he's going to be able to hold on to uh, at least his trinket. Doesn't have the rewind, doesn't have Emerald Communion. So slowly but surely, they are getting his cooldowns. But if he can hold on to that trinket for as long as possible, that can buy him time to get his communion back up, to get his rewind back. Uh, we'll see if he can actually stabilize for that long. Though I feel like right now, Ultima needs good offensive pressure. I feel like Zankt is making it so difficult uh, with the way he's positioning. But there's the scatter shot. There's the trap behind the pillar there. Um, but already, you can see um, So Queen and Trima is already just running, kiting, waiting for that crowd control to fade. And as soon as it does, then they go and launch another attack here. Cheap shot into Gouge onto Nethi. Can they find a Cyclone? Can they find a half poly? And it looks like So Queen is actually going for it, but not able to find it. Again, Ectacity in X. Execute range, get Cycloned here. This could be big trouble here for Cassidy. If they can push in and stun Nethi. Oh my god, they land a counter spell there. Cassidy in huge trouble. Can they follow it up with a stun? I want to see a stun here onto Nethi. There's the bash. Beautiful bash coming in. And So Queen looking for the sheep. But uh, Nethi actually trinketing the bash there. Now getting Dragon's Breath. Ooh, nice scatter shot there onto So Queen to stop the sheep. Trimas in a lot of trouble. Zankto with the tree ants out. Should be able to keep him alive here uh, with that incarnation. And uh, with that innervate, he has free heals as well so Trima's not going to be in any trouble. They got Nethi's Trinket, they got his Emerald Communion, they got basically everything. They could try to set up a swap onto Nethi, or they could just go after Cassidy. I think, I think Cassidy is toast. Uh, if they can force out that Bark Skin, I think he just dies through everything after that, if they have enough damage and can set it up clean enough on the side of Just For Fun. Ooh, big setup here. Full Polymorph on Nethi, but it breaks! Unfortunate. They get cleaved down there just a little bit, so... F is going to get a get out of jail free card. Caught into a blind, though. And this is an absolute nightmare for a preservation of Ogre. I mean, these are all the classes you absolutely hate playing against. Uh, Zanked on the run right now under fire. Cassidy, if he can stay on target. And they take him down. Nothing caught into a root right now. Trying to go after So Queen, doing what he can. But he's getting kited and denied every step of the way. Mana, about even for both of these healers at this point of the game. Full kidney shot here on a Cassidy. Do they have the pressure to take him down? A full polymorph lands on Nethi. He's out of line of sight. He's got no trinket available. Cassidy just trying to tank this out in cat form with survival instincts. Going for a maim cycle. And he gets counter spell. No! A beautiful play there by Soqueen. And it looks like Cassidy will fall. A great push. And, you know, the jungle, typically in the Rogue Mage on the small map, is not so bad. But as a preservation evoker, I feel like these are all the classes you absolutely hate. Like an arcane mage <laughs> just spam dispelling every every heal of the time effect that you have, putting you in roots, putting you in dragon's breath, having the range interrupt. On top of that, you have a druid as well, just cycloning your heal target, cycloning you. You're getting chain stunned. Like there's so many times in this game where Trimaz is just completely crowd controlling Nethi by himself, going over for a kidney shot, into a gouge, into a cheap shot. And during that time, so Queen's just dispelling off all of his heals, all the reversion hots are just gone. So this is an absolute nightmare. I feel like Nethi did a great job, but this is such a difficult matchup to navigate. Yeah, no, it really is. And uh, you hit the nail on its, head, uh, on its head right there. You can see Nethi right now sitting through uh, a root. And one of the most frustrating things as an evoker is when, for example, So Queen decides, hey, I'm going to sheep the hunter. And Nethi's like, well, I have to dispel my hunter so he can play the game. And then you just know about Nethi. And then he can't do anything. He can't use rescue. He can't, you know, do really anything. Um, uh, and also, he's probably going to get CC'd out of that route. And uh, you can see it here. You know, they get the Cyclones. They get the... Um, uh the damage here onto cassidy and uh they managed to take him down there but uh one thing that i really liked uh that a lot of the good druids do and that i saw zank do here as well is when you're in that tree of life incarnation your uh entangling roots is just an instant cast so if your targets are topped you spam regrowth it's an instant cast then your targets are all topped you have your hots rolling um, then you just spam root people because it's it's very annoying for the other healer to constantly have to dispel druid roots and it's very nice when you're the mage, uh, so queen, and your druid already forced out their dispel. Like he rooted the hunter and then that got dispelled and then he roots the uh, healer. Now you can just walk up to the healer and just get a free sheep. So 
uh, it really helps a lot um, when the healer is abusing those instant entangling roots, uh, which Zankth was doing, and it's uh, one of the most powerful things you can do to evokers is just root them, just keep those dragons yeah. grounded. I, I played a lot of dragon, I can tell you. Like, yeah, Preservation Evoker is my favorite healer, the Green Lizard. Shout out to him. He, yep. you know, he's put in his time in solo shuffle and. Yeah, fighting against <laughs> Arcane Mages, Outlaw Rogues, and Wrestle Druids are probably my least favorite thing. I did want to call out um, one piece of tech that Nethi was using. Um, it's something that some of the really, really good evokers started using. This uh, talent has gotten buffed quite a bit, but it is Time Stop. So you have this talent, it's a 45 second cooldown, and you have the ability to basically just make someone invulnerable. It's like an instant cast Cyclone. You can't heal them, you can't damage them, you can't do anything to them. Uh, but he was actually using it on himself to immune CC. Which is really cool so when oh. they didn't have any stops for polymorph he was just time stopping himself he turns gold you'll notice it maybe in the next game um and it mm -hmm. means he can't be crowd controlled so he just picks that moment where they're trying to get cast off maybe a cyclone maybe a polymorph and he just goes completely immune and allows kind of like a gap where you can actually get some heals off so uh, a really really neat spell super high playmaking potential and it's great to see nothing using it yeah that's awesome um if you miss time it then you're gonna cc yourself as well right uh, well, you so, can uh, you can actually cancel it, so you you have like full, really? yeah, you can cancel aura, so you can use it just for like a split second and then get out of it. Oh, oh that's that's really dope. That's really dope. And Nethi was that guy. Do you remember um, at the start of Dragonflight when uh, what was it? Was it Stasis? I think it was that you could use to dispel polys on yourself. Yeah. Yeah, Nethi was actually, as far as I remember, the guy who came up with that tech uh, over in Europe. Uh, right at the start of Dragonflight. So he's he's always been uh, very creative when it comes to this evoker. And uh, personally, at least, I never saw Nethi like, on the ladder or heard of him uh, until Dragonflight. And then when Dragonflight came, he started picking up his dragon. He started playing uh, you know, a lot of Prez evoker. And I started getting like a lot of lobbies with him and, and facing him on high rated. And then uh, now he's here in the top eight in the AWC. So it's been, uh, it's been a pretty good expansion here for Nethi. Um, so far, he's down 0-2 <laughs> uh, in an elimination match. Uh, but still, you know, making that top eight, getting uh, at least a little bit of points is huge. And, of course, his team has, uh, you know, a chance to turn it around here. Um, we'll see. Battleground Sewers locking in the same thing again here. BM Hunter, Feral. Uh, what do you think they should do differently here, Van, um, to, to stand a chance here on the side of Ultima? It's just so... Uh... It's hard to say, right? Like, it, it really is. You, you kind of mentioned it. It's really difficult to find pressure in the match early on. Like, Outlaw, Arcane, Wrestle Druid, they're so durable. So, you kind of have to play for the late game. Outside of, like, a random one-shot, like, if the game plays out the way it should, Ultima just basically has to hold on for dear life until, uh, you know, Dampening gets a little bit higher and they can kind of ride that momentum. Um, it did seem pretty good when they were going after Trimaz a little bit more. Typically, Outlaw Rogues are not a great target, but... Know, just training down the arcane mage with full hots uh, it wasn't really working out too nicely so i'd like to see ultima at least switch around on targets potentially go after who doesn't have life bloom uh, a little bit more in the match but uh, i think this is just a really difficult game for them that insult to injury so queen as well as playing that dwarf that he can just remove all of the bleed effects when he's really in trouble it's just uh, it's just it's really tough for ultima to find pressure but let's see uh, how they navigate this game so far, they managed to shut down So Queen here in the opener, not able to get the sheep shot or the ring out of that um, stun on the healer. So So Queen's still looking for the crowd control, but he does get kicked here so far. Yeah, good kicks coming out from Ultima, but where's the pressure here? So far, not landing too much. There's a sleep coming out onto Zanked, but uh, so far, really no one is taking damage. You can see that little tree there on the box, uh, spamming out those heals, and Nethi now caught up in a full polymorph, and here comes the damage. Cassidy is in a cheap shot, but it doesn't look like So Queen has any arcane charges or any real damage to go with no missile procs right now, so uh, Cassidy is going to be able to walk out of that one easily. Uh, did have to trade out his bark skin though, and now comes the damage. He's in execute range. He's taking a lot of damage. Once again, in execute range, and that will be the Emerald Communion here for Nethi. And uh, this is looking a lot like game number one and number two so far, Ben. Yep, definitely. Cassidy just <laughs> unfortunately trying to connect to his target, getting gouged, getting kidneyed, getting killed, getting knocked away. But there has been a decent amount of pressure here for the side of Ultima, getting a little bit of damage on So Queen. That's going to be the altar time as well, and that altar time is just so effective. Uh, unless we can see Mozaton actually purge it or nothing, get a big tip the scales fire breath. Uh, so Queen's going to be able to sit that full, and that's going to give him a ton of durability in the match. Beautiful disorienting roar there. 
by Cassidy. It was a stun onto his healer. Unfortunately, still getting polymorphed. The roar and really not doing enough. Cassidy, once again, is under fire, but pushing the pace, realizing he needs to get some offense here. Can't just play completely defensive in the match. He can rely a little bit on those preservation of Ochre heals. Cassidy finally gets topped off, but everyone on Just for Fun is just full health. So they've really got to find that damage. They got to find the crowd control on Zanked. And it might just come down to this game comes down to mana. Like they basically just have to put out as much pressure as possible until Zank is completely tapped on mana in this match. And that's going to be their win condition here. Yeah, yeah. But they do manage to get a nice cyclone there onto Zank. But so Queen just kiting. And uh, now he's going to be back next to Zank here. Should be able to stay alive here. Just no way in the pets. Dragon's breathing the pets. Just trying to make sure that he gets some distance uh, from those pets. And now here comes the damage onto Cassidy. So Queen looking for the Polymorph. Can he find it? He does actually find it. And uh, Cassidy is pre-bear form though for this. Frenzied region coming out for Cassidy. He's just going to tank it out in bear form while Nephi is sitting through that crowd control chain. And it looks like Cassidy is going to be able to stay alive. Moston looking for the trap here. Freezing trap does connect there onto Zank. They have the damage though. Who are they going after? Moston getting gouged and now the trap has ended. And uh, once again, it is going to be Cassidy here in a kidney shot. So, uh, so Queen doing a good job so far, just kiting the pets and uh, rotating defensives uh, with those oh. pets. And Cassidy in execute range right now. Nathy forced to trink it out here, going for the rescue. Cassidy still in execute range. Big damage coming out here. Cassidy just yo-yoing there between 50 and 20 percent there from those execute arcane barrages, but does have the incarnation active and is looking for the counter pressure. Zang taking up for a drink during. Oh my God! This is a this is just the worst feeling ever. You're Feral Druid, you pop Incarn, and you're just forced to play defense. You can't stop the healer from drinking with it. Zank has full mana. This is not looking good for Ultima. Yeah, this is a nightmare. You can see So Queen just going behind the pillar, dropping a defensive Ring of Frost. So not only controlling the pets, but Cassidy can't really afford to push. He's just outright dying. This is insane damage here on Cassidy. Great control. Kitty shot on Nethi. Do they have a follow-up? It looks like it's going to be a full DR polymorph there on Nethi. So a little bit shorter. Do they have a Cyclone? A full Cyclone? No, Cassidy, run! Get in there! Oh. Oh. He's just nothing he could do. <laughs> I, I, he's bear. such a nightmare. <laughs> he was not bear, but it's like... It, it's, it's so sad to see the Feral Druids just have to play in bear form. Scared for the lives the entire game. Just for fun. Pulls out another win here on Galaran sewers and they just could not find the damage and that's why this composition is so potent we saw it a lot in North America we're seeing it in Europe as well uh, it's the outlaw rogue with the resto druid with an arcane mage or a destro warlock it's just such a durable comp it's difficult to find damage against it yeah no it really really is uh one of those uh just it just I feel like it's just resto druids right now man resto druids are so hard to land kills against I feel like anytime there's a Resto Druid in the, in the lob, you're going to need a, a decent portion of damp here uh, to win. Uh, but then again, we saw Holy Priest versus uh, Holy Paladin also, uh, you know, a bit of damp. But um, Cassidy here, this is when he uh, almost went down. He got the full trap and uh, Cassidy is just uh, falling further and further behind while they're supposed to be offensive. And then they get the full sheep into Cyclone there onto Nephi. And at this point, Cassidy knows... It's not looking too good. What can you do here? As he has no buttons to press, he has Barkskin in one second. And uh, yeah, just a, a really solid CC chain. And that's the scary thing about RMD, right? Because they can win late, like we saw uh, in the first game, just win on mana. But they can also just win with like a really nice CC chain like that. And they can also win by just one-shotting someone. So um, Rogue Mage, Druid definitely have, uh, you know, different ways to end the game. Um, and uh, yeah, just for fun going to be advancing here in that lower bracket. Yep, they certainly will. They're going to be heading off against Hula Bang later on today in the lower quarters. I did talk with Cassidy a little bit before that break. He did say, or before that series, he did say he kind of knew going into it that he was sort of the off meta composition compared to what Just For Fun would be running and he didn't have Super high hopes, although he was really glad to be back. So hopefully we'll see him again next week because it is good to see people trying to switch up the meta just a little bit. But just for fun, 3-0, as Zico mentioned. And now we'll be moving forward here into the upper bracket then. It's going to be Echo versus Wandering Water for Bogs. For Bogs. <laughs> I'll get that right one of these days. Uh, up next. Yeah, I mean, this is a big game. I mean, I, I think just looking at the matches today, this is the one where you could expect it to potentially be the grand finals. So uh, I could easily see either one of these teams, if they lose, 
making it all the way back to the finals. Uh, I think these are probably on paper the two most powerful rosters. So we'll, we'll see. The story in Europe for such a long time has been who could beat Echo. They've been so dominant um, for such a long time here. But I, I feel like Wandering Water Furbogs, they have the roster to do it. But of a really good fight here against Echo. So I could see the winner of the series potentially being the team that uh, wins this entire tournament. And of course, after that, we're going to have Chibaku Tensai versus Lava Lava. So still a lot of exciting games coming up. Yeah, definitely. We're about halfway through the day. We're going to see that series mentioned coming up next. It's here in the upper bracket. You can see Echo, Wandering Water, Furblogs. And then, of course, at the uh, end of the day, we'll have those two elimination rounds um, and we will see who our top four for EU is. And then, of course, we'll have those NA games on Saturday. So we're going to head to a quick break. Going to come into that upper bracket up next. Echo versus WWF. I'm going to abbreviate it. That sounds good. See you in a bit.
Hey everybody, welcome back. We are now here in the upper bracket. We have eliminated two teams so far. We'll head back into those elimination rounds at the end of the day, Sid. But right now we've got Echo versus Wandering Water Furbolgs. And this is going to be a really big game. These two teams, uh, I, we haven't taken a look at, at predictions yet, but maybe we can real quick. I imagine uh, are some of the favored teams amongst the uh, us on the casting desk. I mean, this is the heavyweight match. Like, this is the title fight of the day. Like, you you can't miss this game between Echo and Wandering Water Furballs because it could set a precedent, perhaps for the rest of the season, oh. perhaps for the rest of the cups. Uh, our predictions are looking pretty aligned here, except for Vinruki, unfortunately, um, <laughs> just for fun. Uh, the only difference there, but they mean, could easily be. You know, they could be a contender, um, definitely depending on the result of this match um, as to who can take it. Uh, he might be the only one that ends up being right. Maybe we should have spread our answers a little bit more out <laughs> evenly there so that we're not just all going to be wrong and we a end up more. being wrong. Um, but Swapsy, you know, rounding out his roster with Tessia and Brunhitti means that he has options to some of the most powerful compositions in the game. He can he can run Mage uh, Outlaw Rogue. He can run Ellie Outlaw Rogue. He can run Mage Lock. Um, potentially some other cheeky stuff if he absolutely needs to because Brunhitti can play almost any melee. So if ever it's like a meta swap, maybe like Rat Warrior becomes more tournament meta, he can even run that. Um, and he's oh. been playing with Next now for basically over a year, I want to say at this point. So we had some questions for Next last year about like, how is he going to mesh with these you know, tournament veterans? Is he going to be able to step up to the plate? Now he's got over a year under his belt, so this team is looking really good uh, moving into this season. You know what I love about this for Swapsy too? Just this whole roster is... It's like that if you can't beat him, join him mentality. Like finally pairing up with like a mage and a rogue after such a long time. And, you know, <laughs> now he has those options available for his team. But we can all see Echo, just a complete powerhouse roster with one change though it's still going to be raikou chanimal and waz but they're bringing in lontar who's an incredible healer in europe um has a lot of flexibility I, I feel like i knew lontar originally as like a restoration shaman but he plays every single one of the healers at a high level i think uh echo pretty much could have gotten any healer in europe that they wanted to join the roster uh, after med left um but it looks like they are going to be going with lontar and so far it's been working out for them I'm definitely saying something about Lone Tar as a player, so I'm excited to see how they do adjust now that we are no longer having meh on this team. But this is the upper bracket, so neither of these teams have yet to drop a game, and you can bet that both of them are going to be coming out full swing because, I mean, like we talked about when we headed into the beginning of the day, they only have two cups to sort of qualify for those initial uh, stages, Super Tees, so... This is going to be a good one. I'm excited. What do we feel like Echo is going to be running as a healer since Lone Tar is capable of running so many different specs? Well, I feel like depending, this is all depending on what they think is the strongest option in the meta, right? Because we're seeing a lot of variants at the moment. Like, I think de definitively going into the tournament, a lot of teams considered Arcane Mage the best, but what they're actually playing is not always Arcane Mage, uh, especially in NA. We've seen Shadow Priest, Moonkins. We've seen a lot of Ellies from teams as well. Um, so this first game could determine, like, where is their mindset for what the meta is? Because I'm not entirely sure. Like, I mean, on paper, I'm expecting, like, Ellie or not Ellie, sorry, Arcane Outlaw Resto Druid from Echo, and then Watering Fur, Watering Fur, Water Furbolgs. Their name is going to be a tongue twister for the entire time for this <laughs> period for me. They could run the same, right? Like that. That would be my expected matchup for them, but it could be something totally different based on how their war games have been going up to this point. Yeah, who really knows? I mean. They, I'm sure both of them have had a ton of practice. There's been a ton of time also between the last time we saw them play oh on AWC God, what is and that? now. So here we are, game number one. That is a good question, Sid. It's Echo versus WWF. So no yeah, mages I mean, in sight. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, we'll see. We have a Desperate Warlock here from Channel. We got Lone Tar on the Restoration Shaman, which has been very popular in North America, that Restoration Shaman. I think it brings a lot of healing as well as offense uh, in terms of mana, longevity as well. doesn't really have to sit down and drink as much as the Restoration Druid. And uh, yeah, it, yeah I, I think this is going to work out nicely here for Echo. Obviously for Furbogs as well, they're going to be bringing in Brunhitti on the Outlaw Rogue over the Demon Hunter, which is a comp they played the most. Big setup here on next though, as Echo's looking to get aggressive in the early stages of the match. 
All right, Lontar on his home class here on that Restoration Shaman. We've been seeing that getting picked up more and more. The Poison Cleansing going to be really important here. Brynhidi getting Infernal Stun into a Fear. We also see Channimal on broadcast for the first round uh, with Waz paired up on some Warlock Rogue Shaman. It's been such a long time since I feel like this comp has really been in competitive play where Swapsy running that Ellie Outlaw has been seen quite a few times. Waz is just whacking away at Next right now, trying to chop down the tree. He's going to gouge him up, try and swap back uh, and create some pressure. It looks like they're attacking Lone Tar. And I feel like Shaman is actually not a terrible target. Their armor has been reduced significantly. But at the moment, Channel is securing so much crowd control. They got a full fear on Next. That puts Swapsy behind. Next had to use Nature Swiftness. Now Brunhidi is falling behind. Channel is doing massive pressure across all three players here as they swap to Next for the next couple of seconds. And Brunhidi is basically trying to solo Lone Tar. And if they just let him get away with this for too long, uh, you know, if Swapsy gets in with a couple Lava Bursts, I definitely see him being a viable target. Yeah, it could happen. I mean, Lontar's mana is looking really good at this point of the game. So far, ooh, they actually do manage to get the wall out of the way. So, uh, you're right. I mean, the Earthen Wall is down. Astral Shift was used. Lontar's still down to about 30% health. I think if Waz needs to, he can come back and peel. He's playing quite aggressively here onto the Restoration Druid. As they are just trying to get out as much damage as possible. Bounce around. Who doesn't have Life Bloom and really kind of tax uh, Nexus mana. Portal Coil coming in here from Channel, summoning in a few portals, looking to get aggressive, but once again, Brunhidi's just going to sit on top of Lone Tar, getting a Kidney Shot, Waz moving over with a counter Kidney Shot, and this is what I'm talking about. I feel like if Brunhidi is overextended too much, Waz is going to be able to heal him, and this is exactly what we'll see, I, I think, moving on in this game. You can see Swatsy Ooh. falling further and further behind at this point. Yeah, Next is really struggling, now into a Gouge. Astral Shift comes up for Swapsy. Brunhidi is still trying to go for the kill on Lone Tar, just not finding enough damage. The other advantage of attacking the Resto Shaman is you can snipe his totems whenever he puts a Healing Stream totem down or a Healing Tide totem. You can just kill those very easily if you're attacking him. I like that Static Field pulling Lone Tar in the middle of the map so that Swapsy can blast him down here. He's got to deal with that Observer from Channel. It's doing a lot of redirected damage, but maybe he's just going to ignore it. Lone Tar is so low at the moment. Channel gets interrupted by Brunhidi. They're still just riding down the Shaman. Look at this pressure. And I mean, this isn't even like a really good Shaman killing comp between Outlaw in uh, Ellie. I feel like uh, people are probably going to experiment more with potentially some melee cleaves and running down shamans. Uh, I think that it's definitely a vi more viable option than in the past since those armor nerfs. They get Lone Tar Spirit Link in that swap and now WWF have you know brought themselves back into the game. They've got a lot more options moving forward. Yep, cheap shot on Lone Tar once again going for a thunderstorm to try to knock him away but Brunhidi just using the line of sight of this pillar to avoid Channimal's fears, avoid Channimal's damage and really just continue this damage. Double Mortal Coil coming in though. Channimal finally getting some damage off here on the Swapsy but it looks like Swapsy should be okay. Next right now in that Incarnation Tree of Life trading out the Iron Bark going to be completely fine. Lone Tar still just struggling to survive. It gets knocked into the middle of the map. Swapsy repositioning him and getting a, a lot of pressure. Lone Tar now into a kidney shot once again. He's got Trinket, but what knock? else does he have? Ascendance can be used to try to stay alive. Or it's actually just proc Ascendance. Lucky proc there for Lone Tar. That might be able to actually stabilize him at this point. Oh, Brunhidi right back on him again. More Lava Burst incoming from Swapsy. Game one, is it going to go to WWF? There comes the killing spree. Oh Massive goodness. pressure. Lotar in so much trouble. And he almost goes down. A kidney shot from Waz pauses the damage. Swapsy has to solo Lotar. Can Swapsy solo him? More Lava Burst. He jumps in on top, but Brunhidi can't get there. Channel is fearing him. Full kidney shot. No trinket. Gouge on Channel. He can't help. Waz is trying to do his best to peel them away with the cheap shots. Cheap shots the whole team. Big heals coming from Lotar. If he gets gouged on that War Mastery, could be lights out. But that disarm from Waz stops. Spurn hit his assault. Lontar stays alive once again. He snuck he snuck his healing tide away while he was getting attacked there by reprojecting it into the middle of the map. So really clutch play from Lontar. Now they're trying to punish Brunhidi for his offense. He's cheap shot away. Is he gonna go down with that full fear? No tremor totem for seven. Swapsy is rotting down. Channel goes for another fear onto next. They pull Channel away. Next is waiting to get out of crowd control as soon as possible. The, the main disadvantage of doing this is that Water Shield is giving big value to Lone Tar, so he's likely going to win on mana if they keep training him, so long as he can stay alive. Yeah, this is really good that Lone Tar was actually able to survive there. Managing to get off those clear casted heals just to survive. Healing Wave coming in as well. Brunhidi finally landing that counter cheap shot, but Swapsy then cheap shot himself. Big Lava Verse coming in. Lone Tar once again getting a proc Ascendance on that Riptide. That's a lot of healing for him to survive. Next, sitting down for a drink right now. How much mana is he going to be able to recover? Just a little bit. Swapsy under pressure right now. Can't drink for too long. Lone Tar shuts it down. Big Chaos Bolt lands on Swapsy as well. The channel gets denied with a cheap shot. Nicely done there by Brunhidi, who is now back on target, just trying to stay on Lone Tar as much as possible in this match. And that was a really close call on Lone Tar. He barely survived that 
Assault going down about 5% health. He's going to just gate away behind out of line of sight. Is he able to get it? Healing Surge is coming in, but as dampening gets higher and higher, this can be really difficult to for Lone Tar to actually survive these incoming attacks. Oh, look at that coil from Chanimal. Double mortal coil. Now looking for fear spam. Not able to find it. Lone Tar gets a lasso, pulling Brunhidi off of his back for a moment. Um, if they can keep him pressured and off of him, they're going to be in a great spot here. Another kidney shot. Static field pulls him in the middle of the map. I love this trap that they're laying on Lone Tar. He actually has to trinket and wall. Those are major cooldowns. He's got Spirit Link left to his name here. Next is actually almost out of mana. They've almost hit that critical mass point. Lone Tar needs to survive a little bit longer. Waz is actually going for the kill on Next. Chaos Bolt incoming from Chanimal as Next line of sights at the pillar. Jumps out to the middle of the map to his teammates to redirect his positioning here. He's likely going to need to get a drink. I mean, he's got Innervate in five seconds. Maybe he's going to play around that, but if he drinks, Brunhidi is getting low health. This is a lot of pressure on Next. He's going to Innervate and try and heal with that free healing for the next couple of seconds, but Cheap Shots are coming in. Brunhidi has to trinket. He has to vanish. He he might just throw a kidney shot and try and go for the kill at this point. I mean, they've got nothing left. Brunhidi's trying to do it. He's going after Lone Tar. Swapsy's trying to get there. They have to static field him out of his earthen wall totem or thunderstorm him out of his earthen. There's the thunderstorm. They have to reposition him again with static field out of this earthen wall or he's going to be able to tank the damage. I don't think Swapsy has it. Lone Tar's going to reposition back to the pillar and he seems to be recovering. Next is totally tapped. He goes for a cyclone on Waz. They take Waz out of the game. This could be it. Kidney shot left for one more second. Lone Tar gets spirit link, but Waz isn't there. He can't get inside. The kill the Spirit Link Totem. Waz is trying to get back. He cheap shots Brun hitting Brunhidi. next has zero mana. One second left on the stun from Chanimal. Do they have more? They get the cheap shot and they're going for it. They proc the cheat death. But it's enough time. Brunhidi gets Cloak of Shadows. He's alive and he is gunning down Lone Star. He knows he's got nothing. Static Field comes out. They pull Brunhidi and Swapsy. He burrows under the Static Field. Swapsy knocks Lone Star up in the air. Brunhidi ducks over to try and go for the kill, but Lone Star gates away and Swapsy is getting taken down by Chanimal. He cannot stay aggressive. He's just trying to off heal. Blind on the Warlock. Gouge on the road, but Swapsy, there's nothing left for next he can't keep him going and Lone Tar survives the gauntlet Echo take game one. Oh my goodness I mean that was such a close game I really like the offensive push there onto Lone Tar seemed like he really was the best target for them to go after and he barely survived I mean this was an incredibly close game Echo ultimately is able to peel him and survive and it can be difficult right like that strategy of chasing down Lone Tar like this it ends up being very risky I mean you're swapsy you're constantly crossing the middle of the map uh, and that's allowing Chanimal to get out a lot of pressure. You're getting caught in the stun. So if Lone Tar is able to actually survive these attacks, it's like you said, he's getting a lot of value from Water Shield. And he's also really pulling Brunhidi and Swapsy into bad positions. Uh, it makes it really difficult for Next to actually efficiently heal them. Oh, man, this is a crazy push right there. Like that gateway, if he didn't have that right there, I mean, he might have been done, just done and dusted. Uh, but Next just has zero mana at this point in the game. So whether they're going to flex their strategy, I feel like there's better comps to kill a Shaman than Ellie Outlaw. And I really do th sincerely think these melee cleaves are actually a really good option to flex when teams are looking to use the rest of Shaman. So maybe they maybe they bring in something different, maybe like even a Ret Outlaw Rogue or Swapsy on some type of melee DPS. I'm not entirely sold on that. It's possible, but I, I, I feel like, it, I, I think those kind of comps get punished so bad by outlaw rogues and uh, warlocks. If you're just going after the shaman, I, I just, I'm not entirely sold that he'll die really fast. It is possible. It's like you said, the, armor, the rest of shamans did get some armor nerfs, so uh, it is something that could happen. But um, we'll have to wait and see. Maybe it's an adaptation that we do uh, end up seeing. Um, but. Uh, Ellie Outlaw, I think it's a very durable composition. It can bring them to the late game, but the amount of pressure they were able to get onto Lone Tar, even kind of pre-dampening, uh, was very surprising. So I don't know if Lone Tar is playing like really, really greedy talents or really, really greedy gear to get out more healing, and maybe he's not playing like necessarily tanky build, um, and he makes a, a switch. You think we're going to a small map, and they're just going to try the same thing again? I mean, I'm trying to open up the... I don't know if we have the gear checking thing that we did. Um, before, but to see to see like if he's running really low verse because a lot of healers, a lot of players will run like full crafted gear, which is generally lower versatility. Um, but if you know you're getting trained, then you flex some of that away to the actual conquest gear because it's higher versatility. Uh, that is something that I think Lontar probably could just get away with um, unless he's really worried about the warlock being a target. Uh, Wandering Water Furbogs, they're going to the small map. I think it makes a lot of sense um, in terms of the strat that they were running, assuming that they were going to run it again. He's got at least a lot. It looks like a lot of crafted pieces. It uh, looks like maybe the Conquest Neck and then the four piece. So he's he's actually maybe a pretty high on first wearing the Conquest Neck. Um, yeah. So he, uh, he's pretty tanky, I think, with the build that he's running currently, um, comparatively what he could be running. 
um, depending on maybe what his bracers are or his boots, because I think the boots are also crafted, the belt looks crafted. I think it's just the bracers aren't in the lay or the cloak might not be. Um, so, I mean, I can't see his overall versatility with this. I'd say he's probably riding somewhere between 30 and 34% versatility um, with what he's wearing at the moment, which maybe he could bump up a little higher. He could take one of the rings off and wear a PvP ring um, if he was really starting to struggle. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see if he does end up making a choice. It looks like we are going to be going to hook point, so... Furbog is going to be committing to that smaller map. Echo No has a choice. Are they going to go with Luntar on the Restoration Shaman once again? Maybe they go with him on something else. I, I feel like I like the comp from Echo. I think it's well-rounded. I, I think it's probably something they could comfortably lock in. Might just be taking this extra time to discuss, you know, strategies, what they could do a little bit better. Maybe we do see Lontar go a little bit tankier gear. Uh, it's like you mentioned, though. His, his gear is pretty standard. I don't think he's doing anything too greedy. Uh, they are going to be locking in that same composition. Raikou on the bench, and then uh, now it's up to the Furblogs. What are they going to do? Um, they do have Tessia, I do believe, as well. We haven't seen him just yet, so they could be bringing in some Mage. I kind of doubt it. I feel like an Arcane Mage in this situation wouldn't necessarily be the best um, against, you know, a Resto Shaman, Destro Warlock, and an Outlaw Rogue. So I think it's likely we do see Swapsy on the Ellie. Maybe we see Swapsy on the Warlock. They do, like, a Mirror Match situation. Uh... Does next have Resto Shaman and does he can he play it as well as Lontar? I feel like that might be a pretty big gamble on their part. I mean that comp almost works. Like I mean if it's a smaller map and Swapsy can actually get to his target, um, I, I could see that composition working. They they are taking their time here. They they have a lot of options. I don't think Mage is the right move though. Uh, I feel like on a small map and given the comp, there's just so much lockdown. I would play Mage. I, I would I'd be really <laughs> surprised to see if they bring uh, Tessia in in this game. I think it's probably the same matchup and then depending on what healers next has prepared um maybe he has something else but druid is i think probably pretty solid anyways so yeah they're just going to run the same strat uh or same composition about we'll to wait and see if it's the same strat because they they really just trained the shaman there really wasn't a lot of pressure on anybody else throughout that entire game so they might just go warlock play a more standard game on a small map but then they can't drink with the druid if they do that so i'm expecting them to keep trying to pressure lone tar yeah and the thing is, it was close, right? I mean, Lone Tar barely survived. I think he got down to like 4 or 5% health at one point in the game. Um, so I, I don't think this is like a completely lost strategy. For blogs, they're running a very durable composition. They got an Outlaw Rogue themselves, the Ellie Shaman. And on the small map, it might be a lot more difficult for Lone Tar to actually, you know, cross. And uh, we'll, we'll see maybe Brunhidian Swapsy not in such a vulnerable positions. And maybe next can sneak away for a drink. Uh, that remains to be seen but uh yeah really curious to see how this one plays out both these teams running very strong compositions we're going to a small map is that going to be enough to go after lone tar or are they going to completely change their strategy and maybe just go after channel a little bit more try to deny his damage uh and maybe just try to set up drinks for the healer a little bit more on this one well, we'll see if they want to play a, a standard game a risky game, maybe a neutral game, maybe a flex game where they do, uh, you know, swap between strategies, open aggressively and then sit back if it's not working and try and set up a drink and then go aggressively again into the future. Um, but Lone Tar being on this roster, it seems to be really important uh, with the Restoration Shaman so far because I think they have to use him, utilize him as well in the open bracket on Shaman. So he's definitely been, you know, a vital member of the team so far. Um, WWF here not making any changes. So are they going to be aggressive? They're just immediately going to grapple in, look for a sap on maybe the Warlock and just open right away regardless of where Waz is. How are they going to look to play this? Um, typically, Swapsy's teams are, you know, they play more kind of like a safe, you know, do damage, don't die. Was I think it's his trademark, right? <laughs> do damage and don't die. So to see his team be the aggressor it is quite a change in terms of, like, philosophy towards gameplay. Yeah. I, uh, okay, we'll see how this one goes. Brunhidi going to get dismantled early on. Lontar dropping an Earthen Wall Totem. Try to just slow down some of this initial damage. Observer gets dropped down as well, just really blasting. Need to make sure they take care of that. And Earthshock comes in from Swapsy and does shut it down. Big kidney shot here on the Lone Tar. And this is where the cleave damage happens. And that's one of the nice things. I mean, the Ellie Shaman accelerates at cleave damage. Flame Shock, everything. Lava Burst, everything. And when you go after Lone Tar, you kind of group everybody up. And it allows Broomhitty to cleave. It allows Swapsy to cleave. And it forces Lone Tar to kind of heal everyone up. Um, so that might be the decision to go after Lone Tar. Just get more targets involved and really take advantage of having that Ellie Shaman. Swapsy's not able to get there. Brunhidi is trying to solo Lone Tar, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think the static fields and the thunderstorms, when Swapsy can remove Lone Tar from his Earthen Wall totems and put him in the middle of the map, 
that's going to be the main win condition for his team. So he's got to be really precise uh, when he's making these moves and get great positioning to be able to get these thunderstorms. Renitti's on top of him. I think Swapsy wants to get there, but Waz is training him down, trying to stop, stop him. And there's that earthen wall. They need to knock Lone Tar out during the kidney shot, and it doesn't look like they have a knockback available at the moment, so he's getting big value that's reducing. There's the, the static field. They pull Lone Tar out of the earthen, but they kind of need two knocks because then he can project his earthen. So you use static field to move him out of the first earthen. Then when he moves his earthen, you can thunderstorm him again, and he won't be in it. So if Swapsy combos those together in a chain, I think that's going to be the main push where they're able to win the game. Next right now, sitting down for an early drink in the match. Is he going to get sap? Waz comes over, shuts that down. Gets a full kidney shot. Maybe get some pressure here. They do force out the trinket into a coil, though. They could take him down. Do they have a follow-up stun? A Shadow Fury oh. lands. Where's the damage? Next might just fall. A huge push here by Echo. That's a bit unexpected. Next goes for a drink, falls behind on healing, and Echo punishes in a big way. At the same time, though, Lone Tar is forced to trade out the Astral Shift and could just go down. Oh, he's hovering at about half health. I mean, it's really difficult when you can't cast because you're four piece. You need to cast a healing wave or a healing surge, and then it buffs all your riptides. So if the rogue is just training you, gouging you, kidneying you, and never letting you get that buff from your four piece, you lose out on so much riptide healing. Here's that earthen wall totem. So Swapsy needs to try and knock Lone Tar out of it if they're going to go for the kidney. There's the kidney. Is he going to knock him? He's not using the knockback right now, so he's getting big value on that. And Channel is fearing there's no way Lontar dies if he's not removed from the earthen with some cross crowd control uh, onto his opponents here. Next might have to get risky and actually get some clones, I think, during those kidney shots. So that way Channel or Waz isn't just peeling all their damage. Uh, and next is going to have to be kind of the playmaker offensively, I think, for, for their team to be able to step up to the level that they need to to be able to take Lontar down. Yep, next just in the back line right now, somebody in some heals, looking like he wants to sit down and go for a drink, but Chanimal just ports over. He's met with a bash, and next repositioning once again, just wants to play away from the fight. That's what the Druid wants, play as far away as possible. Gets interrupted there, beautiful CS there by Chanimal, and Lone Star and Waz are falling a little bit further behind, but it is going to be Swapsy taking most of the pressure. Ironbark is available, another incarnation tree of life with the Innervate. Next has a ton of free healing here, and I don't think his team's going to go down in health whatsoever at this point of the game and this is a great opportunity for uh the furbogs to make a push here onto echo oh brunhitty taking huge damage right now he's not even using the cloak of shadows though he manages to recover he's gonna kidney shot was stall the damage put some cross pressure there try and make lone tar spend more mana channel i think he sees next trying to drink was is trying to get there infernal stun from stealth into a kidney shot setting up was for damage and denying the drink channel is on top of on his a game right now and now next gouged low health they're gonna swap back onto swapsy there's a kidney shot though they need to assist and it looks like he's okay to survive the kidney shot as they drop down an observer i really like that play from channel anytime lone tar is in a kidney shot you put an observer up and swapsy's either gonna have to hurt himself to attack lone tar or he's gonna have to put damage into the observer which isn't going into lone tar so he can survive the stun so i think that's a really good tactical position for channel to save his observer during that he fakes the interrupt he gets a chaos bolt off nice place from channel right now swaps is going to knock him back into the corner next is really struggling look at his whole team right now hovering at about 60 percent he gets a tree of life proc off that swift mend and he should be able to recover with that tree of life here comes another kidney shot they need to get him out of the earthen wall totem and it doesn't look like they can channel's just fearing brunhitty off into the corner they cheap shot him again next in the kidney but he's in bear form he's gonna be fine they swap back to brunhitty lone tar is getting aggressive looks like he wants to go for a lava burst but every Every global you use that's not on a heal on a shaman just feels so like it costs so much you just feel like you fall behind if you even use two globals doing damage yeah definitely try to go for a flame shock lava burst and your whole team's dead <laughs> and uh we'll see the lone tar navigating the situation well the watch forced to trade up the cloak of shadows he's been using his vanishes very aggressively here getting a full kidney shot now onto next and brunhitty they're getting cleaved down here by waz putting out a ton of cleave damage on that outlaw rogue and that is the difficulty if you come back and peel as brunhitty you are going to get cleaved down same with waz so these rogues are trying to split up and go after the healers not to take too much cleave lone tar though into a couple stuns portals dropping down channel getting out a huge amount of damage on that destruction warlock topping the meters or at least staying even here with swapsy on that elemental shaman now getting a full kidney shot on the next once again as they're just bouncing around making it very difficult for this wrestler Drew to ever get a break in the game he's constantly under fire his teammates are getting swapped to lone tar at the same time Trying to survive a beautiful static field totem bringing Brunhitty out in the middle of the map into a fear. Good crowd control here. Brunhitty gets out of the fear into a full kidney shot onto Waz and continuing to try to just get damage onto Lone Tar. He gets away, tops himself off, healing tides down, and Lone Tar will stabilize.
That was a nice double coil. Channel pre-coiled his cheap shot, so both DPS were hitting and swaps who were CC'd during the setup. That was really well done. Now they're attacking next. He uses his trinket. He's still just dying. He send wards. Is he going to die through send ward right here? He has to trank shield on top of the trinket. He has no bark skin for another 26 seconds. He is running the cooldown reduction tranquility, it looks like, at least there when I saw a tick. Waz into a bash, and we have yet to see next actually successfully land a clone. And I will say, when you face Channel with counterspell, he is the scariest player with counterspell. He will just never miss it it doesn't matter if he's been playing you know with high ping although i think now he's actually playing with decent ping as he's in school in europe uh, to my understanding unless he's gone back uh, to australia so it's actually channel fully powered Ooh, up here and he has to it. burrow to get out of the static field and he's got his wall up he's trying to get back behind the pillar with his team but everybody is dying channel is all over Triple them there's two up. rifts right now everybody is about to die but was having it returned to him as well lontar has to use the spear link totem and wwf are not going down without a fight look at this pressure lontar is struggling lane with two players low and interrupt onto Chanimal. If Next can just sneak in and get a drink here, his team is going to be in a really good position. Ooh, he distracts Waz the drink. The shadows there. Yeah, beautifully done there. Shutting down the drink now. Going after uh, Swapsy getting a hit by Brunhitty once again, but Brunhitty getting swapped to. Big setup here by Waz. Could take him down. Brunhitty does manage to survive using that Cloak of Shadows to completely immune the damage and stay in it. But both these healers are running on fumes. Big heals here by Lontar, popping that Ancestral Guidance, doing what he can to keep him alive, going for a healing wave, but it gets gouged. Still looking for the healing wave. The Surge managing to find it. Fear coming in from Channels, slowing down Brunhitty and allowing Waz to get aggressive here. But next is still is keeping Swapsy and his entire team alive. Big setup here onto Brunhitty. Waz grapples over, gets the gouge on next. They are all over the place. Both these rogues playing at such a high level in this match. Dampening is so incredibly high. Hi, we got a healing tide here for Lone Tar. Three healing tides of stun, but it gets sniped off immediately there by Brune Hitty. Nicely done. Slow that down. Next sitting down for a drink. You're not able to recover any mana whatsoever. And this is a do or die at this point for the fur bogs. They're oh, out the of mana, the potentially trinket. out of time. Does he have a gouge out of the blind? Uh, doesn't look like it. Waz is playing close. There's the gouge. But there's no pressure. The cheap shot Brunhitty. Lone Tar is always going to win on mana with this strat. That water shield is giving him such value uh, in this exchange. So if next can't drink, it's, it's going to look pretty grim here. And we haven't seen any knockbacks. I, I think right now this That's is it. the game-winning opportunity. But Brunhitty has to live for it. I don't think he's going to. Cheat death procs at 1%. Swapsy tosses out a healing surge. Swapsy's doing whatever he can. But there's really nothing left as Brunhitty is likely to fall in game number two. Adaptive Swarm bounce to him it's not enough and Brunhitty will fall and Lontar survives yet another gauntlet thrown down by WWF as we're moving into match point this is really interesting the fur box that was such a close call that map definitely playing in favor I want to say it was playing in favor of Echo I mean it's a small map I guess um see the fur box they take a little bit of a risk a calculated risk trying to stay on top of the shaman on the small map not allowing him to, you know, kite across the map so easily. But at the same time, you really deny next any opportunity to drink. Waz is always in range for like a grapple cheap shot, grapple gouge, and really keep up that pressure. But there's a ton of pressure here on the Swapsy. The triple portals came in. There's an incredibly close call here on Waz as well. This is the Spirit Link Totem. It's got the Cloak of Shadows coming up in just a few short seconds. But Lontar having to trade up that Spirit Link during that moment. Really, really close call. Um, and this is the point of the game where Nex is just completely tapped on mana. They're going after Brunhitty. Uh, Nex doing what he can with the Iron Bark, but just does not have the mana to actually get out any kind of efficient healing. And there's just basically no recovery at this point. Dampening is so incredibly high. Brunhitty trying to slow down the game a little bit. The cheap death proc, Swapsy throwing in some heals, but uh, there's just no way to recover when you have no mana. And ultimately, it's like you said, said the Shaman, this is where they excel. On a small map, if nobody's drinking, you're going after the Shaman pretty much always going to win on mana and that gives uh, echo a big advantage in the late game yeah definitely so they, they've seen this strategy play out it looked closer i'd say on game one than game two like lone tar got more comfortable he might have changed some of his gear as well uh anticipating that strategy so i mean swapsy i think their team was really relying on this strat you know but i just feel like they weren't getting the knockbacks the same type of knocks like the kidney shot if they can knock them out of the earthen it's way more scary i mean outlaw rogue and ellie damage is, is reduced heavily by earthen wall totem like almost all of their spells are little tiny hits that get nerfed way heavier by earthen wall totems defense mechanism so this is the final moments you know an 18 second kill look how long he was low health <laughs> like this yeah. is 20 seconds of being sub 35 percent health 
until inevitably falling over and it's mostly just because next just has completely zero mana he's keeping life bloom up and trying to use omen of clarity sopsy's trying to off heal but it's just unrecoverable at that point so wandering water furbogs are you know they're flipping the switch now they're going to big map they've realized like okay we're going to need to drink if this game is going to go long and it looks like you know lontar's not going to be choking so this these games are likely going to be uh going pretty long so they're going to need a big map and a lot of distance to drink now maybe whether or not they switch their comp but i kind of feel like they're not i, I think the comp is okay if next can actually get mana at certain points in these games i, I think it could work for them what do you okay so I'm sure you watched a lot of the open bracket games in North America. We saw a lot of Restoration Shaman in North America, and they, they popped off. They did really well. Now we're seeing Echo play the Restoration Shaman. I feel like most people going into this tournament expected basically all the healers to be playing Restoration Druids because of how powerful they are. Uh, why do you think we're seeing so many Shaman? Uh, I mean, mana seems to be the main reason. I feel like any time I was watching someone stream from one of the players' pause, it's just that Druid was running out of mana faster, and it's it's coming down to which healer doesn't run out of mana, or trying to find another weakness. I think training the Shaman could possibly be a weakness that's a little bit still unexplored. Um, but it, it mostly just came down to mana. The mana changes for Druid seem to be having a pretty significant impact at the highest level when we've got all max gear on the tournament realm um, and the experience that they have between each other. Um, also, maybe... The difference between like outlaw rogue 100 percent locking in as opposed to subtlety rogue because there were some nerfs to subtlety rogue um could be another factor um but yeah it, it was surprising i think the poison cleansing totem as well uh, was a big deal uh, it's you know just removes the mortal wounds effects from all these rogue teams so when you get into dampening you know 50 percent healing reduction from dampening but you can just snap off the rogue ms during a healing tide or something and then the whole team gets topped so how, i think how the does poison it work? cleansing does it was a big deal poisons? Yeah, it's just a tick, and it removes the five stack instantly. It just keeps ticking. It's just basically gone. Oh, wow. It actually removes entire the entire duration. stack of it? Yeah, just every poison. Crippling's gone. Wound's gone. So you're not snared, and you have no MS. It's, it's oh my, really good. That's insane. It was uh, yeah, really good. Okay. I, I, when I was playing my Shaman yesterday, and I forgot to respec it against a rogue, I was like, man, this is actually crazy how good this is. I have to remember to respec for this. It just I didn't like realize that game. it actually removed the entire wound stack and crippling poison. That seemed really... Active, yeah, so. it's not like the abolish old days where it was like one stack of it. No, it's just the whole thing is gone. Just tick gone off the whole team. <laughs> just tick, that gone, seems gone. really good. It's really good. Uh, that could that could definitely be one of the reasons why we're seeing the restoration shaman. Um, that's that's really really strong. But going to a big map, very similar to the Grand Arena, where Echo was able to pull off a win. This map, I think, is going to be basically set up for next. They know they need the late game drinks if they do want to have that uh, capability to go into you know the 40, 50 percent dampening. While it's going to be starting off onto Brunhitti, now swapping over onto next, just really keeping them guessing with a fear on swaps. Yeah, great opener here for Echo. Right, let's see what they can get off the back of it. Next actually gets a clone. I really like this. I think Next needs to just try and get more crowd control on Waz so that Brynhidi and Swapsy are more free to attack Lone Tar. The, the big threat that he's going to have to deal with is Chanimal. He's got to get through the counter spell. Uh, maybe maybe we see Swapsy like, cast a Hex or something, trying to bait a CS um, from Chanimal so that way Next can more freely cast clones because I really think he could be the playmaker for his team. He's playing a solid defense game, but I think he needs to flex a little bit of offense. They swap to him again here. They get his Bark skin. He's got be tactical with it right like trying to push in and get a clone when you don't have bar skin is probably not a good idea but once that bar skin comes back and he's got some options i think making plays with bash and making plays with clone is gonna be like right here he gets a bash clone on the warlock you just take the lock out for like 10 seconds gives your teammates more time to recover stabilize stay where they need to healing tide totem is down for lone tar swap season of fear and can't kill it lone tar is probably going to move that healing tide if he needs to it's just sitting there it doesn't look like he needs to big lava burst coming out from swapsy onto brunhitti but a double coil from channel static field swapsy into midfield into a double infernal that's beautiful teamwork right there uh, from Lone Tar and Chanimal stacking them up for that combo, but they don't have enough damage to finish them here. Next, pre-bear forms the gouge, expecting to get kidney shot. Brunhidi's feared on the kidney shot. Chanimal playing really good defense. Anytime Lone Tar is in trouble, he's just supporting with fears at Nether Ward to immune the wind shear of Swapsy. Chanimal saving those, you know, cooldowns so that he can peel and make sure that Lone Tar is safe. Alright, here we go. Swapsy still getting cleaved down, getting an Ascendance proc there, getting out some damage. Uh, also, I, I think it's, it's interesting to note, I just want to call this out, Lontar's not even playing Poison Cleansing Totem, so not even using that option, which is really, really strong. So that, that is curious, and maybe one thing they could use to actually make this matchup even better in their favor. Deep shots here on to Next. Great cleave damage here by Echo. All three members getting low. Swapsy overextending potentially, but Next is there in the tree form. Waz getting caught in a stun lock and getting blasted. I really like Channel's use of Observer. Uh, he uses it basically defensive. It's like his team's in trouble. He drops an Observer, 
um, just to make them distracted. Like it's either you, you know, go go for the kill on Waz, or you're gonna get blasted by the observer. You have to take it down, and it forces kind of a distraction for Swapsy, or he gets punished. So I really like that usage of observer, basically for pure defense. Uh, to keep his team alive and if they ignore it they get punished in a big way big setup here on the brune hitty he trades out the trinket to get a counter stun here onto waz and waz is just so on point at denying these drinks next is in a kidney shot just constantly being cleaved down i do not envy next in this position channel there as well with an offensive portal they are going all in here on the next to get the fear so obviously drops down the tremor totem to break next out of that crowd control and allow him to recover all right, let's see where they're going to move here next. They got the Dark Pact. They're getting some cooldowns from the Warlock. They're targeting Waz here. Static Field is down. Is it going to get a pull? They clone Waz off the Kidney. I really like that. Anytime next can chain a Cyclone off of a CC and try and maximize here. Maybe even go for a drink. It looks like he wants to. He's in cat form. He's stealthing across the map. Waz is trying to pinpoint where he might have gone, but he's moved into almost a completely random location. Oh, but he finds him. As soon as he sits down, he grapples over and prevents Nex from drinking. Lontar takes a huge hit of damage, though, down to about half health. Swapsy has been left open while Waz is stopping that drink, and those lava bursts are starting to lay down some pain as Chanimal is taking a big hit right now at 50%. Waz cheap shot Swapsy jumps over. Cheap shots next, setting up Chanimal there for an aggressive play. Can they drop him one second away from the bark skin? into a double mortal coil, but Waz can't connect his cheap shot at the moment. They're going to fear next low health. Lontar is trying to escape. Bit of a healer race at the moment. Here comes that observer during the kidney shot. Really love when Chanimal saves it during this time, but Swapsy's already sniped it. Big Lava Burst incoming. Lontar's wall just came off cooldown. He's going to line of sight Swapsy. Big Chaos Bolt's on to Swapsy. He has to burrow, and big cooldown's forced on that push, and this is this game is really just all about next. Can he get a drink successfully at some point in this game? Because if he doesn't, it is kind of an inevitability that they're going to lose on mana. Yeah, Lontar crossing the map right now, trying to just assist Waz a little bit, but Waz gets caught into a stun kidney shot on Lontar. This is a great setup here by Brunhitty. That's a, I, I love it. You go after Lontar, you catch him in a stun, you swap over to Waz, he gets stunned, get him low. Now he's in a full cyclone. Great defensive play here by the Furbogs as well as offensive. That's exactly what you want to do with that Restoration Druid. The offensive clones are great. To slow down some of the healing. A big nature swift is there by Lone Tar, topping off his team. Swapsy, though, in a little bit of trouble. In a cheap shot, do they have any damage to follow it up? Chanimal gets gouged, and, and Hitty denies the kill for now. Swapsy leaps behind the pillar, avoiding a lot of the same coming damage. Now it's actually Lone Tar under fire. Big Earth Shock here by Swapsy. Do they have the Lava Burst to take him down? Wanted to get really aggressive here, and Swap uh, Lone Tar is struggling to top himself off. 23% dampening, winning on mana once again. Uh, but if Nex can ever recover his mana, he's got Shadow Meld coming up in just a few short seconds. If he can get a Shadow Meld drink at some point in the game, that's going to keep the Furbogs uh, in the game for the late um, potential. All right, let's do it. Let's see if we can do it here. Waz in a stun lock. Brunhitty peeling him away, trying to punish him for chasing down next. But Waz is just still going after him, cleaving down the treants as well. Lone in a cheap shot. Brunhitty trying to dodge Waz's peels here as Waz vanished. Is in a cheap shot, though, ultimately on Brunhitty. Swapsy gets spell lock. But now the, the counter spells on cooldown. But can't, big chaos oh pull. My oh my goodness. god. Chanimal just closing it out with a quick headshot. 3 0 for Echo. Yeah, that was definitely a headshot moment. That was a huge chaos bolt there. Like, that's, that's, this is the nice time about the death log, right? We got the death log, shows the kill. Uh, I'm excited to see how exactly it plays out. But I feel like Chanimal was finding big chaos bolts this game. There's a few moments, uh, you know, where Swapsy barely held on. He was able to get underground with that new burrow ability. But this time, that's not going to be available. And Echo sneaks away with uh, a quick win? Quick, uh, I guess, relatively speaking. <laughs> uh, they were able to take him down, you know, Free next being completely out of mana, but yeah, that was definitely a lot of burst coming in. I mean, with the caliber of these teams, right? I feel like this is a series that could go the distance to game five and be like 10 minutes long each round because they're all playing at the highest level of skill cap. So uh, it's very surprising to see a game go down this quickly. But look at Channel just taking control of Swapsy with these spam fears, that static field totem. And then as soon as he gets any opportunity, sneaks in one Chaos Bolt. Now he's got his procs as well from spending Soul Shard. So his next Chaos Bolt's fast. He gets a Flame Rift, two Rifts with a Flame Rift, and he goes for a Speedy Bolt, just boom. Oh, and Lotar comes in with a Lava Burst too. Just fusing the lava and the chaos together at the last second there to close out the kill on Swapsy. And next is just in such a brutal position. He's just got Waz constantly chasing him down. He's trying to drink. He's trying to heal his team at the same time. Maybe look for clones. And it looks like it's just too much to, to handle all at the same time. And ultimately, Swapsy is going to get caught here. Um, trying to see if there was really any answers. He already burned his Shiri. He already burned his ground trying to stop all these fear spams earlier. So not much that he could do here. With next on the other pillar, he's trying to get back 
to him and just get healed. And I think he just really wasn't expecting to die as a combination of both the Lava Burst and the Chaos Bolt at the same time. So Lontar sets up Lava Burst, Chaos Bolt, and they're just synced up. Look at the cast bars. Boop. And then oh. boop. <laughs> Back to back. Bernini's just a frog, like, man, I wish I could do something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, yeah. Echo pulling off that 3 0 heading into that series. We thought maybe we would see them drop a game to Wandering Water Fur Blogs, but we are going to have to wait and see if they're able to pull it off. Here is that death recap as well. Then I don't know if there's anything like notable on here Eesh. you want to talk about. I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe that chaos will. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, look at the so that's from a. Okay, so from the <laughs> chaos tear, he gets a chaos bolt from the portal for one hundred thirty-two thousand. Uses an incinerate proc for one hundred fifty-eight thousand, and that's after he channeled the chaos bolt for two hundred and sixty thousand. Followed up by a shadow burn, uh, at the same time a lava burst hit. So that was an unbelievable amount of damage. You know, basically going. 60 0 in just one short second so that's that's the nice thing about the destruction warlock right like the destruction warlock brings a lot of consistent damage with just immolate can flag you know shadow burns your portals you have a lot of consistent damage but if everything lines up you also have the ability to just delete someone off the face of the earth and that's the threat when you have someone like channel playing destro at such a high level um Swapsy definitely got hit hard there yeah Definitely. All right. Channel on that Warlock. Definitely nobody to mess with. And that is a, I, I don't know, did we categorize it as a quick 3-0? Maybe not a quick 3-0, but smooth 3-0? It was a three. I feel like it was oh, a little bumpy. Yeah. You know, round one, round two. I feel like it was... Yeah, yeah it but, was by, but round three, it was like, all right, we know what you're going to do. I yeah, round three like. was pretty convincing, yeah. Yeah. Well, either way, it's a 3-0. Echo going to be very happy with that. We will see them play once again on Championship Sunday. They're going to be sitting there nice and comfy in the semifinals. We've got quite a few more matches to get through. Before we find out who they're going to be up against, we've got another upper bracket round. It's Chibaku Tensei versus Lava Lava Sid. All right. These are kind of like kind of new teams like chibaku is it's mercy it's recognizable names but they're combining with other rosters with fused and crodo and limps which were typically like the the melee cleave lobby i almost want to call them like the liquid you know like the c team with the demon hunters and the death knight melee cleave composition so bringing in mercy as a as a multi-classer you know and a warlock could be really interesting to see how they perform in this round uh, and then lava lava is probably focusing their team around goose on that elemental shaman um, and they could come up with a variety of different uh, compositions for a matchup like this this might i would i would likely think that there actually might not be a single rogue in this series uh, judging by what they've got Ooh. as their rosters it looks like neither team um, is at least focusing on rogue it might there might be maybe they have it as an alt but it doesn't look like it's listed as their main spec the demon, all right demon well kings hopefully are chat also, will be go ahead i was gonna say demon kings are also very popular in europe it's like for the casters, I feel like there's, there's a lot of good casters right now, right? Like Destro Warlock strong, Moonkin strong, Shadow Priest is strong, Arcane Mage is strong, people playing Devastation Evoker. Like the best caster, it, it seems kind of up in the air. The best melee, I feel like I feel confident saying Outlaw is the best melee. Um, but there's a lot of Demon Hunters as well. A lot of these teams are playing Demon Hunters, and I think we might see kind of a Demon Hunter showdown for this one. Ooh, I hope so. All right, well, we're gonna head to a break. Chibaku Tensei versus Lava Lava up next.
Hey everybody and welcome back. We are in yet another upper bracket round. It is Chibaku Tensei versus Lava Lava Zika. What's your take on these two teams? Who do you think comes out of this one? Um, let's see here. So this is uh, Shibaku Tensei is uh, Mercy's new team. We got Kroto, the DK, um, back on the roster, and he's uh, joined with Fuston. I would say experience. I would say probably in favor of Shibaku Tensei, just because Fuston has a lot of tournament experience. Mercy has a lot of tournament experience. Kroto has uh, also quite a lot of uh, tournament experience. Um, and then on the other side, we got Lava Lava. Uh, and they're kind of relatively unknown to me. The only player that I know like sticks out a lot in this team is Guz. Um, he's uh, been a high tier LA Shaman on the European ladder for a really long time. Seen him here and there in some tournaments. Um, but I, I would say experience definitely in Shibaku Tensei's favor. And uh, we'll see uh, if Lava Lava can uh, battle it back here. Ooh. <laughs> Zug, Ooh, zug. Oh, uh, oh my gosh. Oh, we see a bit of cleave here, Sydney. Oh, this is going to be. I feel like this could be insanely fast <laughs> with two demon hunters coming into this mix with multiple melee DPS. And this warrior is going to love tearing into a death knight. Look at that blade storm already cleaving Crodo down as well as Limps. They're trying to counter engage, but they're falling behind. Houston is really struggling. Not even 20 seconds into the game. Finally, getting Crodo back into the fight. They strangulate Dex. He's going to go for a bash while he silenced Min Max those globals while he's crowd controlled and try and get away with that tree of life form at the moment. You don't want to stack up at all in this blender ball of melee at the moment. And just massive damage back and forth. Now the warrior on the back foot. Dex gets gripped into a stun. Carls is trying to escape, leaping over with that heroic leap, sniping off a totem, and then trying to get back into the fight. Dex is getting tunneled down a bit here. Death Knight team's notorious for just going after healers with these grip swaps, but warriors also just tear up Death Knights with Crota who's constantly at half health. Houston in just one second left of the stun. He gets imprisoned low on the darkness. Really nice imprison from Coffee here and denying Houston from immediately recovering his teammate. He gets a full double fear insane setup on the Crodo. he's in so much trouble he's trying to stay close for a spirit link totem possibly Fuston's trying to be greedy is he going to get away with it ascendance healing surges come in Crodo gets top Dex retreats they're still going after him they get a stun but it looks like they're going to swap back off of that stun for now onto the warrior but it's just constantly Crodo at half health throughout this game yeah Crodo's still struggling right now does have the anti-magic shell though so it should be kind of okay for now but uh, DKC, you know, they have a lot of uh, self-sustained healing, they have a lot of cooldowns to trade, but in dampening, DK is a very juicy target, and I feel like uh, in this matchup, uh, I really feel like uh, Crodo is going to struggle here, he grips Dex in, into the Asphyxia, but look at Crodo already taking so much damage here, Coffee is just all over him right now, and uh, you can see Crodo here trying to duck away to the pillar, but uh, still wants to try to maintain some offensive pressure. Mana right now in favor of the rest of the Limp's taking a lot of damage there. Netherwalk is going to be forced out there as well. So good pressure on the DK and on the DH. And so much damage coming out here from the Blade Storm. The Avatar is active as well. And uh, they're even swapping to the rest of Druid now. Dex here taking some Ooh. damage. He's in damage strength for the trinket. Dex gets one tapped. Oh man, they come back strong here. I don't think they're going to get a counter kill with Fuston dropping down that Spearling Totem. He's just going to play it absolutely safe. They managed to snipe out a game one victory. That Warrior not going to pay them any uh, you know, favors onto that Death Knight. And just really good swaps onto the Druid. That Strangulate Go is the scariest time in the game as the healer. If you, you want to get away with not using your Trinket on the first one um, and then use your Trinket on the second one. And I think Dex had a Trinket, so it's actually maybe a bit surprising. When did he actually use his Trinket? Was it during that chain? and? Okay, so just an instant string on the trinket. It becomes so difficult to be able to recover just specifically during that setup. And look how closely we're just killing Limps like a second before that. Limps barely survives and then gets back in the fight. And they're like, what should we do? We're at 10% health. Let's kill the Druid. <laughs> that's like that's what they do. They go on the Druid like, who cares? Send everything. They pop every single cooldown. And he trinkets the restun and gets strangulated immediately. And there's no darkness. They used it earlier. He tries to get in bear form and get the frenzy going. He tries to shadow meld to get an extra global, but it's really not enough. You just get vaporized during that little second window of time during the strangulate go. Can you not trank uh, if you're silenced? You can't trank if you're silenced. Okay. You have to you have to trink a trank and uh, and hit it hopefully before you get recc. Typically you wait, but I feel like you didn't want to wait because it was lasso, so it was like a stun and damage on top of it. 
Um, and yeah, that, that situation becomes really difficult to deal with unless you pre-bear the stun. Well, I think he under-responded, right? Because he didn't pre-bear the stun. It was the hunt. It was the slappy hands from the DK. And the Shaman was per uh, spamming Perch. Uh, he tried to just global? like read it and sit through the first stun with Bark Skin. But I feel like uh, that was... Like if you trink it there, it's going to uh, line up as well with the, with the slappy hands. So I feel like it was... Uh, Trink at the first stun, and he probably lives that without having to trink. He like trink it and bear forms. Oh my god, they're going to a small uh, map. <laughs> this series is going to be over. I mean, maybe it's back <laughs> and forth, and that makes it long, but this series is definitely going to be the fastest one, I think, for the day. They got a three second kill, although it's not really fair. It's from a different percent health. We got to like measure the overall fastest kill from like 100% or something um, to get an accurate <laughs> measurement of that. But Chibaku's not going to change anything here. Um, although it was, you know, close. I feel like Crota was really low most of that game. <laughs> yeah, I feel like this was not, like, a good game for Shibaku. I feel like Lava Lava got... I mean, they just made one mistake, right? Uh, like, uh, at the end. But up until that point, Lava Lava were just, like, they were just chilling, dude. They were... Uh, they almost killed Limps. They almost killed Crota. I mean, they had just great uh, pressure um, all around. Um, and then... Dex, uh, I would say, kind of messed up a little bit with his uh, trade, and um, yeah, now they're down 0-1-1, but maybe this is Shibaku's, like, kind of blind pick uh, composition, or maybe they just don't want to bring in Mercy, because, uh, you know, they can play the same thing. They can have Mercy uh, tagging in on the Warrior as well, um, so they're opting for, for this DK over the Warrior, actually, um, and another thing that's interesting right? about this team, sorry? It's probably just experience, I think, right? Just they've played... I feel like Houston and these guys have played DK, Demon Hunter, Shaman. Like, that's probably their most played comp on their roster. So I'm thinking it's comfort over everything else. Yeah, that's that's definitely a part of it. Um, but what's interesting is that Houston is actually a Demon Hunter main. He's, like, one of the best Demon Hunters in the whole game. And he's uh, playing Resto Shaman. Like, I, this, I'm sorry, but this roster just doesn't make sense to me here. <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, I'm serious. Like, so you yeah, got upper Mercy. bracket, man. That's impressive. There's some I big names that aren't even in the top eight, and these guys are upper bracket, so I don't know. I'm just saying, you got Mercy, okay? You got Warrior, you got Warlock, top tier. You got Crodo, you got DK, top tier. Then you got Fuston. You got DH and Windwalker. Think about that. You could play DK Warrior. You could play Windwalker DK. You could play loads and loads and loads of different things. But instead of using Fuston on DPS, you just have him heal and invite another Demon Hunter. Uh, so it, it, I don't know. I feel like uh, on paper, very, very uh, individually skilled players uh, on Shibaku Tensei. But uh, I feel like this, this is a team that... They probably couldn't find like a, a top top notch healer, and then they, they just decided that we're gonna have Houston uh, become our healer, and he is doing a good job with it. Uh, but I don't know compared to his Demon Hunter, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But anyway, Ooh. game number two is live already. The Blender is active here in the middle of the map. Clean setup from Lava Lava, forcing Icebound Fortitude from Court Crodo, and now he's just gonna get aggressive with it, try and stay on top of the Druid. Static Field pulls the Druid back in again, trying to stack him up. Triple Cap Totem from Fuston. I really like the Totem positioning there. He got max value on the Earthen Wall. They strangulate, but he easily survives that one, I think, with an Intervene and a Frenzied Regen. As long as the Warrior's nearby, just buys even a Global during that, he's gonna be fine, but they actually swap back to the Warrior, forces Die by the Sword right off the rip, and swapping between the Druid and the Warrior is gonna be the main strategy for Chibaku. Crodo's in trouble, though, having used that Icebound Fortitude earlier, you can't rely on very much to survive against this physical based damage. They swap to Limps in a Stormbolt, blasting him down. Is he ready for it? He has to Netherwalk, and I think that was the right move. I think he could potentially have died through Blur, so using Netherwalk first rather than using Bow, but Crow gets caught behind the pillar in a stun, and they try and reposition. They catch Dex in another stun, trying to train down the Resto Druid and cleave him as much as possible, but Crodo is just taking so much damage. Fusion pops Ancestral Guidance. He needs to get some big casted heals. He gets the Nature Swiftness, gets the Earthen Wall Totem down. Crodo's going to have to camp in that Earthen Wall. They're trying to go on the Warrior. Warrior's trying to pull him away from it, looks like. Static Field pulls the Warrior. They could swap to Dex. Fuston's getting aggressive, in position for a Purge, possibly. Goes for a Lasso on the Demon Hunter instead. They're making a swap there. Just trying to hit the target that doesn't have Life Bloom uh, and force Dex to use as much mana as possible. He pre-send wards himself here. I don't think attacking Dex here is going to be good. I think should swap back to the warrior 
Yeah, uh, call. Actually, it looks Ooh, like they're going to charge on the grip. Nice charge right there. And uh, they're going to hunt him regardless. Here, there's the stun. Here comes the damage. The hunt gets casted, but Dex is in bear form with bark skin here. Uh, reads this beautifully, and he had a sand ward, so Dex is going to be completely fine. But now limps, though. No nether walk, no darkness. If they switch to him, it could be uh, trouble here. Coffee. Uh, Boom. Oh my god. Oh. Almost just gets slurped right there. Drops to 1%, but he manages to get the nether walk in the nick of time. Oh man, he just got left behind for a second. Like Dex is really struggling. The entire team is dead. He's got Tree of Life. He needs some big regrowth. He gets his DPS top. He's gonna look to slowly top himself in the back line, but they could swap to him. I think they want to. He wild charges to an ally once again, trying to escape from the grasps of the Death Knight. Static fields down. Coffee and a lasso. Dex has to come back, and Chibaku is just constantly swapping targets and making this a nightmare for Dex. He's already down below half mana. Gets gripped in again into a double stun. I don't think they have Strangulate. He trinkets into an imprison. They could swap to the warrior. There's no die by the sword. They drop down Dark. Darkness. Is he going to get knocked out of the darkness? Doesn't look like they have a knock. Crotos now in trouble. Fused in and a stun. Is Crotos going to go down? Are we tying this up? I beam from Coffee just glaring him down. They've got Spirit Link. How are they not going to use Link here? How is he so greedy? He drives. He's still not linking. How is he still not linking? Finally, the Link comes down from Fused in, but the entire team is getting cleaved there with sweeping strikes. They're trying to go after the Warrior, uh, but they're just not finding the pressure. Limps is in a bash. No trinket and gets chopped. And Lava Lava come back hard, but uh, Stranglade ends. Dex gets Iron Bark. He's in tree. Team is going to recover here, and Lava Lava come back strong in game two. Yeah, really, really strong comeback there. But honestly, this felt more like game number one here. Lava Lava. Uh, the only, I don't know, the only big difference that I saw here was that Dex was like a bit more aware. Okay, they want to swap to me. They want to uh, try to hundred O me. So. You know, putting some sand wards on himself, trying to pre-bear more, just trying to uh, play max range more and kind of, you know, play around the grips a little bit more. But aside from that, it just looked more more, more like the same here. You had insane pressure um, on uh, basically everybody here. You know, limps dropped very low several times. They got Crotal low multiple times. Um, and this was that scary moment before the link, so the hunt gets casted here. Crotal dropping extremely low they get the blinding sleet and that's why he's trying to uh, hold on for that heal and crotal again almost going down there but then eventually fuston just says you know what i'm just gonna drop the spirit link totem here because i'm not gonna get lucky like that again they connect with the uh storm bolt here onto limps into the bash and they get the strangle it there onto dex as well uh to wrap it up and uh lava lava i'm gonna tie it up now one to one a piece now my biggest question is of course what are we going to see here on the blind? Because this is not a winning matchup. This is just not a winning matchup for Shibaku Tensei. They need a swap. And I'm wondering, like, okay, maybe there's something else that Lava Lava wants to run, and they're blind locking this? Because in the straight-up melee, like, cleave mirror, like, there's no way they're, they're supposed to win. Uh. In the best of there's no way the DK the edge is supposed to win here. Do you want to be a DK or a Warlock? against Warrior Demon Hunter, I think, is the, is the question. I mean, a big map on a Warlock might be better, um, but that's really what they're flexing between, I feel like, right? I mean, they could mirror with a Shaman. Uh, maybe it's okay. Mm, I feel like yeah, the Warrior's going to get abused by the Druid, though. I, I don't... I, this is again this is like a matchup you don't commonly see like these guys are playing comps that are like typically decent ladder comps but not comps i was expecting to go head to head in like the upper bracket of a tournament so um they're taking their time to lock in their blind so they're probably considering their options i'm thinking they probably try a big map and maybe a warlock yeah we'll nope, see. small map they're not uh, doing I'm warlock there's no chance there's no We're chance to do warlock on dalaran <laughs> I think I think maybe they'll 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 tag in a warrior of their own because, I mean, I don't know, man. The is shaman good, versus though? the rest of the druid. I feel like it's in the druid's favor, but at the same time, what other options do they have on uh, Shibaku Tensei? Uh, lava, lava, gonna blind lock the exact same thing. Now, uh, Mercy does play mage as well. Arcane mage actually. He plays arcane mage, which is pretty good into this. Uh, but arcane I don't know. Arcane Demon Hunter, the Arcane I, DK, like <laughs> what are they gonna? I don't think those yeah. sound very good. Well, Maybe Arcane I, Demon Hunter sure. could be good. I feel like they're just gonna play Demon Hunter DK. It's just what they've practiced and that's their comfort pick. They probably came into this tournament not expecting to do well because they just formed their team, like you said, with Fuston playing the healer and picking up another Demon Hunter. Like this is what we got. Let's try and make a run, and they're trying to just make it work. It, at least that's what I'm thinking. If they lock in the same thing again. I feel like if they lock in the same thing again, then yeah, that's what we're going to see the entire series. But I feel like they shouldn't lock in the same thing again. Unless, like, you know, unless there is, like, some other reason 
why they lock it in that we don't know about. Like there's a counter pick or one of their member mercies in here. He's AFK. Like you know, like if, if there's something like that. Um, but I, I feel like matchup versus matchup, it's not ideal. And we are going to see the same thing. So Chibaku Tensei uh, taking their time, you know, just discussing the strategies, maybe uh, going through. Uh, the in-game adaptations, you know, because there's the macro adaptations, you know, you change your comps, you change your specs, uh, but then there's also the in-game adaptations, you know, you change your uh, um, your gear, your stats that you're going for, uh, your spec a little bit, go for different talents here and there, uh, stuff like that, so uh, I'm going to try to make some more mid-game adaptations, maybe go on a different target, uh, I don't know, I don't know. But uh, I feel <sighs> like this is Lava Lava's series to lose now, because if they win this, then they're gonna have all the options too, and I feel like it's a good map for it too. I think Chibaka's win condition is just hoping Dex chokes. Uh, it's just grip, stun, strang, hope he messes something up in that chain, and you get a big apocalypse crit, um, and that's their main game plan. That, that's kind of the game plan for Demon Hunter Death Knight is just try and grip the healer in, cheese them down with that combo, um, and then how they play in between that. Um, it, it could also be important. Uh, they had decent pressure at the beginning. Um, and they had damage on the warrior and it, it felt like the pressure on the warrior fell off towards the middle and then they only had damage on decks So keeping their pressure going on two targets. I think it's gonna be important here Down right here small map. They just want to run the druid down lava lava their focus is gonna be the death knight He's gonna have to just kite with chains of ice try and get some distance and get ready for those grip setups But dex was playing really well with that wild charge I think he's got a macro to be able to wild charge to his tree in so he puts a tree down And then when he gets gripped he just jumps immediately back to where the tree was and if he gets that off in a couple of grips It just sets Crota really far behind and immediately the warriors just blade storming with sharpened blade avatar It's gonna be so much damage just cutting down both targets with sweeping strikes That's icebound fortitude healing tide right off the rip they grip index they get the stun where's the string There's the essence break big pressure. They need the strangulate. There's the strangulate can they take him down? He trinkets it and bark skins. So he is now a viable target on the next chain without that trinket. It's going to be very critical that Limps, or sorry, that uh, Coffee can save his darkness and use it. But he actually used his trinket as well. So if he gets caught in a stun, trinket darkness will not be an escape for that. Crota should just focus on surviving right now to that next big assault. Yeah, but I wonder uh, if they're going to be able to take him down through Barkskin. I feel like for Dex, it's going to be very important to get an early Barkskin, but also to pre-bear the goal. But right now, Crotos in a stun. They're going after Croto. Where are they going to go after here? Dex gets stunned as well. Doesn't have Barkskin for another 20 seconds here. So good pressure coming out here from Shibaku Tensei. Uh, but Croto is going to be the one right now uh, falling behind in this exchange. A lot of damage coming out to Croto, dropping to th about 30% HP, but manages to heal himself up. Death Coils, Death Strikes. Uh, just spamming out the heals that he can right now. Nice uh, lightning last here onto Coffee, trying to uh, tr uh, you know keep them guessing here a little bit with these swaps. Houston sitting through a stun as well, but uh, now should be out of crowd control and allowed to keep his team uh, nice and full. And 20 seconds on Dex Trinket. They need they have 20 seconds right now to try to close out the match. You can see here uh, Limps is trying to pre prepare for it here, but Dex has all the tree ants out, and Crota is taking a lot of damage. I don't think they're going to be able to, to connect here. 10 seconds left here on Dex's Trinket. 8 seconds, and Coffee is sitting through a stun. I don't even think the stun is going to be long enough uh, before you can trigger the blind, end of they're it. going so. for it. I don't think X is going to be in any double trouble line, here double whatsoever. Cap. Double stun into Strang. You could trinket the Strang if he really wants to, but Frenzied Regen, Bark Skin, Heart of the Wild, Dex is more than fine. He had really good positioning there. He knew their win condition, and now Crotos in trouble. Link comes down, but does it hit? He's not in the Link. They killed the Link before he could get in an instant snap into a fear, and Crotto is likely to go down. He icebound Fortitudes, but I don't think it's enough. He's so low at the moment. In execute range, somehow, someway, Fuston actually powers up, keeps his team alive on that push, and manages to keep them in the match. Dex is trying to reposition away from Crotto. He's chasing him down with that Abomination limb, but the pressure from the Demon Under Death Knight is falling off a cliff. There's just no damage semblance on anybody across the team. Healing Tide totems down for Fused and Static Field trying to prevent Dex from retreating. Lasso the Demon Hunter trying to add some cross stuns, add some offensive pressure into the mix, but that was Darkness coming down uh, for Coffee, so that's soaking a lot of damage. Dex is now looking for clones. If he starts getting clones, it's going to be game over. They're trying to pressure him, trying to deny them. And he actually has decent pressure on Dex. He's just soloing Dex. 
Rex at the moment. Is Limp's going to be able to kill him by himself? He's kind of disrespecting it. Nature Swiftness comes through. Bash behind the pillar into a Cyclone if he gets that so bad. It looks like it didn't land, though, so nicely done. Now in prison on Fused and Crotto in trouble. Drops Andy Magic Zone. Warrior does not care about that at all. Bladestorm cutting him down through it. Charges over. Gets a Shockwave onto the Shaman for just an extra second of crowd control. And Fuston's mana is almost completely tapped at this point. And Crotto has basically no defensive, so he's just kiting with Chains of Ice. He's just keeping the Warrior snared, trying to keep distance, and they're like, whatever, we're just going to kill your Demon Hunter instead. He has to drink another walk immediately upon connection. And now Fuston is just running around in Ghost Wolf trying to find an opportunity. Double fear. And they could swap to Limps if they want to, if they have a stun here. He's got no trinket, but Crota's just going to die, I think. And Limps going the wrong way there for a second. Crota is likely to go down. There's just nothing left. How is Fuston doing it? How is he doing it? Static Field comes down. Another Riptide? Is he actually going to oh, do he it? He gets kicked on his heel. Crota's at 10%. Is he actually going to do this, man? Like, the entire enemy team is 100% health. You're zero mana at 10%. Limps is getting shot. Darkness! <gasps> is this his? Is this the miracle? It's a grip triple blind. If they manage to pull it off, this is the biggest... No, Dex says no way. Just Iron Bark Tranks. He's not, he's not messing around at all. He's like, I'm making sure this game is over. And Crota is likely to go down, although he is defying death. Time and time again. How is he still alive, man? Is this inner EU C2 right now from Houston? <laughs> but it is not enough. Crota will fall, and now Lava Lava moved to match point. Yeah, beautiful stuff there uh, from uh, Houston. You know, what even is Houston's name? Like, he started out as a demon hunter, but he's like highest rated Windwalker, highest rated demon hunter. Apparently, he can work miracles on that shaman. Uh, but it is going to be Lava Lava eventually who are able to close it out and it's just uh, it's just a couple of things right you got the druid versus shaman matchup then you also in addition to that have a warrior who is uh, topping the damage so your team is doing more damage if you're lava lava and you have mortal strike effect and you uh, also have that sharpen blade uh, so it's just it's just so much uh, you know healing reduction that eventually if Houston he just can't keep up his mana He's going to fall behind, and uh, this was a nice grip. Uh, but this time around, look at Dex. He just sends the Tranquility in this uh, situation. He knows he's the target. Uh, just Tranq, keep everybody else alive, and uh, get that immunity. Uh, and then at this point, it's just uh, just wrap it up, you know? Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, really, really good stuff. Is that warrior's name Karius? Is that I don't like, know how to pronounce it. Like Are we calling Keith? It's... It's bacteria on your teeth. Is that yeah, Swedish? It? Yeah, maybe it's Swedish. I don't know. <laughs> I, <laughs> That's what I think about. Bacteria on my teeth, <laughs> carry. <laughs> call him carry? I don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to ask him uh, here. Because, I mean, he's looking like he's going to move into Championship Sunday. It's looking like this is going to be the opponents um, for Echo. And, and the next challenger, yep. unless Shibaku does something big here, because this game looked way more one-sided. It seems like when Dex is on his A game and he's not going to get caught off guard, that the comp is looking really tanky and there's no openings for them. So uh, I, I think they have to try something different, whether or not it's bringing in a Warlock, maybe like a Demo DK and play on a big map, um, something like that. Yeah, I mean, at this point, you're down bad in the series. What do you want to do? You've won a game, but you can, like, I, I will say that's kind of a fluke win. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you kind of got a little lucky. You kind of managed to get, to get that one dub at the back of uh, your opponent's mistake. It's not like a reliable thing. Um, they actually did do the same thing here, right? Like, they gripped uh, Dex in early. They got his trinket. They got his bark skin. They got, like, all of his cooldowns. But then they never reconnected before he had trinket back up again. So I just feel like Shibaku Tensei, they lose on mana. They lose on pressure. And their setups, they're not happening frequently enough for them to actually land a kill with this um, strategy. So I think at this point, we got to see something change. A target, gear, uh, you know, bring in uh, Mercy and go Warrior, um, the edge yourself. Like, just something. We, we got to see some kind of change here. I mean, Runes of Lord, I don't think they're changing. <laughs> I, re I really don't think they're going to change anything. It's got to be the same thing again, I would think. Um, unless, again, maybe they Warrior Demon Hunter with a Shaman. But I feel like the, the Shaman is just disadvantaged in a Cleave matchup. I feel like if you're a Druid and you're a Shaman, you get Solo Shuffle with four melee DPS, you're pretty sad face to be the Shaman <laughs> in that situation. <laughs> so, like, if Houston can play something else, 
other than shaman it would probably be better um, but also the death knight it's like a, it's a double whammy like death knight and shaman into a warrior and a druid just i don't think that's going to be a great matchup for them so uh, he is bringing in a dragon a preservation okay. evoker instead of a shaman i've not seen him play this before i don't know if you've seen him play it before but it's got to be better than shaman uh, I have seen him play Evoker before, yes, uh, but I, I would say as a healer, definitely more experience on uh, the Shaman for Fuston, but uh, Fuston, to be honest with you, he can play anything. Fuston is just one of those guys, uh, he's like Drake in NA, you know, he just, like, whatever his team needs, he'll play it. If his team needs him as a healer, he'll play it. If he wants to be a DPS, he'll play it. Um, the only thing I don't think I've seen him play is Mage, obviously, because Mage is, you know, requires... Uh, certain amount of uh, intellect to be able to play a mage um but yeah i, I like yeah. it at least they're changing <laughs> something up they're gonna have more crowd control they're gonna be able to i like that because the fire breath yeah just purge Sorry? all of the hots and triple kill them i feel like it's way better i feel like dragons it could actually be an insanely big difference for them offensively defensively they could just fall apart really fast though i i feel like it's gonna be a lot of throughput you need to heal through this on a death knight um as the evoker in this matchup but offensively it gives them more stuns gives them purge like an aoe purge which is gonna be way better than the you know the cooldown greater purge um against the rest of the druid just strip the whole team of all their hots cleave them down blast them out and it's definitely playing more into the strengths of what their comp is you know and what they've likely practiced mm -hmm. in terms of comfort so as long as fuston is warmed up and ready to go uh i i think this is a lot better for them yeah well i, I think it's 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 a, it's a faster win condition right like you're gonna probably uh, be able to accelerate the game and end it faster but you're also if you don't end it faster gonna get ended faster uh yeah and here we have him the man who is uh responsible right now for uh Krotos, uh dentist bill Mr. Carrius here on the warrior gnome arms warrior here, Sid. Um, yep, and we haven't, not want to be I think we haven't seen too many warriors uh, in general. Yeah, I mean, it, it, particularly because of mages, I think it's really it's mages um, and maybe even windwalkers and rogues. Uh, so this is a one matchup he's getting where there aren't any of those. He's actually just getting the matchup where he's actually favored, which is a death knight. So he's probably pretty happy <laughs> uh, about getting this bracket. But if he wins this, he's going to face the best, you know, Raikou on mage. He's going to fight Waz on rogue like it's going to get really hard tomorrow. Um, so today you're just trying to lock it in, get a really high finish so that you get a lot of points and then try and have a good run in the second cup. Um, it, like you, you could have a really good showing as a result of that. I mean, these guys just came off the ladder. They're running this Demon Hunter Warrior. This is not a common comp. Uh, even on ladder, I don't feel like this is a typically standard comp. Um, so they're, they're playing with some differences here. Runes of Lord are on. It's match point. It's the first tournament of 2024. It would be a fitting final resting place as it is a cemetery. Is Lava Lava going to be sealing their fate, sending them down to the sharks in the lower bracket? Or is Fuston on this dragon going to be the X Factor? Uh, as Fuston is rolling in with the hover, Verdant Embrace. Oh, that wild charge! Dex instantly jumping to his treant, but he gets gripped in a second time, and they're just going straight after the tree, cutting down Teldrassil round two, and Limps gets swapped onto. Oh my god, Imprisoned oh, low health! He goes for the Fire Breath anyways, but that Imprisoned is getting big value. Fuston times a heal, gets the Verdant Embrace. They're trying to train down Dex. Can they take him down in time? Limps is taking so much pressure at the moment. Triple Dragon Breath there from Fuston. As he crosses the entire team, he still has his shroud to immune CC, and Dex is just dying. He's just getting chopped at the moment. It is so much added pressure here in this matchup. Coffee going to get swapped off on the Trank. And now here's the question. Can they survive in between their cooldowns? Because the damage for the Death Knight and the Demon Hunter is usually going to slow down during this period of time. Yeah, and we're going to have to see it here. Fuston lining up here for the heal. Spirit Bloom connects here onto Crodo, And uh, they do have a lot of damage available here. Crodo still catching some heals there. Living Flame. And he's going to go ahead and rescue Crodo there. And make sure to bring him further away from the fight. So Crodo can keep that distance. And uh, just keep him away from that Mortal Strike effect. They grip Dex in. And look at that wild charge once again there to the tree. And pre-bears the stun as well. I know Super Teaser's inner Restored is very excited uh, to see Dex playing this well right now. And he does get the intervene there as well. So... Dex gonna be completely fine. There's a blinding sleet coming out, and uh, Dex just gonna cap out in Barefoot. But look at Fuston here. The disintegrates coming in. There's the strangle life. They're going for the kill right now, but Dex still has the tranquility. He still has the bark skin and the iron bark. He needs to trade something. He trades the bark. A little late right there. Manages to get the incarnation tree of life here, and with that big cooldown Crodo. plus the bark skin, there's no way Dex is gonna die. It's gonna be Krotos now on the back foot. Yeah, we see time dilation out for Fuston, but his mana is looking rough right now. 
Uh, they need to get a big combo of damage, maybe swap to the warrior here. They've got him low, no die by the sword for about six seconds as he spends more rage. Coffee has blur, he has options. Crodo is in so much trouble. It's match point. They drop down darkness. They're desperate. Fusion gets pummeled. He's getting cleaved. He rescues Limps into the darkness to get that shield. And now they're gripping in Dex. They have to kill him pretty soon, but he's got Trinket and Iron Bark. He procs his tree right before their assault. And now Limps is feared. Crodo's in trouble. It's match point. I beam connects from Coffee. Massive damage incoming. He drops the anti magic zone. And Fusion gets some big heals to try and stabilize him. They're trying to go after Dex again, but that tree of life is bolstering his healing so much. He's just looking impervious. And Limps is trying to go for a solo kill with that I beam meta. Dex gets gripped in by Crodo. Can they chop down Dex? Fire Breath hits the whole team, but Crodo's in trouble. He's got Icebound. He's gonna use Emerald Communion. He gets imprisoned on it, and Crodo could just die! Icebound way too late! He's on 5% on match point, likely going down to the lower bracket. Can they pull off a miracle once again? Crodo retreating away as Karajis charges in once again. He's trying to use Chains of Ice. He's trying to get distance away from the melee attackers, and Fuston just can't get him top. Finally, a Spirit Bloom, but they might just kill him through it anyways as Fuston gets feared. Limps is limping, and Crodo's just continuing to try and march away with Wraithwalk, anything that he can to try and get some distance, but Bladestorm comes through, and that Bladestorm is going to boost Karaji's damage to almost an unhealable level after this. He's going to pop Dive of the Sword. He's going all in on Crodo right now. He knows he has them against the ropes with both players at half health. Fuston basically with zero mana. Dex pops the Innervate. He's got max distance. He's just staying away from Crodo, camping that bear form. They go for Strangulate, but Strangulate's not going to get any value here. They sleep the Demon Hunter at least. They've crossed some CC, but Dex still has Bark Skin. They're not even forcing Bark Skin here from Dex. It's looking really bad for them if they can't get it, but maybe D Dex, he disrespects, he trades maybe a bit late, because he's got Barkskin now activated, Crodo has to make a big decision does he go over the tomb and chase down the druid, or does he stay in line of the evoker that has zero mana to heal him it's a really tough decision here you're on match point, Fuston just sends the stun, they're going in on the warrior it's basically do or die for them, they have zero mana, nothing left, they sleep the druid they're trying to pull off a miracle, can they take down the warrior, can they actually do it, he goes into battle stance at 30% health, he might just die, he's He's trying to duck around the corner on the tombstone. He gets topped off by Dex. Now another blade storm. There should be no way they survive. Everybody's getting AoE. If Houston pulls this off, he's a literal god. Crotos at half health. He's got Nether Walk. Yep. He's got Nether Walk. Limps is trying to hold it. He gets the Nether Walk. How is Fuston doing this? Crodo once again, sub 50% health, marching at a Druid, just desperately trying to get anything going for his team at this point. They're fighting valiantly, but it may be for nothing as Chains of Ice comes out in desperation. Death Strike after Death Strike to just stay alive, but it is not enough. And Lava Lava will send them down to the lower bracket. <laughs> I, got, I got confused with the DH. I was like, wait, cross kill! <laughs> Uh, no, that's, that's, that's unfortunate. That's very unfortunate. Um, but Lava Lava, man, they played a clean game. I, I really liked the preservation of Ochre um, from Houston here. I really, really, really like that. Um, I wish we saw it earlier, honestly. It's one of those series where I feel like if we saw this from the start, it could have been a completely different series because there was a lot of close calls, especially uh, here towards the end on the Warrior. We got the big fire breath here, and look at that. Uh, he's taking so much damage. He's lining his healer, and Fuston did a really nice sleepwalk there on the Druid, and then he used that uh, evoker, like uh, the Draktir racial, actually, like that little swoop, like the knock thing they have, um, to knock the Druid out of line for just an extra second. But uh, the Warrior dropped low, but they weren't able to close it out. Uh, and then you got Limp here. He's got the Nether Walk. He's going to stay alive, but when he's in Nether Walk, he's not really going to be able to get too much done. And sadly, it's going to be Crodo instead who gets swapped to uh, and gets taken down here at the end. So uh, I kind of like this comp uh, that, that Shibaku Tensei uh, brought in here at the end with the, with the Dragon. But unfortunately for them, they will be uh, going down to the lower bracket. And Lava Lava going to be uh, advancing to the top four. And for a team that we haven't seen before, I mean, this is amazing. A top four, there's only two cups, guys. It's this weekend, and then there's the next cup, and that is it. After that, top three is finished, and you have to play through the gauntlet. Uh, and you can see it right here. So, uh, yeah, look, take a look at that. This weekend, cup one. Next weekend, cup two. After that, it's gauntlet and then mid-season clash. Uh, so we are really trucking along here. Uh, every single one of these games matters. Yeah. Early on, they want to make sure that they are performing their absolute best. So well done to Lava Lava. Zeke already said it, you know, a new team sort of splashing into the season here for AWC on the European side. So I'm excited to see them perform for Championship Sunday in the European region. We're heading down into the lower bracket now. Going to have some elimination <laughs> rounds. It's Wandering Water Furbolg versus Hulabang up next, Super Seas. 
look at that graph. Oh my god, he's literally below forty percent health for just <laughs> like his sixty percent was the last highest health measured in the final ones. He's just permanently dead. That, that was such a, a hard match for him there. <laughs> really oh my dead. god. <laughs> So, I mean, you got to go in the lower bracket now. It's really stressful down here, man. Swapsy's down here. Like, you don't want to be down here. Nobody wants to be down here. Like, this is this is not a good place to be. You are not safe in this bracket whatsoever. No, certainly not. We can take a look at it here. That match that I already mentioned, Wandering Water Furbox versus Hulabang and then Chibaku Tensei versus Just for Fun. We'll see both of those. Those are the last two games that we have today for EU. Uh, so we're having two more teams go home, Zico. And you've already said, you know, pressure is mounting. Only two more cups left. So we are going to head to a quick break and we're going to head into those elimination rounds in just a bit. terrible.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We are down here in the lower bracket, and we are heading into Wondering Water Furbolgs versus Hulabang event. This is the team that just got dropped from Echo as well. We thought they were going to maybe be able to take a couple games off of them. Unfortunately not, and now they're down here up against Hulabang. They may have gone down 0-3, but the games are pretty close, so uh, hopefully they're not feeling too bad about it. They're going up against a very explosive team. So Hulabang is running a composition we don't normally see the Windwalker Monk with the Rogue, and I think that makes them a big threat. When you're one of these teams that is running a wild card composition, maybe the Furbogs don't have a lot of practice into it, um, and they don't know exactly what to expect, but Hulabang has already taken down some really good teams, so cannot count them out yet, and I'm curious to see if they could take down the Furbogs. I mean, maybe they could go the distance with this, uh, this weird comp they're running. Yeah, maybe I mean, it'd be interesting. We've seen quite a few comps that we really haven't seen, at least recently, Zico in AWC. Absolutely. I mean, that last series was not something I was expecting. Uh, just to see a full Zug Zug uh, melee cleave uh, kind of fest. Um, it's kind of cool, though, uh, because, you know, depending on who you talk to, because, like, I like to lurk, you know? I like to lurk. I don't know about you guys, like, on Twitch. I don't usually like to, like, mm. you know, be in the chat a lot. I just, like chill in the background and I was watching uh, Lord Maz you know and he was having like a like a discussion about uh, it was before the the patch came out and he was talking about oh I think melee cleaves are gonna be really strong uh, and Sam on my team doesn't think so he thinks it's gonna be all about casters and then when we're finally here mm -hmm. uh, it's cool to see actually what people are bringing uh, and so far we've seen a little bit of everything you know we've seen some rogue mage we've seen some wizards um, and we've also seen uh, some melee cleaves and Windwalker Subrogue is just one of those kind of like off meta comps that we really didn't expect to see um, do too well. But now top four is on the line. Eradas, Halton and JT uh, looking to make a stand here against WWF uh, who are bringing in the Outlaw Elemental once again here. Yeah, I'm curious. I really like the Paladin. I think the Paladin's really intelligent. You have the Save by the Light. You have the multiple Blessing of Protections, the low cooldown Sacrifice to kind of survive that all-in that the uh, Windwalker Rogue is going to be bringing in. Swapsy is so incredibly disruptive as well, already landing a full Hex here. We're going to get some damage rolling. JT in the back line right now, not in any crowd control. Let's see if they're able to find a Brunhidi, just kind of waiting in stealth, waiting for them to commit some cooldowns, and then potentially wanting to go in for a peel. So... Very interesting how long he's waiting. Maybe he wants them to commit the Serenity, but no, they're just going to go for it here on Eridas. Cheap Shot comes in. Do they have the damage to follow it up? Now going for a gouge here on the Houghton, looking for a little bit of damage as well. JT crosses the map, a full hex on Eridas, and swaps down that Shaman's going to be very disrupted. Those full hexes are definitely working out well for them so far. Yeah, and they're not going to be able to do anything uh, once those hexes connect. So Swapsy can keep those out, especially late in dampening. Uh, they can really be a game changer here, but Swapsy needs to kite a little bit here. And I really like the freedom as well uh, coming out there from next. Uh, just making sure that Swapsy can move around freely. And big stun coming out here onto Halton. Big damage connects, but JT is ready here. Serenity gets popped by Eridas. He gets blinded on his Serenity, actually. Really nice kind of dampener blind there coming out from Brunhiri. Kidney shot onto JT. He's going to trinket that immediately as he was getting swapped to, but Swapsy now in a lot of trouble here doesn't want to trade but he can't be too greedy there's a cheap shot now on to next do they have any follow-up here doesn't look like they're gonna be able to there, there is actually brunetti getting swapped to so much damage coming out there in the blind halt and going for the sap as well gets the full sap brunetti in a cheap shot triple dr cheap shot no full way. Fear. <laughs> And he manages to get the vanish off there. Defensive smoke bomb as well being dropped there, I do believe, uh, by Brunhiri. So a lot of things there being used there. But Hoolibang uh, are managing to keep the pressure going here onto Swapsy. Still dropping very low. No shield wall available. Next is going to have to trinket there. Still has two uh, Blessing of Protection and a Sacrifice though. And I think Next is going to have to start rotating those very, very soon. Yeah, this is looking good so far. Beautiful. Uh, usage of offense here. Eridas now into a full hex, getting a little bit of damage here on a JT. It is going to be Brunhidi, I think, who's the most vulnerable. Paralyzed on him, potentially setting him up for a swap, but Alton is just out of line of sight. Unfortunately, not able to connect. Swaps here with a beautiful Frost Shock. There's the gouge, though. Pre-sacrifice. Next gets the sacrifice, and Brunhidi shuts it down with the cheap shot, but Alton just decides to trinket and get aggressive. He wants to get this damage rolling, but does commit that trinket. Like, aggressively unfortunately not able to find too much damage but they did get the trinket out of the way on Brunhidi so he could be a, a great target um, coming up here soon 
Yep, and another Shadow Step gouge here onto next by Hawthorne, but he gets disarmed there by Brunhiri. Really nice to get the Paralyzed there onto next, but it's DR, of course, from the gouge. Eridas gets blinded once again on his Serenity. He's not going to be too happy about these blinds that are coming out. And i, I got to say, Brunhiri, uh, he knows that this is going to be a little bit of a longer match. Let's just use our blinds defensively right now, rotate our cooldowns back up. We're going to getting gouged, next getting swapped to. Beautiful hex coming out from Swap C, beautiful off heals. Ooh. There's no way they think from next here. They only get the divine protection there. Uh, clean shutdown there coming out from WWF. Huli Bang though, still looking for the pressure. Brunhiri going for a cheap shot onto Eradas, going after Halton. Swaps is proccing, meatballs are flying in. And uh, it's not going to be enough there. He is able to catch some heals there from JT. And uh, that Guardian is going to pay dividends. They're actually swapping to JT right now. Grapple weapon coming out from Eridas. Going to shut it down as both teams uh, kind of try to figure out how to get that next setup going here. Trying to find a way to uh, get some momentum going. There's a kidney shot onto next. JT's moving in for the fear. There's the fade. And he's looking for the fear, but... Uh, he's not going to be able to find it. He doesn't want to fear right there because Swapsy is not in a stun and he has Tremor Totem. Um, so he wanted Swapsy to be covered there before he goes for that stun. Shadowy Duel actually, uh, Jubilee was activated there, but Swapsy just burrows. And uh, that was Halton's uh, Shadow Blades there as well. So a lot of rogue cooldowns being used. Yep, beautiful. Kitty shot here on Brunhidi. Can they take him down? He's got the Cheat Death as well as Cloak of Shadows. Just decides to trade out the Vanish, getting out of the fight and allowing him to get a stun here onto JT. Looking for some counter pressure, but. Look at Hulabang there, all over the place. Everybody's stunned, everybody's dead. Nex has a lot of work ahead of him. He's caught into a full gouge. Swaps, he's forced to trade out the Astral Shift. Brunhidi uses the uh, evasion as well. So this is kind of a nightmare situation. Nex is burning through mana quickly too. They're behind on mana. Swaps, he might just get one shot. Here's the Smoke Bomb, Serenity. Nex moves in and is able to get the Blessing and Protection, keeping Brunhidi alive. But for how long? He's just outright dead. This is insane how much damage Hulabang has. They're all over the map. Great control. They've got the mana lead, and this is their game to lose at this point. Yep. Uh, Swaps you right now, trying to just kite, trying to uh, build some distance, but he's not really able to get away from Eridas here, just uh, trying to get some counter pressure going. But Swaps is still not out of the woods just yet. Next, with the sacrifice there onto Swapsy. And I wonder if they're going to start a swap to next with that. Uh, yep, there it is. Big swap coming out here. Nicely done there by Swapsy um, with the static field totem there, uh, pulling them away from next. And that's exactly what you want to do when the uh, sacrifice comes out. You want to swap to the healer if you have an opportunity, uh, like they just did there on the side of WWF. Uh, or sorry, on the side of Bully Bang. Next now in a full gouge. And Swapsy is going to be the target of choice here. Big damage, actually. They're going after Halton here, Brunhiri. Uh, just trying to peel during this go. And uh, so far, I gotta say, I feel like, it feels like Huli Bang is definitely in the driver's seat. Next has basically no mana left. JT is still looking good. Next, looking for a drink here, actually. Ooh. Is he finding anything? Yeah, he is getting mana. Finally, the Ring of Peace connects there, but he was able to get a little bit of mana. Uh, so far, still anyone's game, but I would give a slight lead to Huli Bang. Windwalker Road Comp is looking good. Houghton, though, taking quite a bit of damage. Is in a little bit of trouble at the same time, though. Swapsy forced to trade out his Trinket and Astral Shift. Shadowy Duel coming in from Houghton. Next decides to just trade out the Searing Glare to blind him. Make it so he misses all his attacks, but he's still in crowd control. Gouge comes in. Do they have a follow-up stun? Doesn't look like it just yet. Houghton just sitting on top of Next, really threatening that stun, and does manage to find it. Brunhidi shuts it down. Cheap shot on the Windwalker. Cheap shot on the Houghton. Doing everything he can to peel the situation while Next was in crowd control. Brunhidi really shutting down Hulabang during that last setup, but might cost him his life here. Evasion does trade out, and is just so deadly subtlety rogue and windwalker monk they can just switch targets on a dime and blow anyone up and i, I feel like so far the fur have done a great job playing defense but ulabang is definitely keeping them on their toes yeah definitely and look at that smoke oh, bump bump the smoke bump. done there by next swaps he surely would have died there if next didn't read that situation uh, correctly full stun on the brunhiri though they're just swapping back and forth here whoever they have stun drs on at this point they just stun swapsy uh, and do as much damage as possible then swap uh, over onto the rogue and do the same thing right now Hawthorne though getting swapped to jt's man is not looking too good Hawthorne forced to trade out his trinket there does have the shadow blades active right now and the next kidney shot could be deadly right now they're going after swapsy huge damage next forced to trade out his divine shield doesn't have a trinket there either 
Uh, so the next CC chain could potentially be the game decider. Swapsy with no trinket, Runehiri with no trinket, and next with no buttons and no mana. So anything can really happen here. But right now, it is WWF getting aggressive. They're going to kidney shot next here, and they're trying to send Swapsy. Uh, no they mana. Have a as well. Angel 4 coming out. There's the burrow from Swapsy. Kidney shot onto Eradas. Hawthorn trying to be as annoying as possible, but now getting swapped to Swapsy. Doing so much damage. Might just take him down. 100. Oh, cheat death procs there. Oh my goodness. Hawthorn, how is he still alive? He managed just get the clock of shadows but swapsy under so much trouble next looking for the drink but uh, they blind eradas once again here on the serenity he must be so frustrated sitting through this crowd control when he has all the damage in the world there to unload yeah but how to no, and nothing available he might have a vanish looks like he's gonna be going for the shadowy duel one shot here on to swapsy can they take him down next has no mana no answers whatsoever swapsy is definitely in trouble 41 percent damage at the same time though Houghton gets caught into a stun lock jt trades his life with the void shift to keep him alive and keep him in the fight jt needs to play at range though could get swapped to but no nice. they're going to do it hula bang i cannot believe it they take down swapsy just playing such a i mean i I, I can't believe it. I mean, I've seen a little bit of this composition, the Windwalker Rogue, but it is just looking so <laughs> good. The main issue with Windwalker Monks is they just get kited, right? Like, it, it's really easy to kite and shut them down. But when you have a Rogue on your team who can lock a target down and you can actually connect all that Windwalker damage, you can really get crazy. But they might go for a cross hill. And Hitty is low. Can he do it? I don't think he's going to be able to. Eridos throwing in some soothing mist, trying to keep him alive. Brun Hitty. Is still going for it though. This would be remarkable if they were able to get the cross kill here. Next doesn't really have much mana to keep Brune Hitty in the fight. I don't think he can continue the pursuit and ultimately will go down, but just shows you how close this match really was. Brune Hitty's still holding on for dear life, but it does get shut down. But really, really close game. And like I was saying, the, the rogues assist the Windwalker mark so positively, just locking people down. Uh, I, I think it works great with Windwalker's playstyle and kind of like bouncing around. Every time you swap a new target, you get bonus crit. So if you take advantage of that and are swapping lots and getting that additional crit, you can really uh, take advantage of some serious damage. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really nice. You have the rogue to lock him down, and then you have the windwalker to kind of create a big punch. But I want to say Hawthorne as well, though. He he does have like you know that style where he's crowd controlling the healer while Eradas is killing something. But a lot of the time, he just goes for the kill as well. Like he pops a shadowy duel and just try to send somebody hundred O like he's doing right now actually uh, onto Swapsy right there. But uh, they were able to peel him uh, as a duel ended. But um, it's it's really nice to see kind of how he's switching between trying to crowd control and then just uh, trying to actually end the game as well. JT here with the uh, Dispel into Void Shift. And then here, a little Holy Fire there at the end to close it out. I think he actually might have gotten the Killing Blow with that. Um, so... Uh, uh, it's nice. Uh, also, it allows Jay to just kind of sit back and do a lot of damage. Look at his damage done. Um, uh, at the end of the game, he had like 5 million damage done, and the rogue had like 12. So uh, literally adding in, you know, like a third of a real uh, damage dealer's DPS or like a fourth of a real damage dealer's uh, DPS in the long run, especially when we get to, you know, like the 30 and the 40% dampening plus, um, that is really when um, this damage is, you're really going to start to feel it uh, in terms of looking at the enemy healer's mana. So uh, I think it's a big reason actually why JT still has just a little bit mana left here and some cooldowns left to work with, whereas next it just doesn't have anything. So, um, you know, that damage difference really is big. And in dampening, especially when you're deep in dampening, damage is king. Yeah, really, really important. That was a long game too. I mean, both these teams, uh, I feel like the games are long, but this is one of those matchups that could just end instantly, right? It's like the reason why the game goes on so long is because next is, you know, pre-bopping smoke bombs and, um, you know, Brunhidi's coming in and shutting down the entire team with a gouge and two cheap shots. And um, they're getting really, really good peels on the Serenity with full blinds into hexes, uh, you know, the static field totems from Swapsy. So this is really, really high level gameplay from both of these teams. Um, but it's one of those matchups where you, you don't want to blink because <laughs> you definitely could miss a uh, one shot from either one of these teams we can see the final few moments it's gonna be really difficult for swap city to actually survive he, he dropped quite sharply after that you know at about four seconds before i uh, had a big rising sun kick fist of fury um combo kind of coming in you see the 120 000 holy fire by jt as well two times in a row so that holy priest damage is definitely adding up quite a bit and now we're actually going to see something i'm really interested in which is the fire mage i'm seeing tessia on fire mage which 
Iron Mage has definitely lost a lot of popularity, but I do think in a composition like this, it could work out very well. Yeah, it also helps uh, having one of the absolute best mages in Europe uh, on your roster in Tessia. And it's going to be nice to see because Tessia, I feel like he's been around on the ladder for so long and he has competed uh, with some really, really good teams. But I feel like he's not really been that guy who wants to uh, have a deep AWC run and, uh, you know, uh, compete. I feel like he... he he competes sometimes, you know? It, it doesn't feel like it's his main thing, you know what I mean? Uh, but now to actually see him uh, in in such a good team, you know, uh, with, with these players, with, you know, people like Swapsy, people who've done everything that you can possibly do, uh, I think he, he's this is a roster where he can grow and he can really, um, you know, be a contender for the entire year. So it's going to be interesting to see what he can do on that Fire Mage. But I do got to uh, agree with you. Uh, Fire Mage into uh, the Windwalker uh, sub rogue, definitely a brave choice. Ah, I, yeah, it is. But I, I feel, the one nice thing is that having a paladin and a, a rogue kind of, um, I, 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 it kind of it, it helps. He might not even be playing glass cannon too. So I, I'm really going to be looking out to see uh, what his build ends up being here. Uh, but being able to spam out polymorphs and find that you know big damage with combustion. Um, this is a composition we've seen many times before, the Rogue Mage Paladin. Let's see if they can pull it off here against uh, this Cleave comp. Yeah, already a blind coming out here onto next. Hotton looking for the sap, manages to find the sap as well. Brunhiri is potentially going to be the target. No, it looks like Tessia is going to be the target. No, there it is, Brunhiri. Smoke bomb coming out, kidney shot, big damage. This is Serenity, but what happened to his HP? Oh, he got, did he get Lay on Hands? Yeah, he got lay on hands, okay. Uh, so Brunhiri's gonna be able to stay alive with that cooldown. Now, this swapping over to Tessia. Tessia's taking quite a bit of damage as well. Combustion is rolling here for Tessia, but uh, so far, no one really taking too much damage from it. And it is gonna be hot on just chasing down Tessia. And I do, I do think, actually, Tessia's playing Shimmer, uh, because I saw him just trinket a stun there, but he might have blinked before. Uh, so we'll keep an eye out on that as well. Full kill shot here onto next. Next is gonna trinket out as well. So uh, next, training on the Trinket Sacrifice. Tessia in a lot of trouble here, but this is a much faster game. Uh, it's going to be all about finding those crowd controls and actually trying to uh, close it out. They got a blind onto JT. Can they find any follow-up? Tessia going for the Shifting Power, looking for the Ring of Frost, looking for the Sheep. And uh, he is not playing Shimmer. He is playing Blink Stun. I just saw him use the cast while running there. So uh, he probably just blinked because he had to. Tessia uh, going to be blinking back to safety, resetting it with all the time. So he's going to still be able to blink if he does get stunned. And uh, now they've done their hit. Now it's time to just run and kind of wait for those DRs to come back. Yeah, and also he is not playing Glass Cannon. So he's not going to be that squishy in this matchup. He's not less on health. Um, they're not going to really find a way to purge off that altar time unless JT gets a little bit lucky with that one. So uh, I do like this pick. I think it makes a lot of sense. Full Ring of Frost now is going to land. Let's see what they can get done. Tessia right now going for a big fireball combustion combo. Houghton's in a lot of trouble. JT's forced to make a trade. He trinkets and void shifts. That was a very close call, and they get basically every defensive cooldown out of the way. The Furwags are in a really commanding position at this point. Yeah, nice uh, peels coming out here as well from Houghton. Uh, and uh, Houghton looking for the next setup here, trying to get to next, but next just line of sighting him there around the pillar. Meanwhile, Tessia's taking a decent amount of damage here. Eridas uh, going to go ahead and remove that Nova. Gets caught up in a full sheep here. He does have Zwen the Tiger active as well. And uh, Whirling Dragon Punchers are coming out here from Eridas between the crowd control chain looking. Ooh, that was, a, that was a nice ring of peace there by Eridas right between his crowd control, the healer who was in a stun, and, um, you know, the mage. So manages to bump him and actually stop the go here. So uh, now as a result of that stop, I think Eridas and Halton are going to have a good time here uh, actually getting uptime. Uh, JT could be sitting down for a drink, actually. I'm not really sure... Uh, no, I think he might have tried there, but had to cancel it. Eridas was taking a little bit too much damage. Uh, still, next now is sitting down for a drink, but Halton is chasing him as well, making sure he stays in combat. And uh, this could be one of those games that comes down to mana. Eridas uh, having to trade his touch of karma there and getting sheeped on it as well, though. So small win here for WWF. Uh, definitely, let's see what they can do. Mana in favor of next at this point. Chastise, do they have a setup? It looks like they're going to be going after the Paladin. Can they take him down through Divine Protection? Yeah, they might be able to actually get the Divine Shield. They do. It gets Master Spelled. Nex is in trouble. Once that Divine Protection phase, he really doesn't have too much defense. Brunhidi shutting down the damage, though. Getting a full kidney shot. A large damage from Tessie as well with that combustion. Double leg sweep coming in. Outson right now is going to be line of sighting, but that was a really close call on. Next, 
Luckily, he still has his trinket as well as two blessing and protections, but cannot be greedy with that. If he gets caught into a stun, he needs to get out of there as soon as possible. Yep, and Brunhiri just uh, trying to roll the bones here, trying to uh, get back on track. Full blind, uh, and that's going to be JT's trinket actually on that full blind. Hot on, uh, sitting through some stuns here. It's going to be Tessia once again on that mage. Uh, so far, his defensive cooldown usage has been absolutely on point. Uh, so he blinks the stun, gets DR stunned, trinket out of that one, uh, uses his greater invisibility, which is a three second damage reduction. Uh, it's a 60% damage reduction for three seconds. So Tessia just playing the defensive game pretty well, but there they did force out some of his defense. Still has the ice block though, still has the cauterize as well. And uh, not finding any crowd control here, sadly. Um, onto JT. He's making it very difficult. Ooh, nice uh, chastise. But the break, the chastise. They're swapping to next here. Uh, I feel like Halton and JT were not on the same page right there. Uh, I think JT wanted to chastise potentially fear. And uh, uh, Brunhiri, or oh, sorry, um, Halton wanted to swap there to next. But either way, they get the blessing of protection. Um, but they're going to need to clean that up. This is a very important for them to actually win this game. Uh, WWF is one of those teams. We've seen them come back strong. Uh, so you want to try to shut them down while you have the opportunity here. Yep, definitely. Kitty shot now on to next. Gouge on the Houghton. Brunhitti's in a lot of trouble. He needs to run away, just vanishing out of the fight. They do not have the peels. I can't believe it. Hulabang, they might be able to do it once again, but a double stun lock combo comes in. JT not in any crowd control, just going for a mind control, but that is a very aggressive mind control. Now forced to use the Divine Him in the spirit of the Redeemer to keep his team alive and does manage to do it. Hulabang stays in the fight, but that was a very close call. Yeah, uh, very, very close there onto Halton, but he managed to stay alive. Look at Nexus sitting down for a drink. They need to stop this drink immediately. Brunhiri's trying to stop them from stopping the drink. Uh, and he was able to actually get one little tick there uh, on the side of Next. JT's mana is actually about the same as Next right now. So I uh, wonder what JT is going to do here. Is he going to look for a drink or is he actually going to uh, just try to heal his team? So they trade out the Touch of Karma. I think JT actually wants to sit down for a drink right now. Brunhiri going in for the stuns. JT realizing cannot go for it. Nice paralyzed there onto Brunhiri. Tessia still taking some damage. And it is going to come down to mana next using his sacrifice here. Really will be about who can conserve their mana better, who can trade more efficiently, who can get more damage out. They're swapping to next. He trinkets. He gets stunned on his trinket. There's one the tiger. Here comes more pressure. Triple DR cheap shot. They need something though. And they're not going to be able to find it. They're just going to actually try to kind of train next. But look at Eridas. He, no, he has nothing. Blink counter spell snuck in here by Tessia. Can they get the shift? Do they have the void shift even? They don't have it. But Eridas does manage to stay alive there. That was an incredibly close call. Great counter spell sniped there by Tessia and that combustion. And this is the All part in. of the game where the fight is really scary. Double leg sweep coming out here. But at the same time, Eridas dropping super low here. Forced to run away there uh, from that exchange. Yeah, that was a big push there on to next going for a searing glare good control here by tessia looking for a ring of frost can he find it big fireballs gonna be landing here on the windwalker monk who has zero defensive cooldowns void shift trades out dr kidney shot on next that's unfortunate into a full blind brun hit is there just to make it difficult for houghton at the same time though tessia is he's got no ice block still has the cauterize jt gets interrupted anyone could fall tessia is in trouble jt's in trouble can they take him down? He's got the Spirit of the Redeemer in just a few short seconds. That's going to allow his team to survive. He's going to have to make the trade immediately doing it, just bombing in. Flash heal after flash heal. Tessia has the altar time. Is he going to trade it? Not yet. Just spamming out Polymorphs, trying to get control of the game. Ring of Fire trades after getting interrupted on Polymorph. At the same time, Eridus is trying to put out a lot of pressure, but he gets caught into a Polymorph. Tessia sneaks one in on JT, and Houghton is in a lot of trouble. This is a great polymorph here of by Tessia using that altar time to deny the damage. Howden has basically run out of time. I don't know how JT is going to be able to keep him alive. It's so deep and damp, and he's got no mana left. But somehow, some way, they might do it. And Brunhitti <laughs> is just going to get outright one shot. I can't believe it. Hula bang. This team is insane running this very unorthodox subtlety rogue Windwalker Monk Holy Priest. If you asked me what compositions we were going to see this weekend, I would never have guessed this one. Yeah, this is one of those comps like we don't get to see it almost ever, but when we do get to see it, man, and it works, and you have the right players on it, man, it looks fantastic. Hooli Bang right now looking to make the upset happen. This is a new roster, and on the side of WWF, it's the same roster, but you know, like there's been like a little bit of a change. Uh, but still, man, it's 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 amazing to see how well Hoolibang really has been performing so far uh, this weekend. I mean, imagine they knock out WWF 
uh, what, what, a, what a crazy run for them so far. Had a really strong opener to the day. Uh, had a good uh, series so far against WWF. They beat the Fiends. I mean, this is really a team that uh, could potentially go the entire distance here, and we might even see them um, in the uh, uh, mid-season clash. So uh, we'll see. Uh, but look at that setup at the, at the end right there. Oh, that's so nice. It's got to feel so bad if you are um, a Brunhiri there, because he, he had cheat death there. He just got a bad cheat death proc and got a little bit unlucky there, but also uh, just good uh, of JT especially um, to capitalize on that situation and push in. He had no mana left. He just got out of a CC chain. He knows it's do or die. Either we win now or we lose now. There's the sheep uh, that I'm talking about. And uh, you can see here, Tessie is kind of setting up for the win. And then as soon as JT comes out from this uh, crowd control chain, his rogue is super low. And he just goes out, trades out a serenity charge. And then he pushes in. And he gets the chastise here, I think, onto next. So they get a paralyze on the Tessia. And there's the chastise. And then they just add in enough damage uh, in that uh, super DR chastise. And a fear Tessia as well. Just to make sure that the mage isn't stopping the, the priest when he gets the chastise and he's pushing in. And also so the mage doesn't, you know, dragon's breath the DPS and just... Try to save the day, basically. So, good cross CC, good setup, uh, good defense. Uh, Holy bang. Definitely uh, banging right now. Yeah, definitely looking good. But I feel like the Furbox have... I want to see... You know what I want to see? We talked about, like, the representation. And we, we've seen, you know, a lot of different classes represented. We've seen some Cleaves represented, like you said. You know, a lot of melee caster healer. But Wizard Cleaves have not been showing up. In the open bracket, they have not been showing up today. I want to see some wizards. I, I feel like like a demo frost mage, a demo arcane, something like that would do very well into the holy priest, windwalker, sub rogue. Like I, I think if you have a demo warlock, it's going to be a lot more difficult for them to actually reset. JT is going to be you know in a lot more crowd control. I, I don't see how it would be bad. Like even locking a paladin, like like paladin, demo warlock, frost, or even arcane mage would be really really good. So. I think that's an option for them here. And um, I think it's one of the few times that the Wizard Cleave would actually look really, really good. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, playing it on a large map and just dragging out the melees, getting counter pressure, getting the Demonic Tyrant and stuff, pushing them back to the pillar and then just keeping them pinned there. It's definitely, you know, um, a, a tried and tested strategy here. Um, we'll see what they decide to go for because they do have a Warlock. You know, they have Swapsy. Uh, Swapsy, he's basically just everything. He's whatever you need him to be. You need him to be a healer, he can be a healer. You need him to be a DK, he'll be a DK. You need him to be a warlock, he'll be a warlock. And uh, the crazy thing about Swapsy is he's, he'll be good at all of those things. So we'll see uh, if he decides to go with his warlock. Um, because uh, Tessia also plays all the mage specs, you know. Tessia is an amazing mage. He can play any spec that his team needs. So if they want to play a frost mage warlock and try to... Uh, maybe drag it out and dampen it. That is an option. Did they want to keep Tessie on the bench? Uh, like they did in game one. That's an option, but that's the, that's the, that's the, that's a the, that's the scary thing, right? Because if you are WWF, you have a lot of answers, but you only have one chance here to make the right call. If you make the wrong call now, that's it. You're out of the tournament. Uh, they are going to bring in the Warlock, that's true. not the Mage Lock. So, good call. Not the Mage Lock. I kind of like the mage though. I, I, I feel like it, it wasn't looking too bad. Uh, it's just really nice. You're not really a target on that mage being able to blink stuns. Uh, if you <laughs> was saying that we should point out that big rising sun kick, we had the 289,000 rising sun kick. And the, the Windwalkers, I mean, the thing that they excel at the most is their outrageous damage. Like, let's just be honest. Windwalkers do crazy damage. Um, but they get controlled a lot. Like normally when you pop Serenity, you're feared, you're feared, you're polyed, you're Dragon's Breath, you're blinded, you're gouged, you're kidneyed, like you get shut down. So I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing Windwalker monks basically succeed with Subtlety Rogues is because they can actually lock down targets and then you can connect all this insane burst that the Windwalker monk mm -hmm. has available. So I'm a big fan of this composition. Um, it's something we've seen a little bit in NA as well um, with, with Chun-Li and his new squad with Days. So maybe we'll see that a little bit um, tomorrow, but... For now, Hula Bang, they're doing an incredible job. We'll see if Swapsy on the Destruction Warlock is enough to close it out. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. I feel like uh, bringing in the Mage would have been nice as well, but Destro and Outlaw is one of those comps. We've seen it. It's, 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 a, it's a really strong comp. A lot of people are playing it in the game. I feel like it's the best comp, or one of the best comps in the game. 
Um, so we'll see. Um, and yeah, we, we did uh, mention the damage. Uh, the, the one thing we, we didn't mention about the, the damage here is like, yeah, Eridas is doing 300k Rising Sun Kicks. Yeah, he's doing uh, Whirling Dragon Punches for 100k, 200k even. But you can't actually see it here. But um, so first, Echoing Reprimand from Halton. That's essentially like, that's what you set up your one shot with, you know? You use that. So you can get the Evises off, and so you can get a good secret tech off, and have it count as a seven uh, combo point secret tech. Um, and the thing about the secret tech is that it hits you twice, but he actually died before the second hit uh, came out there. So Halton did have like another probably 100k there as well. So that's the scary thing about this Windwalker um, sub rogue, right? Because on one end, if just the Windwalker has his cooldowns and the rogue stuns you, you can die. And if the rogue stuns you and also has his own cooldowns, and the Windwalker doesn't, then you can die as well. Um, so uh, it's a fun comp to watch, uh, just because it's a very like uh, high octane uh, action, action, action. Even though these guys are living for a long time, uh, if they ever make a mistake, it's over in a blink of an eye. What if Rep Paladin would be good too? Like uh, Rep Paladin's recently received a little bit of damage buffs. I wonder if Swapsy on the Rep Paladin would be strong. You know, the Rhett Outlaw could potentially be an option. Ooh. Yeah, he used to love playing Rhett Outlaw. <laughs> yeah, like double Paladin with a Rhett Outlaw. Like, you have a lot of answers for this comp. We're not going to see it yeah, right now because it's kind of do or die for them. So the Furbogs, if they win with this, we'll probably see this composition because it's like their last lifeline. Um, but mm -hmm. I'll tell you right now, I don't think anybody anticipated Hulabang eliminating Furbogs in the lower bracket. Like, <laughs> It's so funny because the, the, the Wandering Water Furbogs is um, is my prediction for second place in Europe. I thought, okay, we're going to see yeah. Echo number one. We're going to see WWF number two. Swapsy and Waz, the classic, you know? Uh, but right now, they are on match point against a brand new roster. And look at that. <laughs> look at all our predictions. You're the only one, actually, who didn't predict uh, WWF to do well, man. Well, I didn't say they wouldn't do well, but I didn't think they would uh, make this. it through the lower bracket. Yeah. So my prediction could still be true, right? Yeah, yeah, you're you're the you're pre if WWF lose right now, you're you're the only one who still has like a prediction on the table that can be 100% dream. Accurate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're gonna be uh, rooting for everyone who plays against just for fun for the rest of the weekend. <laughs> Not me. I'm gonna be cheering for them every step of the way. Right. <laughs> uh, another fun fact is that the team name Wandering Water Furbogs was actually auto-generated name by Raider IO. Uh, we've been told by Swapsy. Um, and speaking of Raider IO, I mean, uh, if you head over to Raider IO, guess what, guys? Signups for Cup 2 are still available. And you can sign up right now. This is Cup number one, Cup number two. That's it. After that, there is Gauntlet, there is a mid season clash. So if you have a good run in Cup number two, that might just be enough to qualify. Uh, so, uh, go and sign up. Yeah, go and sign up. It's fun. We saw, we've even seen, like, some teams that came together through looking for group, uh, sign up for, you know, the open bracket and win some series. So, excited to see if we do see that again, um, next weekend or next week. Uh, but yeah, definitely a really fun thing to do. Get on the tournament realm, set up the, you know, your gear, uh, the perfect combination, whatever you want, whatever racial, whatever gear, whatever comps you want to run, you could try it out and uh, see if you can go toe to toe with these uh, amazing players. And, and if you do sign up, you uh, earn the dreaming banner of the aspects. Uh, if you want to sign up, raider.io slash tournaments, get over there. Uh, but enough talk about signing up. Uh, let's see here. WWF against Huli Bang. This is match point here. Huli Bang. Can they 3 0 WWF? Uh, what most of us on the desk uh, thought would be a top two team here in Europe uh, could potentially go home already here in day number one. Uh, Swapsy right now. Looking for the fears. Actually, teleport. Nice uh, fake cast there as well. Gets the pre cog. And Swapsy now is going to have good positioning far away from the action and just be able to spam out those fears and spam out the damage. And uh, already, this destruction warlock is looking quite good in this matchup. 
Yeah, definitely good so far. The only problem with the Destruction Warlock is he can't blink out a stun, so Swapsy could be a really good target here in the match. If they can get crowd control on the Paladin and do a big setup here on the Swapsy, they might be able to take him down. But so far, damage has really... Uh, it's non-existent for Hulabang. Finally, a big setup here with the Smoke Bomb. Can they take him down? Doesn't look like Brunhitti's going to be taking really any damage here, and Swapsy's just able to just spam out fears during these moments. Finally, Aerodas is going to be able to connect, getting out a big Fist of Fury, but Swapsy just fears it up. Cheap shot, one Chaos Bolt lands, and they find another JT in a full blinding light for the moment. Aerodas, very slippery on that Windwalker Monk, going to be putting down his Transcendence behind the pillar. If he needs to, he can just quickly escape the fight. Yep, and uh, we're going to see Swapsy now trading out the Dark Pact. Actually, teleports into a double fear. Who are they going to go after? Ooh, Brunhiri, isolated here, three versus one. Double fear, uh, actually forcing a lot of pressure there. Brunetti, Trinket, and Cloak of Shadows, and still not out of the woods just yet. The wings are coming out here for next now, and with those wings, everybody is going to be fine. But that was really nice. That was a little bit of a, a unfortunate timing there by Swaps. He wanted to teleport out of the, the, the stun, uh, but ended up teleporting into uh, a double fear. And then, of course, they capitalized on that very, very well. And these are kind of the small plays that Hulibang are, are so good at. Uh, you know, swapping between the Warlock, swapping between the Rogue, finding these opportunities, shutting down the drinks. They're playing a clean game so far. Look at JT. Push. There's the Shastai. There's the full fear. Brunhiri in absolutely deadly waters right now. And uh, he is going to be able to stay alive, but not for free. Next had to use his trinket right there uh, to save the day. Yeah, Brunhitti under fire constantly in this match. Every one of those stuns could be lethal if they get crowd control on Next at the same time. But if Next has heads up plays with the sacrifice, with the blessing of protection, they should be able to keep him alive. Swapsy with a beautiful full fear here onto JT. Where is the damage though? They just cannot find it. Finally, potentially a Chaos Bolt lands, but no, a pre-karma by Eridos. They just shred through it though. And they're just going to go for it after this Windwalker Monk. That's going to be the Void Shift. That's going to be the Touch of Karma. That's going to be the Diffuse Magic. Going after Brunhitti, though. A huge one-shot combo. Can they take him down in 3-0 WWF? It doesn't look like they're able to. That was Sacrifice. That was Evasion. That was Blessing of Protection. That was a close call. Oh, that was Cheat Death, too. Just barely saving him. He got lucky there on the, on the Cheat Death proc. But Swapsy now uh, in a little bit of trouble here, getting Cheap Shotted. There's a Gouge onto next. Do they have anything to follow up that Gouge? Doesn't look like it. Brunhitti is there with the Disarm. Halton uh, looking for the Kidney Shot here. Potentially looking for the setup. There's the Kidney Shot. Brunhitti is in a leg sweep. Here comes the Cheap Shots as well. No, he's not able to find the Cheap Shot. Halton uh, didn't have a Shadow Dance there, I think. Or didn't want to use a Vanish. I'm not sure. But either way, they are able to force out the Divine Shield from next. Nine seconds left on next trinket jt sitting through a blind right now swapsy is taking a little bit of damage halt on could be in trouble here to actually go after eridas eridas forced to trade out his trinket doesn't have touch of karma so just trinket port there's a kidney shot onto next and here comes the setup grapple weapon onto brunhiri he tries to pre-faint it can they find the fear they do manage to connect with the fear in time cheap shot onto brunhiri do they have what it takes to be able to take him down doesn't look like it brunhiri uh, manages to get the trade off here in time uh, with the Vanish, and now it is going to be Eridas once again here on the Windwalker, no Trinket, who is going to be the main target here for w WWF. JT also had to use his Will of the Forsaken there on a Fear, so WWF finding some trades here, um, even though it was looking really scary there for a second. Ooh, swaps in a Kidney Shot. is going to be using that Soul Rip to slow down some of the damage, looking for an Immolate Can Flag combo here. Do they have a, any damage to follow it up? Let's see, JT... Did use his Will of Forsaken, but still has his trinket available. He's caught into a full hammer of Justice Houghton just sitting back. But Eridos might just get smoked. Big Chaos Bolts land, and they take him down. Swapsy does a huge burst combo. That was a little bit unexpected, uh, but that what? was that was crazy. I definitely want to see the replay for that one. I blinked, and he was dead. <laughs> like, like, actually, what happened? We have to see the replay there, but uh, WWF, I guess. They, uh, they come back. The Destruction Warlock. Seems um, to have worked out for them this time around, but it was a close game. I feel like it was, it was a really close game, but if you're WWF, this is what you have to lock in now. This is the only thing you've won with, and you're on match point, so uh, you don't really have, um, you can't really afford to experiment too much. Um, so this is, is this an offensive touch of karma by Eridas? Yeah, it is, and he has no trinket, so I'm not a huge fan of that. Halton uh, trinkets out of a blind right there from Brunhiri. Infernal stun comes in. Next, looking for the CC here onto JT. Hodge connects. And Chaos Ball. Boom. Boom. And then Second another Chaos, Chaos Ball. Deletes him. Boom. And we got a DR cheap shot there onto JT. 
Uh, and it, yeah, they just melt him. Dang, I wonder what finished him off there because he actually did portal away. He had the diffuse magic. I wonder if he had just been smashing his diffuse and then his port, if he would have actually lived or if he was just trying to greet it to get out of line of sight because that was actually a really close call. Swapsy barely took him down. And I mm -hmm. think if... Uh, yeah, we'll have to watch it once again. I, I, I want to see exactly what happens there. So good setup here on the Swapsy. A little bit of an offensive karma, just trying to pr predict some of the damage. The soul rip comes in. Swapsy connects a little bit of damage. You can see Houghton's going to play defense right now. So Next is pushing in for crowd control, and Next moves over to try to deny it. He doesn't want him to get off like a repentance or something like that. He's, I think he's playing blinding light, but here's the chaos bolts, and let's see exactly what happens. Eridos, he portals and uh, gets dropped. So yeah, maybe we could see it in the kill log. But he had the diffuse magic. I wonder if he had used it, if he would have actually survived. Just kind of a split second decision. But once again, I mean, that's a close game, right? Like Brunhidi barely lived. Luckily, he had that cheat death available. Does um, Shadow Burn. Does Chaos Bolt go through uh, Diffuse? No. It does not. It gets rid of it. Well, he died. He died to the Shadow Burn Blessing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that would have no. been reduced for sure. So, yeah, it might have been enough to keep him alive but at the same time if he uses one global he's going to port one global later and he might he has to take one extra global as well from the rogues i don't know i don't know it was a close call uh, either way uh i don't think we're going to see too much uh, uh switch up here Wooly bang locking in the same thing wwf locking in the same thing hook point is hook point what it takes here uh for Hooli bang to close this one out or do you think that this combo actually uh is gonna be able to uh, turn the series around man uh, from WWF. I mean, it's a good comp. comp. It's a really good comp. I mean, the thing is, mm -hmm. like, Swapsy has so many peels. If they go after Brunhidi consistently in the match, Swapsy has the option to not only spam fear, but he can also use things like the Shadow Fury, right? Like, even in a smoke bomb, Swapsy can drop in a Shadow Fury, which can completely deny the go. So it makes it so they have to either cross Swapsy or somehow get him out of the game so he can't peel. Um, because if he drops an Infernals, he drops a double coil, he drops, you know, a spam fear. Um, then he's going to be able to protect his team. So it becomes a little bit more awkward in this matchup for Hulabang to actually find those one shots on Brunhidi. I think they did a good job and there was a, some close calls, but uh, that's why I kind of like the Destruction Warlock here. You're just so incredibly disruptive, even using that Soul Rip. Like if they go after Swapsy and he gets even a little gap in the chain and he can get that Soul Rip off, it's, uh, or Soul Rip off, it's going to be huge uh, to just deny that damage from uh, Aerodos and Howden. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Uh, if Swapsy can get that soul rip off and uh, if Swapsy can play that defense um, on that Warlock, the one thing is a lot of your defense comes from that Dark Pact. And in Dampening, your Dark Pact is it's kind of light, the Absorb uh, on that one. Uh, but anyway, Eridos with the Power Infusion, with the Serenity, looking for the damage. Triple Cheap Shot coming out here from Brunhiri, uh, stunning up everybody, making sure that nothing gets done. There's a double uh, coil coming out here for Flopsy, and he's looking like he wants to go after the Windwalker once again. Already Guardian Spirit being traded out here from JT. JT sitting through a full kidney right now, and Brunhiri already on the run here. Fortress trade out his Trinket and his Cloak of Shadows, and... Correct me if I'm wrong, but that Guardian procs, right? If it's a three-minute cooldown? Uh, or is, I think uh, so, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, so I think that Guardian... Uh, JT is going to struggle with these with these setups uh, because his Guardian has procs here. So uh, it's going to be really tough for him to actually um, uh, kind of stop these uh, these goes and actually stay efficient. He might have to trade out Void Shift earlier than he would like and, and things like that. So uh, definitely something to keep an eye on. Yeah, nice double stun there by Eridos. Getting a nice setup, but... No damage to really follow it up. Big cheap shot here. Do we have damage from Swapsy? One Chaos Bolt's gonna land. Needs to be very careful. That's one Void Portal as well. Just summoning in some damage. Void Rift onto Eridos, but he's able to connect. And this small map is gonna pay dividends here for Hulabang in terms of uptime. It's gonna be really easy for them to bounce around on targets and swap kind of on a dime. Houghton gets stunned, but he's out of line of sight. Swapsy not able to really find too much damage. Now setting up the Windwalker Monk. He gets gripped away to JT, does not want to mess around, not want to have to overcommit. Um, and it looks like he is going to be able to just kind of walk away without using really anything besides that void grip. Now, big stun here on the Brunhidi. They're going for an all-in one shot once again. That's going to be bubble as well as the blessing of protection. So a huge setup there by Hulabang, and they net a ton of cooldowns. 
Yeah, and uh, we're going to see here Brunhiri uh, looking a little bit offensive here onto Hawthorne. There's a full blind onto JT. Nice disarm there, though, from Eridas, shutting it down before they get uh, too much cooldowns there in this exchange. And now exchanging uh, blows here onto Brunhiri. Brunhiri forced to trade out the Vanish. Say, but life is going to proc there as well for him. Looking for the opener. Can he find something? It looks like he wants to stun uh, Eridas here and just try to get aggressive onto him. But Kidding Shot onto next. Do they have any follow up here? JT gets a uh, clothesline there by the Shadow Fury. It looked like JT uh, maybe wanted to go for a fear right there. Eridas still not uh, complete out of the woods just yet. The next stun on him could be deadly. Does not have a trinket for it. Full stun onto Brunhede. There's the Paralyzed. There's the Legs Rebound to next. Next manages to connect there with the Lay on Hands and the Blessing of Sacrifice. So next, once again, able to block the kill. Grip there right before he gets blinded so Eridas uh, potentially going to be safe here uh, because of that grip from JT JT sitting through a DR fear here as well out of this they have no more crowd control for him and next sitting up for a drink here uh, in the open field but gets stopped instantly here by Jay and um, Brunhiri now in trouble there's the chastise there's the fear here's the stance Brunhiri holy fire gets spell locked oh my goodness that could have actually killed him but Brunhiri regardless has to trinket fit out the cloak of shadows and um, just uh, Try to make that defensive trade. He still has the sheet death to fall back on. Uh, I don't know if actually he has evasion because we have an issue with evasion on the spectator client. We can see it light up when they use it, but we can't track the cooldown right now. Uh, either way, Swapsy, unending resolve uh, being used here. And uh, that's the thing as well in this matchup. As dampening goes up, the Warlock becomes a better and a better target because a lot of his defense is shields, self healing, uh, health stone, stuff like that. Yeah, and Swapsy really getting punished here. That's going to be the sacrifice to keep him alive for the time being. But Eridus just ripping into both of them. Brunhidi is forced to run away. Houghton goes for crowd control. He gets the kidney shot here on the next counter kidney shot from Brunhidi. Eridus at the same time taking quite a bit of damage. Might have to trade out that touch of karma. Does not want to greet it. Hammer of Justice. There's a touch of karma. Might have to just outright run, but they're going for it with the offensive touch of karma. Big damage here on the Swapsy. The cheap shot lands, but I don't think it's going to be enough. There's the coil. Smoke bomb drops down. They're going after Brunhidi. Swapsy peels with the shadow fear. Potential soul rip coming in as well. Looking for the spam fear. Doing what he can to keep Brunhidi alive and does manage to do so. Now going for a bit of an offensive portal, repositioning, looking for a fear here, potentially onto JT, but can't find it. And now without that portal, I feel like Swapsy's in a lot of trouble. Dampening's getting higher. He's got zero defensive cooldown. Eridos is all over him. And I think Swapsy could easily fall here, Zico. Yeah, absolutely. Swapsy uh, trying to make a run for it. He has no unending result. He has no health stone. There's a cheap trick coming out. There's a sacrifice from next. I think the next stun on Swapsy actually has trinket for it. I think in two stuns, Swapsy is dead. Uh, but he's going to gateway uh, to safety right now. Fake has to kick. It's free cog. There's a full pair on the next. I don't even need a stun. There's a stun. Swapsy trinkets out. Will he stay alive? There's the DR. Leg sweep on to next. He's 1% HP. And they managed to close it out. Holy bang is going to eliminate W. WF from Cup number one in Dragonflight season three. Something that no one on the desk could have predicted. Well, this kind of lines up with my prediction, but yeah, we'll 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 see exactly how this goes <laughs> down. Ulibang looking great. I knew they could do it all along with the subtlety rogue windwalker monk holy priest. Uh definitely looking good. I mean the small map was awesome. They were able to go after Swapsy, and the, the added benefit of the small map is when you're going after Swapsy and Brunhidi's forced to come and play kind of defensive, um, he's getting cleaved down. You can easily swap to him. At the end of this game, Houghton actually just trinkets. He gets, look at him, he gets dismantled. He just trinkets the dismantle. He doesn't care at all, throwing caution completely to the wind and just getting as aggressive as he can. And at this point, Brunhidi's doing everything he can to try to peel the situation. He throws a blind on Houghton. He gets caught into the double stun. Brunhidi um, gets out of it. I think it was triple diminishing retar returns, but just does not have the stun locks for Eridos, and unfortunately the gouge comes in a little bit too late. Honestly, at that point of the game, I don't know if they're going to be able to recover, so uh, hats off to Brunhidi for trying. I kind of do wonder if, I uh, like, one thing that I think could have gone a little bit better, like, I don't know if Brunhidi just didn't have it set up, but I feel like playing Night Elf against this team was a big mistake, um, personally. Uh, like, just going Orc and gapping the stuns and making it so you take less burst and it just seems like it outvalues Night Elf uh, by quite a bit, but maybe I'm wrong about that. I kind of agree with that, actually. I would have liked to see Orc. Feels like more value. I like Orcs. 
Well, maybe they can make those adjustments um, next time that we see them. But that is going to be the end of that series. And that means that we are going to head into our last one of the day. It's yet another elimination round as well. It's Chewbacca Tensei versus Just for Fun. Ven, this was your second place prediction, correct? Um, Just for Fun? Yep, that is. I thought Just for Fun, uh, they're going to be on cruise control through that lower bracket and meet Echo in the finals. That's my prediction. We'll have to wait and see if that actually ends up happening, but I think they've been looking good today. Uh, but they're going up against a, a pretty difficult team here with uh, Chibaku Tensei. Certainly are. I mean, they've had a pretty good day so far, so we'll see how that series goes. Exactly. We can take a look real quick at this death recap. Here is Swapsy Zico. So quite a lot of damage, obviously, coming out from him. For him. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, for him. Uh, so, I mean, we can see it here. We've seen some of these logs. So this is this this is the secret tech, right? Um, let me see here. So we, I think we're missing, actually, one secret tech. Uh, because this is from Akari Soul. So this is like the copied uh, secret tech. So there's one more secret tech probably a little bit before this uh, in the log as well. So uh, those, uh, those sub rogues, they don't do like a whole lot of scoreboard damage. But once they, once they get that damage going, once they get on top of you and they get the stun lock and they have their cooldowns like every one minute, uh, they can do basically this where they, uh, you know, get the echoing reprimand and the symbols of death and they get the shadow blades and they, you know, basically spam Evis and uh, secret tech on you. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty cool stuff from Hoton. And, of course, not that big of a rising sun kick uh, for Eridos. We've seen, we've seen bigger. We've seen 300k kicks. Like, this is, this is kind of like... better. Look, Light work. You know, we, we can do better than that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, Han's got a lot of fans also, I've noticed, in, in Warcraft chat, which is pretty cool to see, especially for an AWC newcomer. So keep that up. We are going to head into a break, like I said, Lava Lava versus Just for Fun. Up next, which team is going to be home, going home for the last series of the day? We'll see you in just a bit.
Hey everybody, welcome back. We are now on the last and final series of today before we head into Championship Sunday for the EU region. Of course, we do have those NA games tomorrow on Saturday. We're seeing Jibaku Tensei versus Just For Fun Super Tease. This is Ven's second place prediction, Just For Fun. Yeah. What do you feel about this team? I mean, three out of four of us are immediately wrong. I mean, how is Swapsy out already? Like, this is completely unprecedented. So uh, it's going to maybe even be a rough ride for them. Like, that's not a top four position. It's only the top three point earners that get, earners that get a guaranteed spot uh, in that cross-region tournament. So it could actually be pretty rough for them. Um, this time around, though, they're going to be dealing... This team's particularly Vinruki's pick, just for fun, is going to be dealing with a, a unique team with that Resto Shaman, Death Knight, and Demon Hunter as... Nobody else is really running that that we've seen throughout the competition. I'm curious to see if maybe Mercy plays a factor in this matchup as well. What compositions are they going to start with? Is Infernion going to be starting on the roster? Um, or are they going to be running a Rogue Mage Druid? Yeah, certainly a lot of things uh, that we could see come out of this game. Um, you know, I know we kind of talked about it a little bit before we headed in there, Ven, what your take is. But I, I mean, what do you feel like for composition wise for just for fun? Do you feel like is a good measure? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes against Melee Cleaves, the Wizards are a decent option, but I don't really think we're going to see that. I think more than likely, we're just going to see Outlaw Rogue, Destruction Warlock. Like, I think that's basically what we'll probably see for the entirety of the series. Um, but that could be scary. I mean, if you're the isolated caster playing against a Demon Hunter Death Knight, um, you're dealing with a lot of interrupts, you're dealing with a lot of damage, it's difficult to kite, both these targets are really durable. Um, but if you're going to have any kind of partner to help you against that, you definitely want an Outlaw Rogue. A Subtlety Rogue or an Outlaw Rogue is going to be the thing that's going to enable you the most in the match. Uh, so it's going to be up to Trimaz to, you know, make sure that he's landing, you know, those stuns and they're followed up by Cyclones from Zanked. And uh, I think if they do that properly and they kind of isolate a target, uh, Just for Fun is going to be able to win this matchup. I definitely haven't seen a whole lot of games today without that Outlaw Rogue, so we'll see if they get uh, placed once again here as we head into the blind. Of course, we are heading into Nagrand Arena. If it does end up being a mirror super tease, I mean, what is that like as a player? You know, you lock your 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 comp in, and then you open the gates, and you see that they're playing the same thing as you. Does that make a team feel like maybe a little bit more nervous? I think a lot of times, at least I know for NA teams, they would probably prefer to not play a mirror and try and get a comp that they perceive to have some type of edge. Um, so yeah, definitely mirrors can really be frustrating, but I don't think that's going to happen. Oh. We've actually got a very surprising composition uh, on the side of Chibaku Tensai, Resto Shaman, Demon Hunter, Destro. This is a comp that does a lot of damage, but it's also very squishy, um, especially to something like a Rogue, which uh, the side of Just For Fun is locked in here with So Queen on the Arcane Mage, Trimaz on the Outlaw Rogue, and Zanked on the Resto Druid. Limp's already just immediately frosting of it in the middle of the map, but that does give their team combat, so Trimaz is not going to get a sap. He's going to do a double cheap shot opener, maybe with a blind or a gouge, just gonna go for a kidney shot, swap back on a Mercy, they force the dark pact, he gets a pre-earthen wall in that kidney shot, so it was a nice play by Fuston, they also have the Observer forcing So Queen back, he's just with the Demon Hunter, now the Demon Hunter changing targets, back on a Trimaz, he pre-cloaks the hunt, just wants to negate all of that damage immediately on his side, um, and with the cooldown reduction of his defensives, Trimaz can get away with plays like that, Zank to stunned up, they swap back onto the mage, but now he's frosting over behind the pillar, he's running that immolation aura oh, to spell no. on her talent, but he got fully blind dead uh, and he doesn't really want to trinket that as he is susceptible to dying in a stun oh but now he's gosh. into a cheap shot now he's into a ring of frost uh, so queen's main goal is just pulling limps into a bad position and just controlling him on that side of the pillar while we wait for crowd control to set up damage on a mercy and we're going to start that chain with a gouge but nothing to follow it up and with no follow-up houston should be able to easily heal through that but this is a very neutral positioning from both teams which should enable zanked a lot of opportunities to drink and if he drinks i'm, I'm gonna give the mana advantage to his team yeah i want to see uh chibaku Tensi kind of push in here and help limps out a little bit more he's getting crowd controlled quite a bit i feel like you need to push in you need to smother you need to get those grounding totems and wind shears in in order to shut that down but mercy is under fire and this is the difficult thing right when you're playing these melee caster healer battles, it's just so difficult because Trimez is going to have a ton of uptime on Mercy. There's no Druid crowd controlling him. You know, there's no Mage that's just DB sheeping him. Um, he's getting a lot of pressure on Mercy. Meanwhile, Limps is just getting spam controlled. He's Nova, he's Rooted, he's cloned, he's Pollet, he's Dragon's Breath. 
So when you have like both the melee on the range, normally the arcane mage is going to come out ahead in this situation just because he can avoid so much damage entirely. I mean, if you're the demon hunter, what's your choice? You attack the rogue, who's going to be probably the tankiest and hardest target to kill, um, and you're going to get cleaved by blade flurry and you get stunned really easily. Uh, or you chase the mage, who's going to just kite you, pull you behind the pillar, and CC you for 30 seconds at a time. So, like, I feel like Limps doesn't have really a good choice in either direction. He's kind of just sending it on the druid right now, using that vengeful retreat to immune a sheep for as long as he can, but he ultimately does get caught. Fuston's not going to overextend, and Limps is going to be locked out for a long time. Fuston's just like, yep, you're CC'd, but I'm not leaving my pillar uh, to compromise my positioning here. Both teams are taking a very neutral position likely going to be looking to rely on dampening but as they're taking this neutral spot i feel like mercy is just falling more and more behind he's already had to use his dark pack twice he's had to use unending resolve um it feels like eventually there's going to be an opening here for just for fun to take down mercy yeah it's definitely possible um but at the same time as dampening gets higher it becomes a lot more difficult for zank to heal up as well mercy getting absolutely blasted in the midfield though limps going for a full eye beam gets blinded I'm just entirely happy with just shutting down limps uh, every step of the way and just allowing a little bit of breathing room for Zank. But so we might just get one shot. They get the ice block. Great pressure there by Mercy. And this could end up working out. All of a sudden, the mage has no ice block, feeling a little bit more vulnerable. Mana is still a slightly in favor of Zank, but I feel like that's going to even out uh, unless Zank continues to find these drinks in the match. And uh, all of a sudden, both these casters are feeling vulnerable without their major defensive cooldowns. All right, stun onto the Druid. Fortunately, Limps, I think he missed his fear there. It could have been a stun into a fear. Now he's into a Polymorph, and probably looking for a Polymorph on the Dispel. But Fuston's is too far away. I mean, it's basically 1v2. Trimaz versus the Warlock and the Shaman, and Limps versus the Druid and the Mage. And I feel like Trimaz is winning the 1v2 across the map at the moment, uh, as he's just getting way more uptime. Mercy doesn't really have many options. Like, maybe you could fear, um, but it's likely going to break. Uh, and maybe you could look for hexes, but then it can be decursed by the mage. So there's not a lot of control. So they do get a root here uh, onto the rogue into a lasso, and they're going to swap off that lasso onto the rogue, uh, but not find enough damage really to take him down. Zank has already planted a forest over there. He's just got four treants healing, uh, and he should be able to pick Trimaz up in a hurry. This is dark packed earthen wall. They jump over for gouge anyways. They could swap the limps maybe out of the earthen wall. Limps is going to duck into it for its protection during this double cheap shot. This is where blade flurry comes in. This is where you're going to get cleaved by multi target barrages double dragon's breath defensively here by so queen trying to peel some damage for trimaz but he's just going to cloak the shadows anyways here i think cloaking he's just cloaking one for one with the hunt anytime he sees that and just trying to negate the pressure mercy's taking a lot of damage he goes for a double coil gets a mage and the druid and now a full fear this is a big opportunity to get maybe the end of the game onto so queen as his temporal shield goes off zank is finally free of the fear if mercy can get another one of those cc chains that's definitely going to be a win condition. He's got an ending resolve, so he should likely be able to stay offensive, and he's taking a much more offensive posture. He's got his portal on enemy pillar. He's got his gateway on enemy pillar, and it seems like at the five-minute mark that Shibaku Tensai are now starting to make their offensive push. Yeah, it's not looking too bad, but Mercy caught into a clothesline right here. Full kitty shot's going to be landing by Trimez. Fuston gets caught into a counter cheap shot as well, but look at Limps. He's just pushing in, looking for a hunt. Full stun here on Zank, and Soqueen's in a lot of trouble. No ice block for another two minutes, and this is a huge amount of damage. Good night. And finally, Limps. That's like, you're, you finally, you know, it's a game of cat and mouse. Mouse is just escaping you the whole game, but finally you pounce on him. A little bit of dampening, you know, no ice block, and you can finally get off that big damage. They managed to pull out victory, wasn't looking that great at the beginning of the game, but against wrestler druids, you really do need a little bit of damage to push through, unless you can find crowd control on them, but the way they were playing that, it was a very, very passive, um, and I, I like this composition that they're bringing here to game number one. I just like that they flipped the switch. I feel like a lot of teams fall into the trap of just only playing defensive. So realizing, hey, we got the ice block two minutes ago, dampening has just started. They must have had this pre-planned, like at the five minute mark, we're going to switch gears and play really aggressive. Let's just play neutral, not overextend before that point. And then they make the switch. And as soon as they make the switch, they win the game almost immediately after it. Look at the pressure that they're getting on the rogue. They force his trinket. Zank is switching hots to him to recover. But while he's switching hots, Limps is building up damage onto the arcane mage. And Mercy is building up damage.
damage as well. Um, and they're going to just dump a bunch of rifts here towards the end of this kidney shot, I think, uh, that ultimately are going to finish him. And, I, and Mercy actually resummoned his pet so that he could counterspell while he is stunned. So his pet actually CSs the druid behind the pillar into a stun. Nice. And if he didn't do that with his pet, um, he would not have been able to stop that. So that, that was a nice little maneuver into a cap totem, it Essence looks like, break. from Houston around the corner. Uh, and just massive damage from the Demon Hunter. Just huge burst combo. He wasn't peeled. Uh, at that moment, the capstone on the rogue. Oh, so he was using, he was arming the capstone behind the pillar and then moved it on top of the rogue uh, so that the rogue wouldn't be able to assist in those final moments. But it seemed like a bit of disrespect towards the demon hunter, I feel like. Uh, he just got his entire combo off completely uncontested. That's like the most satisfying thing on a demon hunter when you get the hunt and then you get that big essence break into the death sweep. Like you, you can just delete mages off the face of the earth. So you can see there, yeah, there it is, a 233,000 death sweep. And that's only the final tick, right? So uh, <laughs> definitely a good amount of damage there. Um, Hunt from the for 150k, and then essence break 100k, and then death sweep for almost 300k total combined for the amounts that hit him. Well, while the hunt is well, the hunt also did more than that too, right? 150k plus 50k plus 50k. Yeah, and then mercy he shadow burning conflagged, <laughs> and then that whole time he, <laughs> he died. I helped. I helped. Mercy did a lot at the end here. I mean, just positioning aggressively, I feel like his counter spell really, I mean, six seconds of CC on the Druid, there's a good opportunity to purge Hots, try and put the Druid behind. So that counter spell at the end definitely was very important. Uh, just for fun, they're getting rid of the Mage. They're bringing in the Warlock. Uh, so we're going to have a bit of a Warlock showdown on Destruction here for Tolveron Arena. Really big map. Main difference being the healer and the melee DPS, obviously. Um, but this time around, Limps is not going to be CC'd as much. There's no there's no Polymorph, so I think attacking a Warlock is a bit easier. Um, but he's got to probably be more afraid of dying, I think. You know, in a Kidney Shot with two Chaos Bolts as a Demon Hunter, that's going to be a lot more intimidating. So uh, he's going to have to switch gears in that regard. Yeah, both teams bringing in the Destruction Warlocks. We've got Fuston on the Resto Shaman, Zanked on the Resto Druid, Limps on the Demon Hunter, Tramez on the Outlaw Rogue. Um, and yeah, I'm curious to see what this big map really does. I feel like this is kind of a playground here for Zank to get off more drinks, but this is kind of where we're going to be able to see some of the differences between the Resto Shaman, Resto Druid, the Demon Hunter, as well as the Outlaw Rogue. Um, who's going to be able to get more pressure? Who's going to be able to get more shutdown? Who's going to have the advantage in the late game? What, what do you kind of anticipate for this one? Who do you think has the edge? Uh, I mean, my brain is telling me the Outlaw Rogue, right? Like, I feel like it's got to be more of an edge. I feel like taking down a Demon Hunter with a with a Warlock on your team, pulling them behind the pillar, um, is likely going to be really effective. It's a really big map to be able to drink. I, I'm, I've, I got my brain is leaning into the Outlaw Rogue, but for some reason, a few of these teams are just kind of thwarting it, anyways. So yeah, I want to see his talent tree. Is he running Poison Cleansing Totem? Nah. <laughs> what, no poison what are these EU shamans doing, dude? They're winning even without it, man. I swear they're playing on hard mode. It's like uh, Poison Cleansing is so good, I swear. Especially when you get into this deep dampening where the MS on top of the healing reduction starts to become a really big problem. Uh, but neither shaman. I th I'm, it's going to be the NA shamans, okay? They're going to show the EU shamans how it's done, all right? T tomorrow when we got NA, we'll see some poison cleansing action. Infernion just immediately using Nether Ward. As we see a full clone onto the Demon Hunter, out of line of sight of the kicks. Infernion's positioning aggressively. Trimaz gets dispelled out of the root, trying to go after Mercy. Trimaz is playing really aggressive, and I think you should as the Outlaw Rogue. Uh, you're really tanky and durable, so you've got to be the harasser on top of the enemy healer, keeping as much pressure going as possible so that your Warlock can get in and get some damage going. Oh, nice Shadow Meld from Infernion there. He immune the mortal coil so he doesn't get hit by the crowd control and now mercy is on the back foot he's going to get into the middle of the map but now he's in the middle of the map for the warlock so this could be risky uh limps he gets stunned up he can't keep the pressure going trimass stuns up mercy now into a kidney shot on fuston he's going to get imprisoned away uh, as limps doesn't want him to get any more uptime but now everybody's on stun dr so if, if i'm limps and mercy i would be playing really aggressive right now now let's see what they can do limps is just destroying the damage meters so far so in terms of pressure, I'd say there's a little bit of an edge here for Shibaku Tensei. Let's see if they can continue that damage as we move forward into the game. That was the big metamorphosis. Mercy just getting absolutely blasted here in the midfield, though. And Fernand's just going to be portaling away, looking for some damage. Beautiful Lightning Lasso. I love the Lightning Lasso from the Restoration Shaman. If you're a melee DPS and you're kind of left alone on the other side of the map, that Lightning Lasso and a big swap can be absolutely devastating. So definitely things they have to look out for. Full fear here on Fuston. Mercy's just gonna portal away, but Trimaz is in hot pursuit right now, looking for a nice grapple kick on that fear. 
That's a static field totem. Trimas just gonna vanish out of that. Not gonna mess around. A bit of a laser battle here between the two observers in the midfield, but they both get killed off quite quickly. Well, Kenny shot now and defused him as Trimas is looking to set up his team. Okay, so Limps is using Imprisoned defensively on the Rogue. Anytime Trimaz is trying to do a setup, they're rotating that as like an extra cooldown to stop a go from the Outlaw Rogue. And this is a tactic you can do as a Demon Hunter, is defensively Imprisoned. Uh, it's going to get them later into the game, but I wonder if he's going to switch his targeting on that spell later on. We saw them play a very neutral game in the last one, so this, this early round is they're trying to fish for cooldown, see if they can get something right before dampening. But you can see Fuston is not pushing in. Uh, Mercy is not crossing the center of the map. We don't see any sort of offensive portal positionings just yet. Uh, we see another coil coming out. Looks like Fuston got a grounding totem on that coil. Mercy shadow melded on the first one, I think grounded on the third one here, so not getting a tremendous amount of value from the coils so far. Step into cheap shot. Trimass setting up massive damage with a full fear onto the healer. Mercy's going to port back to his side, but he still has to wait for that fear to subside. Trimass gets a sap off the fear. Nice plays here from Trimass. Are they going to be able to run him down? They're disrespecting the push. They're trying to be greedy. Primordial wave. He's got NS ready to go here. That's the unleash NS. It didn't even actually top him. You know, poison cleansing totem right there probably would have topped them. Um, Limps just playing in the center field. Try mass swapping back to him. He sees that swap, so Limps is just going to, you know, eventually retreat away. And, yeah, Chibaku 10 side, they're just playing a very conservative game for the first five minutes, I think. And we'll have to see when, when that five-minute mark, if they're going to flip a switch on it. Um, possible disconnect here um, for Mercy. It looks like at the moment, so uh, maybe they're respecting it. They might, I mean, I feel like they would know at this point, considering he hasn't moved for this long, but um, he's, we're going to be doing our best here, hopefully, to get him back into the match as soon as possible because, I mean, they're they're up one point, um, and they're not running any of, like, you know, the standard meta comps. I mean, they got a Demon Hunter. It's a pretty strong melee, but from the comps we've seen, not, not the most common tournament comps. There's got a little dance competition. Uh, oh my god, they were synced up. Why did he move? That was literally perfectly in sync. I wanted to see if that was going to keep going in, in the chain. I was going to say, we have a dance-off. The chat can decide who's the better dancer um, and maybe decide the victor here if, if he's unable to come back, which is obviously unfortunate. I'm joking about it, but within the rules, if the gates have opened and you disconnect after, you know, it's pretty, it might be over for you. Mercy moved there. He jumped. Hopefully his UI is okay. Sometimes when you disconnect, your UI, you know, gets a little bit haywired. So he's back into the game. We're going to be starting here with four-minute mark. Um, cheap shots coming out onto limbs. Try mass setting up crowd control. Blind kidney shot immediately. And they're actually on top of the Warlock's portal. So not really a great position for Mercy to start this fight from the back of the disconnect. He's got Earthen Wall Totem down. We see an Observer out, I think, for Infernion at the moment, just cleaving them down. Um, and Infernion's actually running Soul Rip. Um, which is a mortal wounds effect that actually stacks with other mortal wound effects at the moment. Uh, whereas Mercy is not running that, and that could be very scary if you've got that on top of wound poison uh, at, at higher dampening. And right now he's activated that soul rip, so Mercy, he's taking significantly reduced healing at the moment. He's going to pop unending resolve, fusing his gouge with no trinket, and he's even dying through it. Uh, his soul rip has faded and now immediately topped, uh, but it costs them the unending resolve. So they're not in the same type of position as they were last game at the five minute mark, where they had all their defensives and it was the enemy team that was on the back foot they're actually the ones on the back foot so are they going to pull that trigger five minutes into the game now are they going to flip the switch are they going to continue to play safe and maybe try and wait for the unending resolve there's some cooldown reduction on the talent so it's possible that you can get it maybe closer to two more minutes as opposed to three they're blasting damage just look at this they flip a switch oh my and just kill goodness him. they're just like five minute mark we win i i don't know what it is man they're just like five minutes goes around they just we win <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know how they're doing it. It just feels like they're losing the whole game. But if five minute mark hits, we win. Okay, uh, I mean that was insane. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I can't believe it. So far they're up 2-0, running this Resto Shaman Demon Hunter composition. Uh, what's interesting about this is Infernion. Um, I was talking to him in my stream a little bit, and he was saying that he thinks that that is the best comp in the game. He's like, it's got to be right, like. Maybe Outlaw, but he thinks that the Demon Hunter might be even better than the Outlaw in this particular composition. So really, really interesting to see. Uh, but Limps and Mercy, Houston able to put out a lot of offensive pressure. Um, shout out to Just for Fun for waiting on the disconnect as well, allowing Mercy to get back into the game. But this is a very explosive match. And it's like you said, right around that five minute mark, they're able to get out so much pressure. We can see Zanked right now in the back line. Uh, this is a bunch of portals here from Mercy, Lightning Lasso and Trimez out of the fear. Mercy moves into position and they just, I can't believe it. They just outright two kill flame him riffs. through heels. <laughs> he got two good flame riffs. Like good RNG on the riffs. What is the R? I think isn't it a twenty percent chance or something to get a flame rift? And he rolled it twice in a row. That's like getting a six buff two rolls in a row as an outlaw rogue. 
with with your rolled bones or something. I swear, it's like the equivalent RNG. Is it? Do we have a that's death nice. log for that? Like, how many flame tears is that? He, yeah, he popped out two two red rifts. That's how you know it's not green or purple. If it's red and fiery, that's the scary rift you've really got to be worried about. So he popped two of those. I'm out always scared. I'm right scared of every push. rift. Is there a rift that we're not afraid of? <laughs> uh i think the green one that shoots slowly it's like a bazooka rift is not as bad it like hits you one time and then it's not really that scary uh, it, the red dude, one. we saw chan get 140k chaos rift that thing that thing hits hard uh, let's see here it's not even there's only one rift hit in this combat log <laughs> but i swear he he proc two it must have been higher than this when he was at 100 percent health because uh, there was two fire rifts on him and he's actually getting healed. Like, I mean, Zanked is healing him significantly here. 200k uh, Swiftman, 100k Nourish, 100k Regrowth, and just got crushed through that um, anyway. So really big push there. Now they're on match point, and they're facing elimination. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it was anybody really expecting Destro, Arsham, Demon Hunter, at least moving into this, not after we've seen from the War Games, um, because I can't say that I was. Uh, we got the, cl the kill a little bit closer here. Um, still about the same kind of breakdown. Um, they're going to go to Maldrax's Coliseum, and you know, if you're just for fun, like, was that better or worse? I mean, I feel like you they were in a good position, and then they just died. Like, they didn't really get information from that game. Yeah, just literally just dying through heals. So, <laughs> I mean, that's that's unfortunate, but Shibaku Tensei is going to be uh, happy. This is a really scary composition. Like, Demon Hunters obviously do an incredible amount of damage. Destro Warlock's the same. I think Destro... I, like I going into these cups and going into the open bracket, I knew Destro was good, right? But I'm a bit surprised at how much Destro is doing well. Like a lot of the top players I was talking to, they were talking tons about arcane mages. They were talking about Ellie shamans, but it seems like uh, Destro warlocks have kind of stolen the show for the casters. Yeah, definitely. We haven't seen like any demo. I thought we were going to see like a little bit of like demo Ellie maybe at certain points, uh, but we haven't seen any of that. Uh, just all been Destro locks. And I mean, Destro locks are enabled by these types of melees that have low cooldown stuns, so they can cast Chaos Bolts more freely. Um, and the pressure is quite high from those classes. So it is great synergy, but I'm wondering if there's got to be something that really pressures a Warlock that nobody's considering right now um, as an option. Uh, we, we saw some, you know, some Blood DK coming out. I, I wonder if, like, you know, a, a really tanky <laughs> don't, melee don't cleave with a Blood DK or something Please. might be really impossible for, for this type of setup. Um, I don't think any of the remaining teams really have that as an option, though. I think the only team maybe that could seriously take it into consideration would be like, be like c if they were absolutely desperate. But I think their Boomkin Rogue has been looking pretty good and well-rounded for everything anyways. But I'm just trying to, like, throw ideas around because I feel like this meta could shift even without any changes. Um, like, right now, everybody's talking about Destro Lock, Ooh. but then something else around the corner could be something uh, to consider. Like, with that Windwalker Rogue comp, like, how is a lock going to do with Windwalker Rogue? Yo, uh, oh, I didn't even see that in the in the log, but Infernion's death log included a, a Shadow Burn from himself. I think he got one of his Shadow oh, Burns reflected for, like, warded. 100k. Yeah, Nether Warded. Ooh, you hate that. Unfortunately, happens, right? Yes, these things I, can happen. <laughs> I've star searched myself a few times. I've glacialed with, myself with and one shot myself. Oh my <laughs> god, a glacial dude! That must be the most satisfying another word ever. Just oh my god, a glacial, <laughs> just immediately back in their face. So. Mercy still not running the Soul Rip, whereas Infernion is. I feel like that gives Infernion more of an edge before dampening, because it basically is like temporarily activating dampening uh, to reduce the healing by 25 additional percent. Uh, both melee just going to be starting on the Warlocks, going through the rotations. We see Blind. Mercy immediately trinketing and going for a double coil. He's actually getting aggressive, but they get a sap off the Blind. Limps is jumping over to Zank. He gets a stun. Is he going to go for a Fear out of the stun? Doesn't look like it. And then that green rift right there with the like one fired green bolt, I think that that's probably the worst bolt. I think it literally only shoots once, and, that's, and then that's <laughs> it. So it's it's not it's not it's not a good rift. We have to wait and see if they they get the red rift here in the near future. As Infernal is out for Mercy, and multiple rifts are coming down. Kind of hard to tell which team. I think those are rifts coming out for Infernion onto Mercy. They're going to imprison Trimass. So Limps is still using that defensive imprison tactic, removing the rogue during any sort of kidney shot, trying to delay his damage, uh, and likely playing a conservative game for the first five minutes here for their side. Let's see, one bolt potentially going to land here. Nope, not going for it. Just trying to fake out some interrupts, potentially getting a counter spell there on the Fear of Infernion. So nice spell lock there. Mercy's just going to portal away, reposition a little bit, get closer to his healer, and kind of just line of sight during these moments. But Limp's getting swapped too. Needs to be a little bit careful. 
Demon Hunter can get bursted down and a stun. Zanked in the back line, though, just sitting down for a drink, just fully recovering his mana. I love that. Early game, go for those drinks when you're not under as much pressure um, and try to just, like, chop your mana off. Like, every one minute, every two minutes, every time you can, get that mana as high as possible before dampening really kicks in. Okay, Mercy pushing forward. Trimaz on him. Does he have Earthen Wall? It looks like he pre Earthen Walls the kidney shot. Houston's been making really good plays. I mean, Zico was talking about how he's a Demon Hunter main, and it seems like maybe they just kind of put this team together last minute. They couldn't find anybody, but I feel like he's been doing a pretty good job uh, on the Resto Shaman so far. Up two points in this series against Just for Fun. I mean, this is a predicted finalist for the tournament. They're running, you know, the considered meta comps, and if he can pull off a win here, it would be very impressive. Uh, but for now, Mercy is still just taking a huge amount of damage. And even with that healing wave coming in from the side, he's still at half health. Now into a kidney shot. This is going to be an opportunity for Just for Fun to take it. Nether Ward on the coil. Doesn't look like it hits. Or maybe Mercy actually coiled himself there off Infernion's Nether Ward. I think it was what it was. Gouge into Fuston. Mercy trying to pull back. Coiled again by Infernion. Double coil into double incinerates here with that Havoc. Double cheap shot. Observer is down. He went for a lasso there, but it looks like it was just immediately trinketed from Trimass so fast I didn't even see it. Observer down on Mercy, Observer down on Infernion. They're sniping those things immediately. It only shot like maybe one laser. Here comes massive damage up from Limps. He uses eventual retreat to try and immune the cheap shot. Mercy is going to port back away. Limps is trying to stay on target. He imprisons the rogue so he can't peel his damage in this position, but eventually does get there. Cheap shot connects. Mercy down at half. Flame rift on Mercy. Two chaos bolts. Infernion fakes the second, gets it. It looks like a grounding totemed by Fuston, so really good grounding. He's going to static field Trimaz away and maybe sit down for a drink. Um, or maybe he's running the, the Mana Tide totem. He might want to look to try and put that behind the pillar here pretty soon when the rogue isn't nearby. But he's into the kidney shot. Mercy's going to port. Really good portal. As a warlock, you want to wait till your healer is crowd controlled before you use portal. If you portal while they're uncc'd, you just kind of drag crowd control on top oh, of them. Big nice setup. setup. I really like this positioning from Fuston. Getting the lasso and then going around the corner so you can't get interrupted by the warlock. That forced Cloak of Shadows from Trimez. Uh, and now they're back onto Infernion. And if they keep making these kind of flip backs on the rogue, baiting him with the portal, uh, it's definitely a possible win condition. Nice clone on the Demon Hunter here from Zanked. Gouge on the Shaman. Warlock is alone, but it looks like fears are coming in. Clutch here for Mercy. Trimaz is taken so far out of the game. Now into an Earth Grab route. Infernion's going to be alone, but they're going to swap to Trimaz. He's really deep right now. Zanked is trying to get in there in that Tree of Life form and get back to Trimaz. He's taking huge hits. He's going to have to vanish. Pop that Crimson Vial. It's going to be a big healing combo with the healing and stealth talents plus the Crimson Vial. He's going to go back to full health, I would imagine, here pretty shortly. We're not even at the four minute mark here. Uh, Mercy he has his unending, unending resolve back again as we see Limps taking some big hits here actually hitting that purge protection cap on, on the druid there for a moment Mercy down at half, Trimaz wants to set up CC but he's feared and as long as Fuston can kind of stay away from Trimaz he doesn't want to get like kidneyed and then immediately he's back on the lock it's going to be really bad news for them he's going to dark pact Mercy's looking for a Shadow Fury. Actually gets it. And that's overlapped a bit with the lasso, but they're doing a lot of damage anyways. Big Nature Swiftness comes in from Zanked. Healing Trimaz back into the fight. Mercy's in a cheap shot. Is he going to have to port when Shaman isn't CC'd? He's in a gouge. I think he's going to portal right now, but it's a gouge into a full fear, and Trimaz is chasing him down. Both Warlocks in a lot of trouble, but more pressure on Infernion right now because if they lose this game, they're going to be out of the tournament. Infernion needs to get this win right now. Mercy's going to use on any resolve and blast him with two Chaos Bolts. They're just... Chucking Chaos Bolts back and forth at each other oh right now goodness. with a unending resolve. So it was a very confident move from both Warlocks, just Wild West style drawing their pistols here. As, oh my god, multiple rifts on both sides. Who's going to take the negative end of this exchange? The Static Field pulls Infernion away from his portal and into a coil, but limps his cheap shot away and can't keep the pressure going for his team. Mana is in favor of Houston at this point. I think if Zank does not drink, then Chibaku Tensai will win on mana. Yeah, Limps just pushing in, wanting to keep the pressure on Infernion, keeping Zanked in combat as well, but a big setup. Those are the deadly lightning lasso combos. When you are that melee DPS too far overextended, it can be a lot of danger, and Trimaz is forced to trade out his trinket. The next lightning lasso could be lights out, but a big setup here. Cheap shot on Limps is going to be going into big meta, immuning some of that damage, and now has a ton of damage available. That five-minute mark, this is the enrage timer we saw in game number one. We saw in game number two. Let's see what they can do. Zanked is sitting down for a drink, but Limps is just going for it. The hunt right now onto Infernion. No one any resolve. Mercy at the oh. same time is getting incredibly low. Portals away and a beautiful Spearling totem here from Houston. Infernion. Not wanting to mess around at the same time. Infernion just getting absolutely blasted. But here's the setup. Big stun on Trimaz. He's so far no away. Way. Can they take him down? They might be able to do it. A huge death sweep. And he gets dropped. Very nicely done. Chibaku Tensai shuts down my prediction and has a very impressive performance yeah. here in this series.
It's, that's that's got to be called something like that. Like, I mean, in a raid boss, right? Like when you hit a certain health or a certain amount of time in the fight, the boss enrages. Like, what? Five minute enrage timer for Chibaku Tensai. You have to beat them before five minutes or they just get double damage or something. Some invisible buff that doesn't actually exist. Because they just immediately third run big all meta. three games. <laughs> the third big meta uh, yeah. is, is their main win condition. And they're playing a comp that nobody else is playing that we've seen so far. So this is really exciting. I mean, I was going into this. I thought it was going to be a lot of Arcane Mage, Outlaw Rogue, maybe Destro, Outlaw Rogue, and almost exclusively. Um, so there's a lot of surprises. We got a Warrior in the upper bracket now. We got this Resto Shaman, Demon Hunter, Warlock combo in the lower bracket. Um, NA has a whole bunch of different comps as well on their side. They got some Mistweaver monks, some Fistweavers, and some Dragons, and some Frosty Shadow Priest in NA, and some Shadow. Like, what is this? This is not what I think anybody uh, was really expecting as far as variety. So this is very exciting. Yeah, definitely. Really, really back and forth. We can see here some of the final moments of the match. A lot of pressure here. And this is this is that bait, right? So they get the Spirit Link Totem, and it's like, okay, he's feared. They have a lot of damage on Infernion, and Limps just literally crosses the map in two seconds. <laughs> Gets the stun on Trimaz, and they're able to take him down. He's in a static field. He's able to get that Shadow Step, but I think there's just too much damage in the air. And that, one of the one of the things, we haven't really talked about it too much for um, Resto Shamans, but they recently, very recently, got some changes to their uh, Lava Burst. So it does a lot more damage. Um, so if he's in during these setups, if he actually gets up a Flame Shock, and he's able to get off one, two, even get lucky maybe if you're casting a lava burst and you get a proc for your lava burst that is very fun as the resto shaman you could do you know upwards of 400,000 damage uh in a kill window so really really cool to see and uh, i think fusion definitely assisted here in this kill but i really like the swap utilizing the map and just isolating look how far away he is the druid's yeah. like i'm coming i'm coming oh god <laughs> it's too late he's just getting destroyed by all the, by mercy and fusion around the corner and Furnion can't help him so really like that insane positioning great swaps just overall excellent gameplay i mean if this is like a last second roster that they pulled together this is an insane showing you're, you're making it to championship sunday taking out some of the biggest names and i mean that that team that they lost against we didn't really see them try anything different i feel like maybe if they go head to head which maybe they will um based on the fact that that team will face echo tomorrow uh, unless uh, unless they pull off some insanity there and beat echo um I feel like they're going to be better the next time that they see Lava Lava. Yeah. Take a look here at the final few moments with that death cap and see exactly how they were able to get it done. It's a lot of damage from the sea. What is that? That's the coolest sounding ability. I didn't even know it was in the game. That's a Extinction Blast? It's the, it's the oh, staff. I thought they nerfed that. I mean, didn't it's only 50k. That? that is nerfed. That is nerfed. 50k is not that much. It's only 50k. Is it off? You know, it has to be yeah. off global, right? I would assume I it's it off be, global. Yeah. Otherwise, it might not be worth it. The stats on it are good, though. So, I mean, an extra 50k for free when you're that low. That might even be the X factor. I mean, typically killing an outlaw rogue is really difficult. I mean, you can see the 200k hellstone. He actually got that off in that swap, and he still died. So, pulling out that. I think that's from the new Mythic Plus dungeon. Or, you know, it's new, new. You know, it was a new dungeon. Now it's in the Mythic Plus rotation. Um, if, if you're looking to try and farm that one out. So definitely important here. I mean, Mercy just carrying at the end of the game. Like, obviously, Limp setting up the stun, but Mercy being in a spot where he could free cast and avoid all of it. And that seems to be, like, a big deal for the Shaman, is that when the Shaman's at the pillar, Grounding Totem can just shut the Warlock out for three seconds, whereas the Druid doesn't have that. Yep. All right, well, believe it. We're heading into uh, Saturday's games after, uh, you know, obviously in one sleep. But we can take a look here at where we ended up with European games today. Hula Bang versus Chewbacca Tensei. That'll be the lower bracket match. And then we've got Echo versus Lava Lava. Definitely uh, interesting turn of events here. Echo been dominating for quite some time. We have not seen them falter just yet. It is only day one those super teas do you think lava lava could maybe take uh some some points off of echo here uh i mean you've got a warrior against raikou on arcane mage so i mean unless they got something else I, they can play demon hunter ellie i think um is their other comp if they bring in goose in the, instead of the warrior and demon hunter ellie was actually looking pretty decent in the open bracket so if they if they have a solid demon hunter ellie they they could quite possibly be very threatening to echo 
yeah, potentially. I'm excited to see what they can do here against Echo or if potentially one of these lower bracket teams could take them on. Hula Bang, Chibaku Tensei, both of them do have an opportunity to make it back up into the grand finals. But so far, this European bracket is shaping up to be really exciting. I feel like we've seen a lot of newer comps for AWC event that we haven't seen in some time. Some specs that have kind of come out of the, you know, the, the lockbox, I guess, that we haven't seen on tournament play in a while as well. Yeah, I think teams are still trying to figure out, you know, what what are the best things. It seems like there's at, at least two viable healers, and we're seeing the Holy Priest as well. So lots of Resto Shaman, lots of Resto Druids, Holy Priest. We saw a little bit of Fist Weavers in the open bracket. We saw the Holy Paladin. So um, a lot of these healing specs uh, have been represented. Lots of different casters and melee. So yeah, I'm I'm curious to see who can take it uh, the furthest. Uh, obviously in Europe, there's a ton of variety. I think every single one of these teams is running a little bit of a different setup. Um, and then, of course, in North America, when we get to that tomorrow, it's going to be a similar story. Lots of different casters, lots of different melee, lots of different healers. And I'm curious to see at the end of it all, you know, who comes out ahead. Yeah, I am too. We can take a look at North American teams and what exactly we're going to be seeing in terms of schedule. We are starting off just like we did in Europe with an elimination round, Unitas versus CML. That is first up, but just like Europe, Super Tees, we're seeing a lot of returning faces, a lot of returning teams, and as well as some new ones. Yeah, I mean, Liquid and The Move, I think, are going to kind of be the premier names that everybody knows here from the North American region. Uh, Unitas coming back in as well as, I, I believe, that is Thugonomics' team. So last yep. year, we saw them form together. Chaz came to the North American region. I feel like that year was kind of them building their synergy, and now they've stuck together. And I feel like they're, I think they're the best mage lock in NA from seeing them on the ladder. Um, uh, they, are, they are an insane mage lock, but they also have obviously rogue lock and mage rogue as well um, for options. But something like their mage lock could be really important against their first opponents, the CML, that are likely running some type of melee cleave. Um, so I'm really excited to see what they've done for improvements. Void GG, um, you know, obviously a new sponsor for them, but this is Calvish's team. I feel like a lot of people expect big things from them. They've had, you know, a few years of building their team synergy up. It looks like it's a really prominent rogue meta, so we're really expecting big things from them. And then F tier, the crowd favorites, man. Like, these guys had that lower bracket run in the gauntlet, running Holy Pally Enhance Windwalker when nobody thought Holy Paladin was good at all. Um, and now they're coming back in on this cup and making it to top eight, the only enhancement shaman. And I actually wonder, because we've got some Frosty Caves here, like, which specs actually haven't been played? It's like, assassinate. I feel like almost, almost every spec, actually, by the end of this weekend, I think almost every spec will be played. Yeah. Disc. Yeah, we'll have to get disc, some stats yeah, on that then. Disc. Affliction. No affliction. Affliction. Probably see Demo. A, a couple. We'll see Assassin. Maybe, yeah, we celebrate maybe. all the specs that we have seen. <laughs> not necessarily one. point out the ones we haven't. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, there there has been a lot. I mean, I'm I'm really just looking at this. One of the teams that really, like is jumping off the page for me is Draco Cleave. These guys, this is Zeke. You know, he's kind of pioneered the Frost Death Knight. So they run this incredibly explosive composition, Frost Death Knight, Devastation Evoker. Um, they run Frost Death Knight with other classes as well. Basically, every iteration of Frost Death Knight. So they're kind of the best team at just setting up those massive one shots and. I'm excited to see what they can do here against the move. The move is looking sharp. I was watching WizK's point of view in the open bracket on the Shadow Priest, and it literally made me want to re-roll Shadow Priest. Like, he was owning the damage he was putting out and the control he had over the game. It was very impressive to watch. So I expect them to do big things with their Rogue Shadow Priest Shaman. I'm excited for it. Well, we will uh, unfortunately do have to wait just a little bit until we can see these North American teams play. So definitely be tuning in tomorrow. That is the end of today's games for EU. Moving into NA. If you want to see those games, twitch.tv slash Warcraft here at 10 a.m. Pacific. Also, make sure you're following us on Twitter for quite a few updates as we go along. There's a lot of good information on there if you don't know exactly what the schedule is. So that being said, that is it for now. We will see everyone tomorrow, like I said, 10 a.m. Pacific or 7 p.m. CEST. Thank you guys so much. See you soon. Oh.